Good morning. Uh, please take your seat. Uh, I'm Wayne Luplo, uh, one of the two co-chairs. On my right is um, Larry Goldberg, the other uh, co-chair. We have a full packed agenda today. Uh, agenda has been provided ahead of time. <clears throat> We're going to proceed at this time. I'm going to uh, start by uh, making a, uh, a roll call. I'm going to uh, call the company or organizational name uh, and uh, the name of the um, member. If you're present, uh, please so indicate. If you are an alternate and not the name that I call, please so indicate that at that time. We have a number of people on the telephone um, today, so uh, we need to uh, listen for that as well. So I'm going to start out with Adobe. Thank you. Alliance for Telecommunications Industry Solutions. American Council of the Blind. Marlena Lieberg, alternate. Is that phone? That was on the phone, yeah. And Brian Charlson is here. Thank you. <clears throat> American Foundation for the Blind. Okay. American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness. Thank you. AT&T. Audio Description Associates. Bright House Networks. Broadcast Interactive Media. No indication of presence. Okay. Caption Colorado. CBS, Center for Hearing and Communication, Chicago Lighthouse, not present, Comcast Cable, Computer Prompting and Captioning, Consumer Electronics Association. Cox Communications. Digital Media Association. Direct TV. Disney. Disney. Okay. EchoStar Technologies, Google, Hearing Loss Association of America, HBO Time Warner, Ideal Group. This is Steve Jacobs on the phone. Iowa Radio Reading Information Service. Hello, Mary Francis on the phone. LG Electronics, that would be me, Wayne Luplo. Microsoft. Modulation Sciences. Present. Motion Picture Association of America. Motorola. Okay. <laughs> National Association of Broadcasters. No, Kelly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, National Association of the Deaf. Okay. National Cable and Telecommunications Association. National Captioning Institute. Beth here. Northern Virginia Resource Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Research in Motion. Rovi. Adam Powers, present. Adam Wilford, also 
Sony Electronics. Telecommunications for the deaf and hard of hearing. Verizon Technology Up. Olua Kumi Sani on the phone. Thank you. Verizon. Olu's on the phone. Verizon. Olu Akiumi Asani on the phone. Thank you. Viacom. <coughs> Vitec. Bob Byron alternate, Kevin York alternate. Thank you. WGBH. Present. World Wide Web Consortium. Alternate on the phone. Thank you. I believe we've covered all of the members of VPAC at this time. Karen, or is Karen next? FCC staff. I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for coming here, for traveling to Washington, uh, some great distances, for this, uh, what is most likely our final VPAC meeting. Uh, and thank you also for all of the incredible amounts of time that some of you have spent in countless phone calls and reading standards and writing and drafting and all of your volunteering. It's been immensely helpful. As most of you know, we've uh, recently released the IP closed captioning item which was greatly benefited by the first report of this working group. Um, and I, I certainly look forward to seeing the uh, remaining reports uh, as they come in in two months. Um, I also wanted to thank all of the FCC staff who are here, especially Mikkel, uh, without whom this meeting would not happen. Uh, and she is hiding, as she always does at this time, um, but you'll see her running around. Uh, and all of the remaining uh, FCC staff from CGB who helped check you in and set up the room and arrange the meals and everything. Um, I also just want to make sure that we make the most of this face-to-face -face meeting because it is our uh, last face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, as Wayne will explain soon, there's a few more weeks left to finish up the draft reports and then to get all of the edits in, and there's not really that much time left. So uh, hopefully today will be a very productive and helpful day. Uh, and with that, I think I'm handing it over for Pam to talk about logistics. Uh, one more thing I forgot. Uh, I'm, I meant to uh, thank CBS for sponsoring uh, the breaks and the luncheon today. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just make some logistical announcements. Um, so when your working group is up here during your plenary session, um, please come up and sit at this U-shaped table. And if it's not your working group, sit in the audience. And um, there are power cords under the table if you brought your laptop and you're looking for an outlet. The restrooms are out the door, um, very, very close. Um, want to remind everyone that we do have people participating via conference on the bridge. So we need to be aware that we've got more people here than we can see. This is being webcast live from 9 to 5, and it will also be available on an archive basis in about three to five days. There are people here using assistive listening devices, and because there are people on conference calls, when people speak, we need to have you raise your hand and use the microphone. It's critical for the meeting to to run smoothly. We also have pay phones outside. I mean, who needs a pay phone, really? But um, we do have pay phones and one pay phone with a TTY. Um, we do have Wi-Fi here at the FCC in, in this room. So if your network allows you to join, you, you should be able to have Wi-Fi here. And when you come 
up, we will put, when your working group is up here, we'll put your tent cards up here, too. But during the last plenary session, um, you might want to keep, we might want to have your um, tent cards out in the audience in case people from the audience have questions or comments. I wanted to um, thank Helen Chang for setting up an incredible team of interpreters. Um, we have really quality cream of the crop interpreters here at the FCC, and we're very thankful for them and their hard work. Um, remember, um, they're working, so they're going to need breaks, too, and lunch and all of that. So, um, so that's it for me. Hi, I'm Karen Strauss. I'm the Deputy Bureau Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And I'm going to keep this brief, far briefer than the, uh, I guess, 20 minutes I've been allotted under the agenda. Um, I just wanted to um, thank all of you uh, extremely for your uh, time, your resources, the energy that you've put into this committee. I realize that this is your last face-to-face -face meeting, but it's not your last efforts at trying to produce reports for us. Uh, we at the Commission cannot begin to tell you how helpful it is when you put your energies into these efforts. It's, um, it was enormously, as, as Allison mentioned, enormously helpful to have your input from Working Group 1 on the IP captioning item. Um, we were pressed with an extremely tight deadline of six months from zero to finish to get those rules out, and we were only able to do so because you had done so much of the job. We have a greater amount of time, as you know, for the next set of rules. We have 12 months for the transmission of emergency content and 18 months for all of the apparatus rules, including uh, conveyance of emergency information in an accessible format, accessible user interfaces, accessible menus, um, and, access and uh, rendering video description. Um, so that gives us a little bit more time, but nevertheless, the task is daunting when we have to start from scratch, and we won't have to do that. We encourage you, um, we know that you will not reach consensus on everything, um, neither did Working Group 1, but we encourage you to share your views with us even if you can't reach consensus, or even if there are some issues that some of you feel belong in the report and others feel don't, that those issues don't belong in the report. It's fine to give us what you like. You don't have to reach consensus on everything. Just feel free to submit separate reports. We will, we love a consensus when you do have one. It does make our job easier, but at the same time, it also makes our job infinitely easier to have something rather than to have nothing. So we, again, we realize that um, you're not going to agree on everything, but we encourage you to give us everything that you have and let us um, take it from there. This is not, as I said, the end of this, this process. Clearly, you have until um, early April. But it's also not the end of the fact-gathering and opinion-gathering process. After we get your reports, there will be um, many additional meetings and many other opportunities for you to provide input. Um, I do want to thank, in particular, the people that have dedicated, not only all of you, but the FCC staff that have dedicated so much time to this. These meetings, as I've said in the past, look like they go off without a hitch, and the only reason that they do is because there is so much time spent beforehand into late hours, as I could see from the um, time slots noted on the emails, um, especially by Pam, who doesn't seem to ever sleep before these meetings take place, um, and, and Allison. The two of you have been absolutely extraordinary in leading this uh, committee, and I think that we should give you all a round of applause. I'm going to also say the same thing about Larry and Wayne, who um, don't get paid to be here and nevertheless have invested um, uh, just uh, innumerable hours that can't even begin to count. So if we could have applause for them as well. Now, the rest of the people are no less worthy of credit or um, 
our accolation. Uh, accolation. Um, I'm going to read the names of FCC staff that have been so generous in their time and efforts. These are people that have worked on these issues substantively with all of you, the co-chairs of the various working groups, as well as <coughs> administrative staff um, and just others who have just pitched in wherever they've been needed with a smile. Uh, we have Roger Holberg, Rosaline Crawford, Alan Stilwell, Elliot Greenwald, John Gabrish, Susan Kimmel, John Herzog, Susan McLean, Mikhail Mora, Kelly Jones, Salita Griffiths, Susan Fusen, Becky Lockhart, Helen Chang, and the AV staff. And if we could have an applause for all of them as well. And finally, um, I want to applaud all of you yes. for all that you have done. And let the meeting begin again. Um, I hope you have a productive meeting today. I want to thank you again from um, those of us who uh, have been working on this for far longer than we care to admit. Um, we're looking forward to your product. It's, we know it's going to be great. We want to talk about we'll talk about the ongoing uh, timeline as a uh, preface to this. Uh, you may recall at our last meeting we asked each of the working groups via their co-chairs what their timetable was to be able to complete their draft. Um, I believe the universal answer was on or about February 1st, January 31st, prior to this meeting. And that's kind of the timetable that Larry and I have been going with in the last few weeks, including um, a, uh, some emailing that we have done to the uh, co-chairs and uh, to the entire uh, VPAC. Um, that being said, uh, we recognize that there have been some issues or there are some issues in some of the working groups and uh, that timeline of while, while there has been something submitted from every group by last week, uh, we recognize that there is work that is not done. And as a re result thereof, um, we are going to try to adapt a little bit more a different, maybe some will call more lenient timetable, which we plan to share with you on uh, slides. I do note that uh, Pam sent it out to all members this morning via email, so it may or may not be news, but I'm going to uh, try to walk us through that a little bit. Um, <laughs> you can look here. For yeah, okay, thank you. Um, we are currently in this period called February 9th to 24th. Um, the working groups may continue to work on their draft reports. We had said no more work, but since there's work to be done, we believe there has to be a little more allocated time and we will try to make up for that on the tail end and still meet the requirements of the um, uh, April 9th uh, deadline. So all draft reports are due by close of business February 24th. Um, for me, close of business could be West Coast time if that's helpful to those on the West Coast. <laughs> um, Second bullet here, um, the following Monday, uh, Larry and I will distribute all three of any new report considerations that come in to the entire VPAC. Um, I think for clarification, we're going to call those the second drafts to differentiate it from the drafts that Larry circulated on Monday evening of this past week.
so in the period february twenty seventh to march ninth all the pac members may suggest edits and comments to those working group second drafts those i would just then remind everyone that the final reports that go to the f c c by the ninth of april those are the work products of the v pack not the work product of the individual working groups so it means that everyone on the v pack has an opportunity to chime in with comments relative to those final reports and again any suggested comments or edits uh, must be in to larry and myself by march ninth after that in the remaining what looks like a month and really is it quite a month because of the uh, the uh, so called uh, the easter week in early april the co-chairs larry and i in conjunction with the respective working group co-chairs will complete and edit and submit the final reports by the due date that is our timetable and when i say in conjunction with the working group co-chairs it means draft for example from working group two larry and i will be working with the co-chairs of working group two and the same can be said for working groups three and four in other words the co-chairs of the working group will work with us on the draft report that they provided should there be any inputs that the working group co-chairs need to have from members of their working group i suspect they will contact those members uh, to be able to make sure that what they are reporting into us is indeed the best job that they're able to do given this the uh, entire working groups that they're responsible for we are going to follow the process what we think was quite successful with working group one in terms of the manner in which we go about combining all of the edits and coming to a final product i've asked each working group chair or co-chairs to provide us the name of a professional editor an unbiased professional editor who serves only as an editor and does not really affect the content of what comes out of that topic I have indications from two of the three working groups that they can and will supply such an editor. Um, by, I would say, a week from today, I'd like to have a name from each of the three working groups of who that editor is. Larry and I and the co-chairs of the respective working group will confer on any suggested edits and we intend to complete our job on time okay, i think there's one more and as was announced earlier um, today is the last face-to-face -face vpac meeting are there any comments or questions on what i've just presented yes paul Paul Schrader, American Foundation for the Blind. Could you elaborate uh, for a second on the role of the professional editor? And I apologize, I must have missed that note somewhere. Uh, so I'm not clear on what, what that person's duty will be. The, the duty of the editor is strictly an editorial consideration, making sure the footnotes, if any, are in proper, uh, the formatting of the report, uh, what we like to try to do is follow the formatting that was used for working group one's report, report uh, last uh, uh, July, I believe it was, 
um, and we want to produce a professional looking uh, document. Uh, it's strictly, I would call it a, uh, not wanting to insult any professional editors, I would call it primarily a clerical type of function. Is that due by the, is that due by the February 24th then report time frame or is that due after that time frame? The editing will begin after the close of the comment period from everyone from the VPAC. Okay. Now, perhaps we will get a head start with some earlier comments and the drafts that we have. I think that depends upon the individual working group and the status of that first draft that we currently have in our hands. Okay. Paul? Yes, sir. Yes, sorry. Uh, Paul, uh, different Paul. <laughs> Paul Hardy, sorry. Yeah. Oh. No, sorry. Uh, Wayne, thank you. Um, just wanted to uh, ask you again to elaborate on the consultative process during the final stage here. Uh, particularly, you made made reference to the working group chairs or co-chairs consulting their members. Uh, en route to this final report, and I wondered if you could perhaps elaborate on how that would happen. Well, Paul, I'm not quite sure, or I understand the question you're asking, but I'm going to, I'll try. Um, to come up with a final document, it needs to be done by a very small group. And again, that small group will be Larry, myself, and the respective two co-chairs of each working group. And based on any comments that come in, for instance, from Sony, okay, um, we will wrestle with that amongst the four of us and come away with a product that represents um, the, the best effort that the four of us can do based on the previous drafting that the respective working group has done and based on comments and edits that are received during the comment and edit period. Am I getting to what you want, Paul, or not? Uh, actually, uh, not quite. I was, I was wondering, you made reference to the fact that the working group chairs would be part of this process and they would consult with their members as appropriate and as needed to address issues. I just wanted you to explain a little bit how that might happen. Uh, I don't quite know how that happens. It's up to the working group chairs in terms of are they comfortable with wrestling with the item by themselves? Do they need to go back to the person who provided the comment? Um, it's very hard to make an exact plan when you don't know what the nature of the comment is. Our experience from working group one is that many of the comments were what I would call editorial or clarification uh, in nature. And on those kind of considerations, the, the four of us just moved ahead and, and dealt with it in, a, in a, what we consider to be a sensible way. Uh, where there were items of substance, uh, we had a number of discussions. In some cases, we went back to the commenter and said, now, what do you really mean by this? And tried to thrash it through. Very hard to give a definitive answer to what you're asking, Paul, because it depends upon the nature of what comes in. Thank you. Was there... Was it, there was another question. Shane? This is Shane Fellman from the NAD. I was part of working group one's process and it was very effective. I agree with you of how you've described it. Um, the edits weren't very controversial. They were more just simply edits. The problem came up when someone wanted to change the wording and another person had a different view on how the what word should be used. Do you have any suggestions on how to resolve that? Well, again, not knowing the details of a specific issue, it's very hard to to answer that at, at the moment. 
Um, as you know, in working in the report, the first report that was drafted by Working Group 1 and it came from the VPAC, there were unresolved issues and in some cases there were very different uh, opinions. And so that final report um, had a section called out where there were difference of opinions or controversy, uh, unresolved considerations. And I believe consistent with what Karen mentioned just before, these final reports where we don't have 100% concurrence, we can call those differences out and we plan to call that out. Again, I think Karen indicated that some inputs, even if they're not completely in concurrence, have great value to the Commission in their process moving forward. Anyone else? I would also uh, then at this point in time talk a little bit about the last plenary session for today, nominally starting at uh, 2.15. We do not have a preordained agenda within that time frame. And what we would expect at that time is that the six working group co-chairs would bring to the table during that time items that are of concern to that particular working group or where there is overlap or there maybe should be overlap with another working group. So the inputs for that last session are pretty much on the shoulders of the working group chairs, the, the six folks that are so designated to drive that meeting. Uh, Larry, probably Larry or myself, we will probably chair that, but the, we'll have to kind of work on the fly there to see what agenda items we need to wrestle with together as a whole VPAC that deals and perhaps overlaps with the three working groups. So I really am pointing out to the six co-chairs, you, you're charged with bringing what needs to be brought to that uh, open discussion. Now, clearly, there can be comments from others during that time frame, but uh, since we really don't know what the topics are at this time, we're charging the co-chairs during their plenary sessions, or even if it doesn't come up in their session today, something that is a carryover from previous working group activities or previous VPAC meetings, to put that on the table during that session. This is Larry. Uh, just to make sure that the question that Paul Schrader asked as to when the editing work begins, um, Wayne had asked for specific names within a week, um, and that person then would be able to start going over drafts and organizing that person's work. Uh, so we have a sense of who it might be for one, two, or three of the groups, um, but we would like that person to be designated uh, within a week. This is Pam. Um, I'm going to just quickly review um, the role of what we call outside experts. So when we formed and established the, the VPAC you know, with members and alternates, there were people who were interested in joining the VPAC but couldn't for mostly because they were registered lobbyists, but for some reason or another, they weren't able to join. But they did have maybe a specialized expertise uh, or knowledge that they were able to contribute. So um, after further clarification with our Office of General Counsel, uh, just to reiterate, um, the VPAC members and alternates who are here are the VPAC members and alternates. It is possible for an expert member of the public to read anything that's on the wikis, um, to offer or talk to a member here and say, I think television should be blue, um, or whatever their expert opinion is. 
Um, they're not allowed to be on the reflector groups, the listservs. Um, so they will not be on the listservs. Or, um, but they are allowed to, to, to talk with you if you want to talk with them. So, um, and we're, we're hoping that that information would funnel from them to the members and alternates to the working group co-chairs and to the VPAC co-chairs. <laughs> okay, and does anyone have any questions regarding logistics for today? Okay, so I guess we can start with um, the plenary session of working group two. So this is uh, Charlie Kenimer, and sitting next to me is Paul Schrader. Uh, um, is it expected that we move up to the podium or just talk from here okay or what? From the table. Okay, great. So we'll just talk right here. I um, thought what we'd start by doing, do, by um, going over our report just a little bit and talk about the structure of what's in our current draft. Uh, the, the current draft is certainly not done. I, I think all the groups are going to tell us that in various forms. Uh, and we're probably not as far along as, as we would like to be or should be at this point. Um, the, the drafts have been out there for a little while. We assume that most everybody's had a chance to take a look. Um, there's some introductory material and some background and some historical material uh, that we don't need to really, I don't think, spend any time much on today. Um, we get into a, a whole area uh, that we would certainly welcome comments from anyone on uh, about the, the various industry segments and how video description is processed and passed through, including satellite, um, uh, cable, uh, the broadcast industry, et cetera. Uh, we have some diagrams. Uh, we've, we've got some text materials, uh, some I think still under development that provides some textual explanation of what some of those diagrams have in them. Um, I think our group is, is comfortable with that section. I don't think there's anything uh, currently controversial in there. Uh, I'm just kind of moving through what's in it. Uh, if you move down to uh, uh, section four of our current draft, uh, that's entitled right now, Post CVAA Developments for Delivery of Video Description an area where we talk about, you know, what's next. Uh, that is, what are some of the things that uh, we could, we as an industry and all of us working together can do um, going forward to enhance video descriptions in a number of different ways. Uh, and I suspect there will continue to be some editing in that section, but there's, there's a good bit of material already in there. Uh, following that, we have basically right now placeholder for what actually is a fairly sizable part of our, our, our charge, and we have no text in there yet, and that is about the delivery of uh, video descriptions on internet delivered <laughs> video, um, something that we realize we, we need to have material on. We've got two separate uh, members or groups of, of, of members of the committee that are working on separate pieces there. Um, we haven't brought all that together, and therefore we don't have it in our report yet, so that's certainly an area that we have to focus on in the next um, few weeks, uh, and I think that's a, a big priority for us. Um, there's a, a place for, I think, essentially Paul and I to write a, a conclusion, which we will do uh, in, in the waning days before we turn in our final draft to kind of put some sort of a wrap-up on the, on the whole thing. Um, so that kind of covers that material which is in our report, which by and large is getting close or we know what we have to do. Then there's a, an area at the back uh, under the heading of an annex, uh, section seven and section eight, where we have some material, some of which has simply not yet been adequately vetted in the group. Um, the section seven material is probably pretty fine, although we'll continue to do some work on it. Once you get into what is labeled section eight, um, which we have titled right now, Open Topics and Unresolved Items. 
there, there's where we get into those areas where we may or may not have differing opinions in the final report. Uh, right now, there's areas in there where we do have differing opinions. There are material in there that uh, we simply have not adequately discussed and reviewed as a group. Um, so I think we're going to be mostly focusing on that, as well as the uh, delivery of uh, descriptions on uh, internet video, and continuing to do cleanup. Um, that's kind of the quick summary of what's in it at, at the very high level. We go, go into any amount of detail. I want to turn it over to Paul to, to add his comments, and we'll begin to drive into a little bit more of the detail than I think what we want to do is entertain as many questions as we have time for. Well, Paul? Thanks, Ch Charlie. Uh, do we, somebody have the microphone? Um, great. Uh, okay. Um, Paul Schrader with the American Foundation for the Blind, and I want to thank my co-chair for welcoming, welcoming me late to the process uh, of this uh, work group. We had a replacement in staff at American Foundation for the Blind. I know Brad Hodges has been doing a, a wonderful job, uh, had been doing a wonderful job co-chairing work group two uh, with Charlie. Um, now, there are, as, as Charlie indicated, several items that I think, you know, we want to uh, make sure are referenced as items for further consideration uh, with the slight um, amount of time that Wayne and Larry and others have graciously provided to the 24th. We might be able to work through some of these, but we will raise these today because I think they're important for, uh, for some discussion. Um, those of you who were not on the ad hoc calls for work group two that worked on such things as quality and information, you missed a lot of fun. More fun than humans should be allowed to have, in fact, I think, um, on a Friday afternoon. Um, so, um, you know, it's too bad. But if, if you want to join, uh, there's still opportunities, I think, to have those conversations. And we might have some of those today. Um, and I think the, the other thing we'll want to make sure that we uh, touch upon this morning is the items that... Uh, that likely do fall into uh, other work groups or are, are commingled between um, video description uh, work group two and the uh, areas of three or four. Um, and I, I don't remember Charlie how we wanted to uh, how we wanted to organize things. I could uh, certainly take a stab at putting a couple of those on the table to make sure we have them uh, for our discussion points and there aren't uh, or or we could press right into uh, talking about some of the issues in um, topic eight um, let me let me just uh, for a second spend us uh, a minute on on this this issue of topic uh, the other topics under eight uh, just to help people in this committee who haven't seen this information before perhaps understand where this is coming from um, when I joined the work group in January, there were a number of items that had been hanging around uh, waiting for uh, an opportunity for good consideration, as I understand it, at the work group, uh, dealing with description quality, uh, the way that program information, uh, information that is to say about described programs are provided to consumers, uh, the technical production of description, some of that has been nicely handled in the report and some of that was, was still being debated. And then um, uh, a couple of other issues that were added to the process. As you look through this Section 8, there are, are two items that may be less controversial than the others. Uh, that's one point to make, uh, and that those are the sort of first and last uh, 8.1, and I think it's 8.6 um, that I believe are uh, are less controversial. And let me just say that I think 8.1, the control of the video description, that is to say, the consumer's control over playback, is is most assuredly something that was was and is being looked at in work group four, um, and 8.6 uh, was a an attempt to try to add um, a little bit more understanding of the technical issues uh, or, or what's expected f from the technical recording or production and inclusion of a description track into uh, an existing audio, uh, the audio of, a, of an existing video program. So um, those items, at least I would suggest, may be less, somewhat less controversial um, and 
items that can be taken up. Uh, and as I said, 8.1 certainly is one that uh, is being looked at by work group four. Um, the, the remaining items in that section um, dealing with quality and program information um, are uh, perhaps somewhat controversial and, and perhaps um, also in need of further discussion uh, and, and were not really visited in any significant way until January when we had several uh, ad hoc as well as work group calls that were devoted to those topics. And I really do appreciate uh, the amount of time that a lot of people spent uh, on those topics. They're, they're, uh, they're of great importance, certainly to the consumer community. Uh, there are, there, some of the material in there is probably not as well understood uh, by people who are not consumers or who have not uh, been, um, who have not required the use of video description as a, uh, uh, as, as a main way of getting access to program information. Um, the last point I'll make on this before we, we decide how we want to tackle these topics, um, the, the work group report currently in the earlier sections, in section two, I guess, uh, lays out what our jurisdiction is, and that's drawn from the statute and the uh, and the uh, requirements of the FCC, I would suggest that whether or not we agree with the language that's proposed in under the topics in uh, number section eight, that the FCC made clear in its report and order on video description in paragraphs 50 and 51 that they did have additional requests for the VPAC to consider. Uh, and certainly we want to make sure that those are noted as legitimate and important items uh, that, the, that the commission expected us to tackle uh, as, a, as a committee. Uh, those would have to do with quality, which is explored under uh, 8.2, I guess, uh, and, and, and elucidated in paragraph 50. And then um, program information, uh, which was described in paragraph 51 of the report and order and is included he here under 8.4. Uh, so one of the suggestions I certainly feel very strongly about is that we make sure that it's clear that the work group and the VPAC understands that that is a, uh, that those were requests made by the commission communicated through a uh, report and order uh, for VPAC consideration. Let me pause there, Charlie, and ask but, but, uh, if you want to comment there or if you want to uh, figure out how we want to take up these items. Uh, you, you, no, Charlie, uh, get my microphone back on. Hello. Okay. Uh, one, um, uh, one, I don't have any real comments on that right now. One uh, way we might proceed, Paul, is to invite uh, those who are not members of Working Group 2 uh, to ask questions first and allow those who are members to try and respond to those, and assuming that there are none or we get through that, then we can go into a broader discussion amongst those of us who've been up to our ears in the process. But I think it makes sense uh, now that we've put this out in front of the larger group to invite comments from those who have not been sitting in our calls. Does that make sense to you, Paul? It, it does. It does. So uh, with, with that, I, I think what I would do is say, you know, open the floor right now to questions preferably from non-group members on anything that's in the draft that we have out there and we'll see where, where we are. Is that all right? Question? Okay. Yeah, oh, here we go. Lisa, Lisa, okay, there, we found you, I think. The, yeah, I can, the cameras found you, but <laughs> we're working on it. Oh, ah, testing. Hey, hey, hey. Okay, gotcha. it works. Okay, um, my question, this is Lisa Hamlin from Hearing Loss Association. My question was, it's, it's not clear to me when I look at this where it says open topics, uh, section eight, open topics, topics and unresolved items, and you're talking about the quality issue, um, 8.2. I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, I'm looking at this. It looks pretty clear and straightforward and looks like a good set. Now, I don't know everything about description, so tell me what the sticking point is so I can understand it better. You want to? 
Does anybody who uh, who's not co-chair of the committee want to respond to Lisa? <laughs> I, uh, well, I I think the short answer to that is some of the information that is in there right now on, on uh, quality, uh, for example, things around voicing and production quality, scripting, whatever. Uh, at least at this point, does not have universal uh, agreement as to whether it's all the right material. Uh, that could be not necessarily agreement on what the information is, or maybe not necessarily agreement on you know the level of detail. Uh, we spent a lot of time, as Paul alluded to, talking about this, and I don't think we've come together yet as a group as to exactly what's in and what's out. So this is Lisa again. Hello? Yeah. So you're saying this whole section is under question? There is still, I mean, there's nothing that you came up with a consensus that's actually that people agree on in this section? This is, uh, uh, Paul, um, let me, I won't uh, characterize for members of industry what the objection is further than to say, I think there there is a concern about imposing a particular kind of uh, or approach to description that uh, that was expressed. Now, I, I you know I think this language doesn't do, doesn't do that, but that's that's my interpretation of it. Um, more uh, more to the point, I guess for for the purposes of committee deliberation, this came very late. Uh, I mean, the reality is this language was was uh, considerably. Uh, Worked on in the last couple of weeks of January, uh, with with a lot of good effort from people trying to to make it more clear and more precise and more appropriate. Uh, but I think it in in all honesty and I think for everyone's uh, benefit, whether or not there are objections to the substance, uh, I think that quite apart, there there were certainly concerns that people didn't have a lot of time. To work with it now, um, I think people have had uh, a week or two. Um, I don't think I don't think this language is is it, it is primarily different from what has appeared before in editorial um, clarity. I hope uh, more than it is in terms of new substance or, or dramatically changed substance, at least with respect to the language in 8.2. Uh, including the resource section. Uh, we've got uh, a little bit more time, obviously, to, to work this out as a work group, but I think, I think the concerns are, one, that the, the language is new, and two, uh, that there was some concern about uh, the, the possibility of imposed um, approaches or strategies for description. Uh, some, oh, yeah, down there. Sorry. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> this is John Carter from Echostar. So, so to speak to your point, I, I want to echo that the, the final version of this text had come to the work group fairly late. Uh, speaking personally, uh, in some sense, what we are being asked to write are, are, are objective rules for subjective measurements. That's not entirely accurate, and we're trying to figure out, a, a, at least I'm trying to figure out, where and how to uh, to describe a quality measurement for an interpretation of what's what's being presented without closing the door, without uh, disallowing something in two years that suddenly becomes the, the vogue, the, the, the right way to provide descriptions. Uh, I don't yet know how to do that. And, and so my, my job as I review the language that's coming in is to figure out where is the right place that, that I feel to draw the line. Clearly. The, the need for quality uh, has come into the working group. I think everybody in the working group understands that this is a, a need. Uh, as was pointed out, you know, that the request came in from the commission as well. What I'm concerned about doing is setting up uh, something that is either too stringent or not stringent enough at this point in the industry. Okay, th thanks. So, th thank you, Karen. Is this on? Okay. So I know that a, a good amount of time has been focused on quality, and there's no question that quality is very important. We've had some problems with quality of closed captioning in the past. Um, 
However, the charge of this committee, the most important charge right now, is to get video description out to consumers. I mean, we already have, as you know, our video description rules. They are going into effect in July. There are concerns that the devices used to convey video descriptions may not be providing um, the features that they need to provide if these rules are not in place, or it, that it may be too difficult to access video description on certain apparatus if these rules aren't in place. The, the principal charge of this committee and the working group is to give us recommendations on how to ensure that consumers can access and use video descriptions. Quality is very important, but it's really secondary, and it's not part of the direct charge. Now, we did indicate in our video description final report and order that it would be helpful for this committee to take up quality issues, and that's why I understand that you've taken it up. However, at, at this point, I would recommend, make a recommendation that the quality issues be tabled for purposes of the report. Anybody that would like to submit information on quality or any group that would like to submit information on quality please feel free to do so as a, a separate um, addendum to the report. You may not reach consensus on it. Please feel free to continue your discussions after this meeting is over, after this committee is over. But I, th I can't impress upon you the importance of making sure that we get the information that we need to be able to ensure that people who are blind and visually impaired get access to video description through the apparatus that they're using in a timely fashion, and that's the primary goal. So I, I'm concerned about waylaying this discussion any further with quality issues. Joel, you had a concern. Hi. Hello. Hello. This is Joel. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, but I, I guess I respectfully, very respectfully, because you know how I feel about your judgment, disagree. Um, I don't think whether we have a, 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 sub, a, a subset on quality here or not is going to delay the implementation of the rules. You know more about that than, than I do, but that's just not going to happen in my humble opinion. But after 30 years in this work and seeing an awful lot of excellent description, but far more horrible description go out over the airways, and as you know so well, people who are deaf or Part of hearing have been complaining for years about the quality of captions. I was so pleased to see paragraphs 50 and 51 because it it pr proactively preempts that issue with regard to description. It says that you you want to just get some advice. We're not proposing anything to be in law or in any rules. Just some best practices. These are not standards that are objective, uh, John, just to, to use your word. Uh, they are best practices, which are every bit as objective. I thoroughly believe better no description than bad description. Now, I, I wouldn't take that so far as to, you know, scuttle the whole rule, but I have seen people listen to description for the first time. It's awful. They pull that earpiece out of their ear and they never use it again because they find it intrusive, because the mix is horrible. The technical portion on in 8.6 here has been whittled down to a paragraph that essentially is meaningless, useless. I honestly, if you want advice and some comment, then I my feeling is we need to give you some detail that points you in that direction. So here's my response. Um, First of all, congratulations. You have been successful in elevating this issue. And I think that that, if, you know, if, if anything that's just as important as um, getting final consensus language in this report, because um, I think that there are a lot of people that would agree that there have been concerns about the deterioration of captioning quality over the years. Um, that is why we have an open proceeding on this. And it would be very nice to not have to have a proceeding later on video description and to get it right the first time around. 
However, we have a charge from Congress, and our primary charge is equipment-based. It's not quality. It's not that we don't want the quality to be superior or sufficient, or competent, um, efficient for the user. Clearly, if it's not acceptable, people aren't going to use it, and that would defeat the whole purpose. I agree with you. Um, what I would recommend is, again, however, that you finish with the charge that you've been given. I have no problems if your task force, your separate task force that has been working on this, would like to continue. We, as you know, will have an, an, an inquiry into video description. That's part of the charge after the rules are implemented. I think that that is a perfect time to continue this discussion. If you would like to move it up, however, I have no problem after April 8th, um, after you submit what you submit, having meetings here. We can facilitate those meetings um, as part of the Accessibility and Innovation Initiative. We can facilitate dialogues for an ongoing discussion to keep this issue alive. But again, I. I sort of have to put my foot down that this is not part of the charge of this committee at this time. If we had a lot of extra time, I, w I would not mind devoting time to it. I feel that, however, it is secondary. It has to be secondary to what Congress has told us to do in this particular committee. Um, so what I would recommend is that we, um, Pam and Allison, commit to setting up follow-up meetings to continue this discussion, to keep it alive, but to, um, at this point, at this meeting right now, we're going to have to table the discussion to move on to the other issues that are part of the charge of the committee, which are how equipment will be used by people with vision disabilities to be able to access video description. So I'm actually ending the discussion right now. I do not want any more discussion on it. We need to move on. And again, we make a commitment to you, a solemn commitment to keep this issue alive and um, promise to, to the extent that I can prom make, make a promise for this administration or the next administration to keep this issue alive and to include it in our inquiry on video description. So let's move on to the next issue, if there are other issues for working group two. Let's see if, uh, yeah, Karen, uh, a process question from the co-chair. Uh, I believe what I heard you say is if we could certainly include in our report or along with our report, quality information submitted by members. Yes. Would, it could be in the report in an appendix. It could yes. be submitted. Same Absolutely. Way. I, I know that, that you've right. already done a significant amount of work on this. We would love to see what you have, whether it's consensus-based or individual. Okay. Um, you, there is absolutely no barrier to you including it in the report, and we hope that you do. Again, I just don't want to take the time of this committee to Understand. try to reach consensus. That's fine. Understood, Paul. Thanks. Let me uh, let me ask that we, uh, Paul Schrader, uh, return to uh, eight point one, which I do think um, would uh, would certainly fall within the scope of what uh, Karen was t discussing, uh, and that has to do with control. I, I I have not had a chance to. I mean, I've read Work Group Four's report. I've not had a chance to make sure um, that or to, to, to determine where there's a, a full match. I think Work Group 4 probably has adequately a look, a, addressed these issues. So for the moment, what might be sufficient is to say that 8.1 regarding control of description is, is, a, is a key item uh, that um, you uh, mentioned, Karen, and I, and I think um, has a lot to do with whether consumers are going to be able to ultimately use this this service or not, um, and I and hopefully that's addressed adequately in work group four. And whatever we've got here, either either can go away um, because it's addressed where where it belongs there, or uh, if need be, this this is used to um, uh, further elaborate on that. So what I would suggest is maybe this is an item we I don't know if this is an item that's appropriate for this afternoon's discussion probably is, um, or work group four might indicate that 
that they feel that they've adequately covered these topics. Thanks, Charlie. This is um, Jeff Nudak. I'm actually uh, I'm a participant in Working Group 2, but I'm also the co-chair of Working Group 4, so I, I can help address that one. That, that's certainly an area that we've uh, put a lot of focus on. Um, so the, the current draft that we submitted um, didn't include a ton of the text uh, in that area, but it is, you know, we have draft text available that was still under review, um, which is why it wasn't included in, in the current draft um, but yes, we, we are certainly covering it. Looking at the four points that we have there in the working group uh, two draft, uh, I would say all four are covered um, by working group four. So, uh, Paul, what then? What what we would want to make sure is that this afternoon we sounds to me like we need to deal with ensure determining how this ends up in the report or how this ends up being addressed in the report. Um, because it's not currently in the work group four material, so there isn't really anything for us to be able to react to um, today. But um, but this is the, the 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 item that emerged from at least a part of the working group two discussions around control. I don't know if this has consensus. Um, it, it's under this set of topics because it really hadn't been discussed. Uh, significantly work group too. So what I would suggest is that we make sure this is an item that we key up for um, consideration later today. Um, I want to, um, at the risk of incurring the wrath of my good friend and colleague Karen Strauss, ask about 8.4 program information. Which okay. relates to paragraph 51. I'm Paul, sorry, Charlie. Paul, if I may, before you move, we do yeah. have a question. Let's, let's get that in. Point four. Point four. There we go. <laughs> yep. Oh, now it's on. There okay. We go. On. All right. This is Naomi from Google. I was going to ask a question about 4.1, but I'm, I'm happy to pass the floor back to Paul if, if we want to finish with section eight. Oh, okay. I mean, why did, can we hold that then? I think that that works. Then I, I thought it was on the where we are. Go ahead, Paul. Um, under uh, 8.4 is an item on program information, uh, and and uh, it says program information selection, but it really is primarily related to how individuals, uh, the constituency covered here, individuals who are blind or visually impaired, are to know about video described program. Uh, this again comes out of the, uh, the, the, the request in the report and order uh, to look at these issues, uh, noting that the commission declined to require any specific um, kind of uh, information to be provided regarding what programs are described. There is um, one element here that probably that most assuredly bridges working group two and four and that has to do with program guide information uh, though I think the way it's construed it primarily is a working group two issue because it has to do with ensuring that the program guide actually contains the information about description as a data field I'm told that that is doable within Tribune and Rovi um, that may be something we need to uh, ensure is true um, that's one item, and then there's a and then there's a second set of items around uh, the <clears throat> provision of information. What uh, again? What has been recommended by a a subgroup uh, within uh, working group four? Um, excuse me, working group two is that websites uh, of the entities covered under the description report and order uh, provide information about the programs that they are. Uh, describing that they make available with description. Um, there is also discussion of alternate ways of providing that information, noting that not everyone, of course, has access um, to the web uh, or would make would be able to make use of that information. Uh, so, using aggregator sites and phone-based and other kinds of information, these would all, of course, most of those would, of course, fall under the heading of recommendations because. Um, we don't know precisely all of the ways in which information can and will be distributed, um, but I think the program guide and the web-based information are two items that would probably fall somewhat higher in terms of uh, a high level of interest on the part of the consumer 
members of Working Group 2 in any case uh, to ensure that there is information about the programs available or to, as my friend and colleague used to say, put the hay down where the goats can get it. We've got to know what the hell programs are available so we can watch them. Uh, and if there's not an easy way to do that, sitting in front of our TV waiting for that hour or so of described program is not going to be a very effective way to make sure that people can access the programs that are being made available. To you, describing yourself as the goat. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> no, I'm putting the hay down. <laughs> Charlie here. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that uh, in part just for information for those who have not been on the working group, and, and Paul came in a little bit later. And we did spend a good bit of time talking about program guide information. Uh, a couple of us talked directly to Tribune and Rovi uh, and got positive feedback there. Uh, a number of the affected programmers and broadcasters have been talked to, though not all. And the, the general sense is that those who will be providing description starting in the July time frame are willing to provide this information and are capable of providing it to to Roby, to Tribune, uh, or to other uh, places, websites, or alternate means that may be able to make it available. So I think we've made some headway in that area. Um, we don't have a, a complete solution yet. Um, I think there's a, a general sense, uh, and I've looked for my colleagues in industry to respond to this, that adding this information into electronic program guides on set-top boxes and so forth is also a doable thing, although it is going to take some time because it's fairly substantial software changes and uh, these things tend to take longer than we wish they did sometimes. But I think there's a general sense about that. We've had less discussion in the group about alternate ways of making information available and websites, so I think that section is, is an area we have to spend more time talking about. Entertain, uh, well first, Karen, and then any other questions in this area? Um, first of all, you will not incur my wrath. I want to be clear that it wasn't wrath that I was expressing before. I was just concerned for um, achieving the congressional purpose here. And I do think that this one is clearly within um, various various components of the legislative purpose of this act, um, most notably because uh, Section 205 does, in fact, talk about programming guides reflecting a legislative intent to enable people who are blind and visually impaired to be able to access uh, information about programming content. So I do think that this is well within your um, the, the tasks that you have been given. Uh, that information can be provided on programming guides. If you come up with some alternatives, such as websites, I think that that would also be within uh, the legislative guidance. So I actually think that this one is more is closer to the tasks that you have been assigned to achieve, to complete. Okay. Questions uh, or other comments? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted to go on record as Roe v. Uh, saying that we do provide this data today. It's something that our editorial staff capture for uh, identi identifying where uh, visual descriptions are available. Uh, and it is something that we make available through our data feeds. Uh, it's not something that we receive a lot of feedback on from the community, so if the community ever wanted to reach out to Rovi and let us know where we're doing it right or where we're doing it wrong or other places where we should be making this data available through applications or websites or things like that, uh, we'd be very uh, receptive to that sort of feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Larry? That, that's great news. I'm wondering if uh, the people who are providing you with the data are actually often making use of that uh, facility you're providing? Are they providing you with the information you need? Uh, actually, the way that it works is we actually reach out to the broadcasters, and uh, we have 400 editorial staff in Pennsylvania that uh, work with the broadcasters every week to ask them questions about where this information is available. Uh, so we actually um, 
uh, find this information ourselves and put it into a database as opposed to having someone automatically feed it to us. Uh, so, so we are getting the information we need. We do do uh, primary research. If, if we don't get that information from retailers, uh, discovering which series of television programming actually has that information available and, and uh, recorded in our da database on an ongoing basis. So we, I, I do think that we do have access to information. Uh, it hasn't been problematic getting access to it, uh, but we do want to make sure that it is ending up in all the right places so that uh, the people who need it actually have access to it. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, very, very quickly, Joel, um, I don't think we have anybody from Tribune Media Services in the room, right? Uh, and just uh, to cover the other side, because they're primarily two two companies in this business, Rovi and Tribune Media Services. Uh, and, and John Card has spoken to Tribune, and I think if they were here, they would say similar things. Is that correct, John? John, this is John Card from Echostar. Yes, uh, Dish Network, as well as a number of other uh, MVPDs, use Tribune's data set. Uh, I've, I've encouraged Tribune to join our, our conversations. Uh, they were not a VPAC member. I believe that as this proceeding moves forward, as the VPAC report is published, as public comments come in, as the FCC moves forward, I, I expect strongly that Tribune will, will do what they, they feel is right. The, the technical information that I understand is much like Rovi's data feed. Uh, there are fields in the Tribune data set that is being received today that does indicate uh, uh, video description is present. I don't have a good familiar familiarity, although I suspect the, the systems are similar in terms of how that data is put in is a manual process. Certainly, as video description moves forward, I would expect to see automation brought in. And as the industries mature, uh, the, the, the kinds of engineering systems that would provide feedback w will be in place. Um, and, and I also am certain that all of us will be waiting to see how, in July, as description rolls out, uh, how well each parts of the, the ecosystem does. So yeah, Tribune, I, I wasn't asked to speak for them. I, I wasn't granted that authority, but the, the, the engineering data is there. That, that's, not a, that's not going to be where the problems are, I suspect, uh, for, for many of us. Uh, uh, thank you, John. And Joel? Yeah, um, let me know if I should raise this under the discussion later uh, on, on uh, report uh, section uh, working group number four, um, but the information dissemination concept gives me a, a way to perhaps sneakily get to the issue of two secondary audio services. I'm at home. I access the information. Ah, there's video description for my favorite program. Oh, look at this. Isn't that wonderful? There's Spanish translation for it, too. Then what does the blind consumer do? We've put up with that through the analog days. In the digital days, as is my understanding from our discussions, that is technically possible to have two secondary audio services. Um, I would like to be able to, it's going to affect how information is reviewed and accessed and ultimately it's a section four issue, I guess, with respect to having those two services. I don't know how many programs out there have Spanish translator in the past and audio description. It has happened, and we should be preemptive, I think, uh, proactive with respect yeah. to that concern. Joel, Joel it's Paul yeah. uh, with AFB. I'm going to suggest that um, one of the, uh, I don't know if the microphone's on you, uh, yeah, one, yeah. one of the items that we put forward as a uh, plenary discussion item is I guess, for lack of a better word, the ISO 639 or whatever other standard is appropriate uh, for tagging. And um, as I, I, I will confess to being a little confused, even by our own report on 639, it's mentioned three different times with slightly different information uh, in one of them. Uh, so either it's an evolving standard or I'm confused, or both, which is certainly possible. Um, but I think that's an item that's certainly worth, uh, b because it does overlap uh, us and, and, and probably three to some degree, um, maybe four also. I don't. I want to. I want to suggest that um, that we will likely continue to look at these program information items in work group two, uh, and I would certainly want to hear 
not today necessarily, but w reasons why it would be uh, not doable to have uh, websites contain the information, at least as a bare minimum, uh, beyond, along with the program guides containing the information as a, uh, as, a, as a way for individuals to get that information. I want to raise, though, one other point here, and that's 8.5, the point of contact, where, uh, and again, this was suggested rather late in the process, uh, and so I'm, I'm, we may still be able to debate this and work on this in the, in the working group, but uh, this is based on or modeled on the uh, uh, requirements in closed captioning where uh, an individual would be able to get information or, or, or find somebody if there's a problem with description. Uh, I, I'm sure this has been... Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, sh I hope this was successful in the captioning context, and that there's there's hopefully fairly fairly few problems. Given the challenges that uh, we've heard about with uh, people uh, using the secondary audio secondary audio channels, uh, my guess is there will be uh, some challenges with description, and at the very least, consumers need to know who the heck they can talk to to find out. You know, is this program supposed to be described? And should I be getting it on my system, and why am I not? Um, and and so that point of contact requirement that was set up for captioning seems quite applicable to description. Uh, ideally, it would be uh, largely handled the, the same way, if not the same person. Uh, so that 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 process should already be in place uh, by all of the entities covered here. Uh, thank, thanks, Paul. I, from a process point of view, if I may, I think we've got about four different things on the table. Um, and I think the four things are the guide info discussion. We uh, then, uh, Joel sneakily brought us into the audio channel. Your word, not mine. Uh, then the, the question of the ISO 639 and the tagging of information, which is arguably a separate but closely related topic. And then the point of contact. Um, all of those are valid things to entertain discussion on here. If I may back up to where we, where we were on the guide info, just to see were there any other questions or comments on that before we really move past it. I, I didn't see any, but I just want to be sure. Okay. Uh, so then I think the audio channel question and the tagging cha channel, tagging of the channel are two separate things, but are very closely related, as many of us understand. Um, and I don't know if it's appropriate to have that further discussion now or later in the day, but at least let's see if there are any, any questions or comments to what you all have to say. Okay, Larry. Yeah, this is Larry. Um, I'm not sure where this would go, but a conversation began in the working group about uh, practices for um, what to do when there's no description. And is that a tagging issue? Is that a secondary audio question? Uh, I know uh, program providers are, are talking about this now within other groups. So what the practice would be, whether replicating the main audio or having a barker, or two yeah. suggestions came up, and I'm not sure where we discussed that. Well, I, I think we can take a second here, uh, get back, take a second here to, to make sure everybody understands what that, that topic is. Uh, that one uh, is about as interesting to talk about as whether we call it video description or audio description, I think. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that Larry was getting at, for those who have not been a part of it and may not fully captured it, is when the channel that would contain video description, if available, doesn't have video description because there isn't any available, what should be there? Uh, should that be the primary uh, audio without descriptions because they are none, or should it be uh, something that identifies that uh, descriptions are not currently available? Uh, uh, the other possibility is should it be blank and have nothing at all there? And I think everybody agrees that's not a good idea. I understand that does sometimes happen today, but everybody I've talked to agrees it really shouldn't be happening today. Um, I think we can certainly take a comment on that right now if anybody's got any. We've heard heard quite a bit about it in our, our group, but I don't know that we have total consensus. Yes. Sure. Oh, oh, go ahead, Rosalind. Uh, hi. Hello. Is it on? There we ah, go. Gotcha. Um, this is Rosalind Crawford. Um, Marlena mentioned she did a, um, uh, an ad hoc survey of consumers uh, who suggested that they would prefer to have, if there's no video description or Spanish language programming on the second audio stream, that the main audio be presented. 
And I was a little surprised when I heard that. But after some thinking, um, it seems that unless and until we have an easy way for consumers to move between the main and the secondary audio stream via the consumer inter user interfaces, whether that be by remote control or by uh, talking menus or by an automated system, um, that if a, if a consumer can find their way to the secondary audio stream and just position themselves there um, and get the main audio or the Spanish or the video description, whatever is available, their need to switch between the main and the secondary audio only gets activated when there's, for example, Spanish language. Or, yeah, I suppose okay, so okay, that they, they the need to they need to switch between the main and the secondary audio less. Right. If the main the audio shows up on the secondary audio as a matter of routine, and so it minimizes their need to maneuver. And so for that reason, I understand that. How, why consumers expressed that sure. desire to have main audio? Yeah, uh, we we yeah you know, we did hear that. We have we have heard an alternate view as well. Go, go ahead. Working. Right. This is Brian Charlson, and I'm uh, the co-chair of Group Four, and uh, consumer of video described television. And I'll tell you that the issue of whether or not how frequently there is nothing there. I think you've underestimated how often nothing is there. It's not occasionally, it's frequently not there. And there's also a question not just of do we send that primary audio stream on that side, but also the quality of that audio stream. Frequently it is of, uh, I, I can, can't describe it any other way than harsher sounding, less clean soundtrack when it is available. I don't have any idea why technically that's true, but the volume levels change, and it simply is a harsher experience frequently when it's transmitted. So I hope that's covered in your suggestion as well. Thank you, Brian. Um, I've, I've been reminded that we have 15 minutes left for Working Group 2's discussion now, and that we're expected to spend the remaining 15 minutes looking at uh, action items and timelines. I don't know how much time we need to spend on that, but uh, there could be another question or two. Uh, but, you know, we certainly need to um, to do what we've been asked to do on the agenda in terms of, of action items and, and timelines for the group. Uh, I'll, I'll comment that the timeline, I think, has kind of been laid out for us by Wayne. Uh, <laughs> so, Paul, you want to... We know what the timeline is. <laughs> do you want to add anything, Paul? Um, uh, just to make the point that we so so this issue of the treatment of audio on the second channel, the channel that was reserved for description or other purposes, um, is an issue that we that we are going to need to deal with. Um, it, it you know in the in limited time available to the to the working group. Um, if if there isn't further comment on that. Today, I think we've we've certainly heard the view expressed quite clearly that the preference is for uh, for the main audio to be replicated, and the the issue of quality was raised, and I, I suspect there are answers to that um, having to do with the nature of that second channel. But yeah. right. on the on the topic, Brian, of uh, nothing being there, I, I think if there's anything we completely agree on, is nothing is not a good choice. And clearly, we would have that that recommendation, um, and certainly, I have talked to many of the uh, affected programmers, and we'll be happy to continue to do so, and continue to point out that the channel should never be blank. Uh, and you know, I, I find it unfortunate to continue to hear that that is the case because I don't actually hear people telling me that's what they're intentionally doing, but <laughs> obviously, some are. But we'll, we we need to get that fixed for sure. Um, Wayne. Wayne. Um, recognizing you had not seen that new timetable uh, until this morning, um, what, and I'm addressing to both Paul and Charlie, um, what would be your 
thought or plan for what you might be trying to do in the next two weeks uh, prior to the 24th in order to perhaps have a second draft? I'm not saying you must have a second draft. Um, are you going to have try to have another meeting or two or six? Uh, and particularly what topics will you be trying to tackle in that time frame? This Paul, and then, and then Charles will be interested in what you think. But I, there, there are two, two things. One is that um, one of the ways that these next two weeks can be used very constructively, and this may be something we talk about this afternoon, is how to resolve areas of overlap. So, for example, this control issue. Uh, I'd love to have a, a way to work with Working Group 4 to get that resolved uh, so that we've got clear language around what control of, of the audio um, but how the consumer had best control their, their audio experience uh, and selection. The issue of uh, tagging is another one that would be good to have a broader um, way to deal with if we can't wrap that up today. I think there are several items remaining in this uh, report that we've mentioned this morning. So, you know, the program guide, the web information, uh, the point of contact. Uh, that that would certainly I would recommend that we have additional uh, teleconference conversations to see if we can come to language of that that is consensus uh, that reflects uh, what what we can all uh, agree to in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, uh, thanks Paul. I, I've been advised that I guess there are folks on the phone that had questions that haven't been able to get in for some reason, but I've kind of skipped over and I apologize. So. We'll get to the phone in one moment. Go ahead. I thank you. In a minute. Okay, it's on. This is uh, Naomi from Google. I noticed section 4.1 titled uh, the Internet section is uh, quite blank, and I would be willing to volunteer to write some copy for it, but I don't know what has already been done and whether there's anybody else who might join me in order to make sure that we have a, a more full view of the Internet than might be represented by somebody who lives within the walls of Google. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have a phone? <laughs> yeah, there could be a fuller view. Uh. Yeah, I, I, Char Charlie, I, I know we've had this is an item you referenced, and and thanks, Naomi. We we weren't going to let this go without getting back to 4.1 because I'm glad you raised it. Um, I know, Charlie, this is an item that's been hanging around as well. I think you referenced that there was some text being worked on. Um, I, I haven't seen it. I'm not sure where that text is, but I, but I think the short answer is absolutely this is an item that would be very important to um, get some language together on. It is, um, it is a very future-looking and important part of, of what this committee, this VPAC, could, could do, it seems to me, for, for the world. Um, and I know that there was some efforts uh, or some interest in, in, in the web uh, web. World Wide Web Consortium uh, on on this issue as well, so that might be a, a way to combine forces. Right. Yeah, uh, Gene Spellman was was working on this uh, for us, and also Mark Turitz and Chris Heaton and I think some others were working. And I think so far that's separate work, and neither have been presented to the group yet. And so maybe Gene would like your help, Naomi. Gene, I'm sorry. Sorry, my bad. Get a microphone over. Hey, Naomi. Um, uh, so I am Judy Brewer from W3C. Jean is uh, listening in on the phone in parts of the day. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry that that uh, work hasn't gotten to you yet. And, um, uh, Naomi, that would be great if you could also uh, team up with us. And I'll probably be working with Jean on that as well. So, um, And I think that my understanding is there was also maybe someone else from Working Group 2 who had already had an assignment on that as well. Jean and I were trying to figure out who the other assigned people were so that we can work together and, and move this thing along quickly and get it into the document. Uh, Charlie, do you know that, who the that, other That would be uh, Mark Turitz, Chris Heaton, and, and, and possibly others. That Mark, okay. do you want to? Um, Greg so Cutler, me, right, thank you. So uh, do you want to? We do have questions from the phone. I want to get to those, but I, uh, I'm I, sorry, I just guess to, that's the answer. Go ahead. May, may I just suggest that those of us who are in the room um, who are interested in getting Section 4 populated as fast as possible meet at the morning break and just figure out a plan? Does that that work for everybody? Mark, that work. Yeah. Okay, and I think there. 
So, and if you want to aim for this table, then we can at least have a spot to aim for and get get a schedule in place. Thank Great. you. Uh, that's, uh, that sounds good. Yeah, we do. We definitely need to, to get that moving along. And, and now, finally, to those on the phone, I, we haven't heard anybody, but I uh, assume there are people there. Um, this is Marlena. Go Hello. Ahead. Oh, we, okay. We can hear you. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, um, I've been um, trying to speak up, and apparently the, the volume was low, and you guys couldn't hear me. So my question is perhaps going a little bit um, backwards, but... Um, when um, Joel um, talked about the presence of Spanish language and um, video description um, sharing the, the, the same channel, if you will, I just wanted to get clarification. I thought that we were told that um, video description would always take priority over Spanish language. In other words, if they're both present, then video description would have the priority. So I wanted to clarify that um, and also um, to, um, ag again, uh, thank um, Rosaline for um, explaining what I was trying to explain, but you guys couldn't hear me, um, that it was a very clear response that I got from the consumers with whom I spoke that, in fact, they did not want to have to switch back and forth between main channel and SAP channel. So okay. thanks for that, Rosaline. Uh, th th thank you, Marlene. I'm sorry we were slow getting to you. Uh, I'm looking down to the end of the table with the FCC staff, and they're all looking at each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to look to Karen. <laughs> one of us is going to be the messenger. Um, actually, um, Marlena, the rules do not give video description the priority. Actually, it's the other way around. Um, it's, it's kind of, I, I don't want to quote the rules. I want to get them. I don't have them in front of me, but video description does not always have priority. So let's just table this for now. The fact is, though, that where there are, I mean, when I say table it, I want to just get the rules bring them sure. down a little bit sure. later today. Yeah, um, yeah well, that's, that's, that's why I raised it, Karen, because I, yeah, I no, wanted it's, clarification. It, this, is, um, this is something that I think that uh, some of us had expected to be resolved in the digital age, um, where there would be more bandwidth and it would not be a problem of having competing services over the same audio stream but it is still an issue as we understand it, and Allison always has the rules, everything at her disposal. Let's see if I can see this. Um, so let's see. Just hold on one second. Oh, wait, no, no it's she, too big. She made it very, very big. Hey, thanks to Apple. Um, Allison, we have the rules. where is the. Just one second. You want to get in there? You want to talk while she's no, reading? No, we don't need 79.2. Yeah. We need video description rules. Okay, let, let's see what Rosalind had to. Um, I don't want to hold you up anymore, yeah, but the, but the bottom up. line is that when there are um, two two different streams passing through, a video description does not automatically get preference. Understood. Right. Uh -huh. Hi, this is uh, Rosaline. Uh, two two items. Uh, the first is uh, the section in the report uh, for findings and recommendations. I expect we will also be addressing as as part of the, the next two weeks. That section currently is blank. There's a placeholder. And for purposes of next steps, um, I would expect that we would want to probably meet by phone next week, probably at our usual 1 o'clock Wednesday time. Uh, if, if that's the case, I'll go ahead and make those arrangements for logistical purposes. If you would like to meet additionally or on other days or times, if you'd be so kind as to let me know so I can make the arrangements. I, I believe that is our plan to meet at least the next two Wednesdays at 1 o'clock Eastern time. Is that your understanding, Paul? Yeah, yeah that sounds fine. Uh, In, um, and I have the language if you'd like me to read it. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, go ahead. The, the language from 79.3 um, states that once a commercial television broadcast station um, has aired a particular program with video description. It's required to include video description with all subsequent airings of that program. 
on the same broadcast station unless it is using the technology used to provide video description for another purpose related to the programming that would conflict with the pro- with providing the video description. So at that point, I believe um, that the station has the option of choosing video description or Spanish language programming or some other service. As we, uh, I don't know if there are hands up, but as we come to uh, closing up our section, I want to again reiterate that we're that we're looking at the the overlap issues. I think are are the issue of control, the program guide data, uh, and, and dealing with that. And then I I really do strongly believe that this signaling issue. Um, has to be addressed, and that is an overlap issue, I believe. Um, in our report on, I think it's page 16, we say, furthermore, at present, no method is currently in use for unambiguously signaling video description, um, disambiguated from second language, et cetera. I'm not sure that that's entirely true with where 639 is, as I understand it, but um, in any case, it later goes on to say that we, uh, in light of this, call for uh, an evolutionary movement. I believe in evolution too, but I'm not sure that evolution is the fastest way to get to this. This needs to be resolved much more quickly than than evolution might get us there. Uh, so I'm suggesting that that, that that issue may not have consensus currently um, in, in, in our own work group anymore because I think we need to address that signaling issue much more aggressively. So I'm hoping we can get to that today uh, because it strikes me that that is an issue critical to emergency as well as it is to uh, description of video programming. Thanks, Paul. Clearly that topic is going to come up in working group three and working group four and in the afternoon session. I suspect we are going to spend some time on it. I know we've essentially run out of time. I wanted to just ask, was there any other questions from the phone that we failed to take? I guess guess not. any, any other last-minute comment before we wrap up Working Group 2's presentation for now? Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Wayne? Okay. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Charlie and Paul and all the contributors here. Uh, we're pretty much on schedule, which is a good thing. We have a scheduled uh, break for uh, 15 minutes, and uh, at the top of the hour, uh, 11 a.m., We will uh, reconvene, and uh, I trust that the working group, two people, will vacate the front table in favor of the working group, four people. And before you get up, Mark, sit down. (laughs) (laughs) I would like to introduce Robert Aldridge, um, who is our new front office legal advisor at the commission Um, at the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau on disability issues. Right now he's mostly focusing on relay services, but because many of you will continue to work on accessibility issues, you will probably have some contact with Bob, and so I wanted you to be able to put a name with a face. Thank you. So uh, process-wise, those of us at the table that are in four group two but not in three should move out. Is that the deal? All right, four. Yeah, yeah, it's four. actually four. Four is next. Uh, okay. Uh, up next. Got it. Are tents with us? I'm uh, not sure. All right. Uh, Good morning, everybody. This is Jeff Nudek uh, from Motorola. I'm the industry co-chair for Working Group 4. And I'll introduce my co-chair, Brian Charlson. And I'm Brian Charlson, and I am co-chair representing consumers. I actually wear so many hats that it's hard to tell. You might want to call me Bartholomew. But I am the uh, director of computer training services at an adult rehabilitation center called the Carroll Center for the Blind and a very lifetime active member of the American Council of the Blind. Great. So uh, with with that, why don't we why don't we jump in? So um, Brian and I put together a quick presentation that just kind of gives everybody, a, a, I think, a, a quick overview of um, Working Group Four's focus, uh, how we've attacked uh, our charter and uh, our status. Um, I suspect the the majority of our time here is uh, likely going to be in discussion. But why, why don't we do the quick overview? If we could start the presentation, please. So um, the the VPAC, uh, I, I won't spend too much time here because we're all pretty familiar with what we're doing here. Um, but 
Uh, working, groups four, uh, working Group 4's focus uh, <laughs> is on accessible user interfaces on uh, video programming devices and also um, uh, programming guides and menus um, and making sure that uh, those apparatus are accessible via the user interfaces. Uh, report required within 18 months. Uh, again, uh, I, I included this in the in the deck mostly for uh, background information for those that might not be completely familiar with the charter here, but uh, I think the majority of us uh, are, so I'll, I'll skip past this as well. Um, so let's start talking about the strategy Working Group 4 um, has been following. So uh, we, we essentially uh, came at this with a three-step strategy. Number one, um, defining the set of essential functions that apparatus designed to um, access video programming um, must include um, at a kind of an abstract level, any device. So abstracted from device types, what are, what are the essential functions um, that are required for the video consumption experience, uh, so to speak? Um, next, defining the needs that are common to all users uh, in utilizing these functions and uh, the challenges that users with uh, either visual and or audible uh, disabilities face in accessing and using them. Um, and number three, define um, what we've been using the term of functional requirements um, that such apparatus should meet in order to address those challenges um, and ensure that those essential functions are accessible and usable um, by those users. I'd say here also that while we're using the word essential, the uh, document we're actually working from uses the word appropriate. So there is some discussion within the group as to which we're referring to and whether something qualifies or disqualifies as a result of that. And you'll hear some more about that as we get into the functions themselves. Uh, so from there, um, an additional piece of our strategy, I think an important one, is um, Working Group 4 is uh, intentionally keeping these functional requirements at a, at a relatively abstract level. And, I mean, really, that's, that serves a few purposes. Number one, um, we're, we're trying to define requirements for these essential functions to make sure they're accessible on any device, really, that's intended to be used for uh, video consumption. Um, and as everybody is probably very familiar, the evolution of those type of devices is in uh, warp speed um, with new types of devices and new types of user interfaces coming at us uh, relatively quickly, which is uh, an interesting challenge, I think, for this group. And, and it's been um, somewhat of a fine line and I think continues to be on keeping uh, the discussion at an abstract enough level to cover those types of devices, you know, the, the ones that are currently on the market, uh, the ones we can foresee and, and the ones that we can't um, because we want we want this report to be applicable uh, you know for the for some time um, so what we've done is you know we're, we're in, our intent is to define the baseline of functionality that's going to be required to ensure accessibility without constraining um, innovation product differentiation etc and allow the consumer marketplace to determine really what is the best mechanism to ensure that that particular function is accessible because there's going to be a variety of ways uh, to skin that cat, so to speak, I think, for each of them. Um, however, you know, having said that, uh, we are planning to include example uh, implementations um, wherever applicable uh, and where possible as illustrative examples uh, only. We're not looking to endorse particular devices or implementations because, as I said, um, that's going to limit, I think, the applicability of our report. Um, so, uh, but I, I think examples do help to, uh, hopefully, to clarify the intent of, of the functional requirement that's written. During this particular part of the discussion, I have to tell you that, uh, if I can use the phrase, my eyes were opened, to how many different definitions of the word button one can actually conjure up. Um, while I thought of button in a very general term, other people thought of button as a very specific thing. So we moved over to the word control and let controls fly where they may. Um, but it tells you how important literally each and every word in one of these recommendations can be and explains a bit why we're spending so much time 
as a committee. We're currently spending two and a half hours at least once a week, frequently twice a week, to uh, bring this together for the full committee. Um, so with that, that, that kind of gives you, uh, I think, a good overview of the strategy we've been using to, um, to attack the report. Next, let's talk about um, really the, the meat of, of what we're going to provide. Um, number one, it's going to be these, these essential functions. So the CVA stipulates that, that the VPAC provide recommendations to, uh, and I quote, you know, enable the functions of apparatus designed to receive or display video programming transmitted simultaneously with sound to be accessible to and usable by individuals uh, with disabilities. Um, but what the CVA does not define for this uh, working group is what's that set of intended functions that you know, must be made accessible. Um, increasingly, these types of devices have an increasing number of functions, um, some of which are essential to video consumption and some of which are not. And our focus, in order to really kind of bound what we need to do and, and uh, the recommendations the FCC needs from, from the VPAC, um, the first task uh, was to define those set of functions that are essential to that video experience. So here uh, we have a list of the uh, what we consider the essential functions that we've been working to. Um, and for those who don't uh, have, uh, have this in front of them, I'll, I'll read them off uh, quickly. Um, we have a list of 13, although uh, I will um, – Caveat that with uh, the, the last in the list here uh, is still under discussion. Uh, we haven't reached consensus on, on whether or not this particular item makes sense uh, within the scope of our report. Um, but, but having said that, I'll go through the list here. Number one, um, power on off. Two, channel selection. Three, volume adjust or mute. Four, input selection. Five, display channel slash program information. Uh, six, configuration, and, and we have several items under the under the moniker configuration, and each one's broken out just a little differently. So number six is configuration setup. Number seven, configuration for closed captioning control. Number eight, configuration of closed captioning options. Number nine, configuration of video description control. Number 10, display accessibility configuration information. Number 11, watch video. 12 playback functions, and then 13, the one that I, I referred to earlier is still uh, in discussion, uh, connectivity of peripheral equipment. Um, I haven't uh, gone into deep uh, detail on, on what each of these uh, items are, but, but that is the intent of the report, and I'll, I'll show an example in just a moment of uh, one of those. Now, in our report, we, in the current draft, our committee decided that rather than submitting text that was under discussion, we'd only be submitting thinking that maybe we had already hit the deadline. Uh, thank you for the extension of that, by the way, uh, co-chairs. Uh, it's going to make our lives actually busier, but we're going to be happier with the end product with that uh, grace period. Only the first five are in our current draft report. But we do have text associated with all 13 of them, and additional text as well. I don't want you to think that what you saw is all we've done so far. It's all we've agreed on so far. Uh, so moving from the essential functions, um, the next item in our, in our list of three there was user needs. Um, so we spent a lot of time discussing the common needs um, that all users share with respect to, you know, the interaction with devices that render or playback video. Essentially, you know, how does a user interact with uh, or utilize these essential functions on, on such a device uh, to access video? Um, what we came to is, you know, typically interactions with these devices, uh, meaning how they, how they interact with the user interface and video programming guides, uh, essentially comes down to two high-level uh, items um, for each of those functions. Number one, user input. The user has to have a mechanism to be able to locate, identify, and interact with the control mechanisms for each of those functions in order to express their intent. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I think, one of, the, one of the pillars, let's say, of the user interface to be able to uh, 
identify and use the various functions. So that, that, that covers user input. Um, user feedback then, um, for a user with a disability, um, feedback that does not depend on the impaired ability is essential for effective interaction with, with uh, a device. So appropriate user feedback mechanisms um, should be provided to users with visual and or auditory uh, disabilities. So um, any interaction a user has with a user interface is going to be based on those two things. You provide some type of input, you have to get some type of feedback uh, acknowledging your input and taking the action that, that you desired. So next we, you know, having set those two um, pieces in place and, and uh, one of the, one of the uh, challenges that we faced after defining user needs and the essential functions was really drilling down to, okay, well, what are the challenges that um, users with these types of disabilities face in, in uh, using those essential functions? Um, so we've, we've had a lot of discussion around that and then from that, after defining those challenges, the next set uh, the next action for us was defining uh, what we're calling functional requirements to address those challenges. So following here uh, on screen is uh, an example of one of the functional requirements that is now in the draft report submitted, and this is uh, one of the ones we had consensus on. So um, the essential function here is channel selection um, and a short description of what it is we're referring to as channel selection. Um, some devices provide a channel selection function Operation of the function may vary from device to device. In order to address the needs of all users, the function should be made readily accessible. For a blind or vision impaired person, identifying the location of the channel selection function and reliably knowing the desired result is realized is a challenge and requires special support including, for example, tactile and or acoustic feedback. For a non-hearing person, the challenge is reduced, but tactile or visual feedback may be useful in confirming the desired result has been achieved. So that, that that's the description of that function and, and a, a high-level view of the challenges faced. And then we got into um, the functional requirements that, that we think must be in place to ensure those challenges are addressed. So user input functional requirement, a readily identifiable control mechanism must be made available to support this function that can be located and performed both visually and non-visually. Um, user feedback, functional requirement, a readily accessible feedback mechanism must be made available to support this function that can be received both visually and non-visually. And again, keeping things at an abstract level because, uh, you know, as we, as I mentioned earlier, the, the input mechanisms on the variety of devices out there are, are changing very quickly. You know, touchscreen devices haven't been around that long, but they're already very much pervasive, and who knows what comes next. Um, So remaining activities um, and on a high-level schedule of the work. So remaining activities for us, we need to finalize the content associated with the remaining <coughs> essential functions. That includes the description of the user needs, the challenges for disabled users, and the functional requirements to address those challenges. Um, and as Brian uh, mentioned before, my co-chair, um, we already have draft text uh, that the team is reviewing, discussing. We actually have a, a comment tracker that we're using to uh, vet through everybody's various comments uh, related to the text that we have at hand. Um, so uh, at this point, we're working through revisions and, and editing to get to the final product. Um, number two, we need to finalize illustrative examples of currently available or foreseen mechanisms that could be used to meet those functional requirements. And again, uh, illustrative only, uh, intended to clarify the intent of the, uh, the requirements that we've provided. Uh, and then three complete revisions to the overall text, you know, structural, grammatical edits, um, make sure the report has, has kind of that uh, finished product feel that, that I think we all want at the end of the day. Um, schedule of activities to complete that, that work. Um, so per the request of the VPAC co-chairs, our target for that final report is February 24th. Um, we've been working under, uh, for, for uh, several weeks now, um, on a weekly basis, two two and a half hour sessions where we go through that like, that list of comments and discuss uh, the text that we have in the draft. Um, 
which essentially means at this point if we hold to that schedule, we have about 10 hours remaining to complete those revisions before the final submittal to the VPAC co-chairs. Now, the last two meetings, unfortunately, Jeff was on the road and wasn't able to be uh, present for our discussion, so he's not aware that the committee agreed to, if necessary, meet twice a week for these next two weeks Mm -hmm. to get the job done. They agreed to it, Jeff. Now we've got to get you to agree. (laughs) Count me in. Absolutely. So from there, um, I I included one last slide. This, uh, for those who are here at our last face-to-face, this might look familiar, but I know there's been a lot of discussion on this point. Actually, we we touched on it during Working Group 2's uh, report as well. Um, So I thought I'd go over it uh, again just to um, tie into that discussion. So uh, assumptions and dependencies for our work. gets into the overlap and interaction with the other working groups, really. So working groups one, two, and three are focused on identifying performance objectives, protocols, technical procedures, et cetera, um, to uh, essentially get the information to the end device, whether that's emergency access, uh, video description. uh, Working group one was, uh, you know, focused on closed captioning, et cetera. So working group four is dependent on the recommendations of those other working groups to assure and ensure availability of the associated data to the end device. Where our scope comes in uh, and where the other working groups, as Working Group 2 had mentioned before, are dependent on Working Group 4, is to ensure the data that they have made available to end user devices is then made accessible to the end user. So uh, in in our view, I guess the way that we've been working is under the assumption that Whatever data is required, for example, um, from the Working Group 2 discussion, uh, an indication uh, of video description being available for a particular program, uh, if that data were available, it would be at, um, it would be Working Group 4's responsibility to cover, okay, the data came into the box, how am I presenting that to the user? Um, So uh, I hope that helps. Uh, outline sort of the structure that we've been working under and the assumptions and dependencies between the various working groups from from our perspective. And I I assume we'll probably touch on that some more this afternoon. Um, But with that, uh, that that essentially gives the the broad overview of our activities to date, what we have left to do, um, and and kind of a high-level view of what we have uh, in hand today. Um, So with that, I'll open it up to discussion, questions, I want to tell the group a little bit about some of the struggles we've been having so that working group three, two and three don't think that they're alone in this. Uh, clearly, we have the same struggle you do in that industry is very concerned not to stifle innovation and to allow for some diverse ways that we can all experiment with achieving these goals while the consumer representatives are very concerned about having enough specificity that they can look forward to a truly accessible experience. Where this has become the most stressful in the committee is in the issue of examples. Concern by industry that examples can be interpreted as requirements. Concerns that examples might be viewed as almost a safe harbor uh, for particular types of ideas. The other thing is the structure of the, org- of the document itself has taken up quite a bit of time in the committee. Do you include examples uh, side by side with each function or do you break them out and put them in an example section somewhere else? When do you footnote something? When do you not footnote something? It's, it's amazing how much time has been spent in doing those kinds of discussions. We'd be really interested in hearing what the other committees do when they come across those kinds of discussions. And again, one of the things I think is different, certainly in our report as compared to uh, Working Group 2, is that we did not submit to the full group here everything we've done so far. We only have submitted those things that we've agreed to so far. Yeah, Um, Paul says (laughs) they like to be naked in Group 2. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, Brian, I think I think we have a, a comment over here. So, John? John Kern. Go ahead, John. Uh, okay, thanks. Brian, yeah, I just wanted to, to make one slight clarification because it, it may or may not be important. I, I think it might be important. Uh, you mentioned industry is concerned about safe harbor. 
I think we are concerned that there be purposeful safe harbor as opposed to accidental safe harbor. Vice versa, that there not be accidental requirements coming from an example. If we really do mean to say, follow X, Y, or Z and you're safe, let's make sure we explicitly say that. But to have someone who picks up the report and, and reads the words we've written and, and accidentally or, or mistakenly interprets something, that's, that's the concern, that, that we are very clear when we really have a clear meaning and that when we don't have a clear meaning, that's also obvious to the user. So you're, you're absolutely right. We're, we're in the midst of that process of, of clarifying things. I, I do think that there is, there is uh, an intent from all participants to have a, the best report we can create. So. Examples are very, very helpful to us in terms of knowing what the committee was thinking in order to prevent us from taking those examples as um, either mandates or safe harbors. Feel free to simply write into the report that these are intended to be illustrative only. They are not intended to be safe har harbors or mandates, and then we won't view them as such. But. You know, I, I would hate to think that, that the, the remaining time that you have will be spent quibbling over whether or not something is included or not just because you're concerned about how we will interpret it. Just, you know, if you have those ex concerns, please do state them. Um, it doesn't matter to us whether it, the examples are provided side by side or in footnotes or in a separate place. If you provide them, though, they will provide us with guidance. Um, this is uh, Jeff Nudak, co-chair. Uh, so I, I can say, and I um, feel free anybody to disagree with me, but I, I feel confident in making a blanket statement that any example included on, in our report is not intended as uh, a, a requirement. Um, and, and just put all that, examples are illustrative yeah, put only. Put that down. Write it. Yeah. Oh, and, right and we have. We and actually right. have some text in the report to that effect in, in I, I think, a couple locations. So, um, But I, I feel pretty comfortable making that a, a blanket statement for our report that all examples are illustrative only. Now, you know, obviously keep in mind that we will have to determine what we think needs to be a requirement at some point, but mm -hmm. you are by all means um, authorized or, or, you know, permitted to note whatever you liked down in the report. Any additional comments, questions? Just one other thing. I mean, I know that you, in this document that you handed out, um, again, you have not determined the timelines yet, proposed timelines, um, unless I was doing something else and you did talk about them, which that could be, possibly be. Um, but just in terms of uh, the finalizing of your report, to the extent that you can be specific in what you think would be reasonable deadlines for yeah, absolutely. We, we we plan to meet the um, the deadline stipulated at the beginning here. Oh, I'm not uh, talking about the deadline for providing the r report. I'm talking okay. about for implementation of these various features, f achieving mm -hmm. the functionality that the report is discussing. I think um, I'm trying to recall. I don't have the language in front of me, but I think it's um, it's stipulated in the CVAA, is it not? The, the, I'm talking about you have listed a variety of functional requirements. Correct. And those could be implemented at various points mm -hmm. in the future, um, even if the act goes into effect or even if this section of the act goes into effect at a certain time. there, The rules can be issued at a certain time and there can be a rollout of different features. Absolutely. No, it's a, it, it's a good point. I think at this point we've been very focused on the, the requirements themselves, and I, I, I think that discussion is still to be had. We but, often, but I agree that should be, that should be part, of, part of our report. We often hear from industry that different product cycles require different timelines. Mm -hmm. And so if you have any input on this, it would be helpful. I, I think we have a question in the back there. Oh, you have a mic. Great. helps to turn it on. Um, 
this is just a couple of couple of things that just jumped out from your report from my perspective, and this is Lisa Hamlin uh, from Hearing Loss Association. Um, one of the things I noted right away when you were looking at essential functions and you were not too sure about number 13, connectivity to peripheral equipment, this is an issue for people who are hard of hearing. Now, I, I think probably what you were thinking is connectivity to some kind of other playback machine, but for me and for people who are hard of hearing, they may need an assistive listening device associated with all kinds of different equipment. So it could be whether your television or your any kind of playback. I might want to hook in with my neck loop like I'm wearing now. I might hook directly into equipment. So for me, that's an accessibility issue. It's not just a you know a, you know let's think about this later kind of issue. So I would encourage you to include that. The other thing that jumped out at me was um, when you're looking at these high-level uh, descriptions, um, you, s you talk about people who are blind or have vision impaired, and then you say people who are non-hearing. Well, okay, that leaves me out. It also, I'm thinking about people who are deaf-blind or have, have low vision and are hard of hearing who may have also different needs functional needs that you um, that should be considered who may need access for example have more manipulation the ability to manipulate your captions so that they could see them better um, even they they have a need and can be it can be accessible if you allow for that but if you leave that totally out of here then they're not considered and then I'm not considered also because I don't get my heart of hearing input in there so I would encourage that to be even a little bit broader than it is here now uh, if, if I if I could, I, I think I can respond to that. So there, one of the sections that's uh, in the report, and we have some draft text, but is not included in the draft, is um, configuration of closed captioning options. Um, so I think we we do have an area to to address that kind of concern, um, and and I, and I think we are. But go ahead. Uh, that's Again, great. But I would also I would also um, you know. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to see your, 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 your uh, like, ch like the working group two to get some of the drafts so that I could get a sense of where you are and where you're going. So I would hope that the full VPAC could get it as I know you're working, and I know you're now working twice as hard as you were before. But as soon as we could get it, we'd really appreciate it so we could give you some feedback. I think we have Brian commented. Yeah, uh, two things. One is when we're talking about definitions of the of the classes being served by this, we're trying to edit as effectively as we can using our current editing uh, process to make sure that we refer to people who are blind or vision impaired and people who are deaf or hard of hearing so that it doesn't exclude those who um, can use secondary kinds of ways of, of interacting with devices. Secondly, for me, it is it has been a bit disconcerting to see how little was discussed about low vision access to things. It's not spelled out specifically, so we're anticipating we're going to need to um, place that in our recommendations and, and hope that the FCC adds on to that. Um, Paul Schrader with AFB, and, and th thanks. I was going to raise that comment, noting, of course, that uh, Congress did you no know favors or did us no favors in the way it drafted the language for uh, TV equipment access, speaking in terms of audible and audio output primarily, if not exclusively, um, in, in, in addressing access. I would hope that acknowledging that uh, fact, uh, I would hope that we in, in, uh, and this work group could go beyond that in, and address issues related to, to low vision. Uh, and I think uh, Lisa's point about deafblind is very well taken as well, um, be because re regardless of whether the, the, the statute got it completely right, uh, this is certainly a chance to address the real needs of, of the constituencies for Television. So, uh, and and for sure, uh, low vision is a huge number of people, and deafblind is a critical need area. Um, the other thing I would say, and I, I'm guessing that one of the other reasons for holding on to that section on peripherals has to do with the fact that the statute does allow for 
uh, alternate um, alternate approaches for access, uh, which which again uh, probably uh, did us no favors, uh, but it was something that I think industry wanted. So one hopes that um, um, one hopes that there is some language forthcoming on how how one will how, how one will uh, carry out that statutory requirement for accessibility and what will be used to measure when and how um, a suitable alternative has been achieved for access. I think we have a comment in the middle there. This mic is on. Oh, it's coming on. All right, it's on. Good. Uh, <clears throat> let me recover my train of thought. This is Naomi from Google. Um, I realize we're, we're down to sort of like the final weeks on this, and since we, we haven't felt comfortable sharing the report widely, I wonder whether it would make sense, at least I, I hate to volunteer you, but would it make sense for you to join the ongoing conversations? Sorry, I'm, I'm addressing Lisa Hamlin. She's waiting for, for the mic. Lisa Hamlin. Um, and, and actually, if I could add to that, it, it, I, um, it didn't come to mind until the, someone down the table here mentioned it. Uh, the current working draft is actually posted on the public uh, wiki. So it is accessible uh, at this point, but but please keep in mind it's a working draft. So what we submitted uh, was really an indication of kind of what's been finalized, I think. Um, there's still quite a bit of discussion, and I think a lot of text within the working draft that there's really no intent to remain in the report, but it's there to provide discussion points for the team. So, uh, you know, with that caveat, uh, it is available, um, and it's on that public wiki. This is, this is Lisa Hamlin again. Yeah, um, I didn't realize that, and I probably would have looked at it before if I had known that. Um, I would be willing to, as long as the, the telephone meetings are accessible with CART, because I do listen, but I can't hear every word, um, and I would be willing to join at least, a, if, you, if there was a particular meeting I would join, just let me know. You can shoot me an email or something of that sort. I'd be happy to do that. I actually brought up the peripheral items. Uh, I, that didn't come out of the blue. I have been hearing from consumers that when they buy a television now, um, there's no place to plug in their assistive device systems. And people spend enormous amounts of money getting a device that will send the, go to their sound system to the, directly to their ear. Um, through uh, hearing aids or through peripheral devices or whatever. So that's, I mean, that's why I brought it up. It, it didn't come out, you know, just it didn't spring full formed out of my brain here. It came from what I'm hearing from consumers. So I'd be happy to um, to, to help to the extent that I can and, and be part of this discussion as I can. Brian, if you, if you raise your hand, so they'll turn your mic on. I see. How's that? <laughs> I just wanted to assure you that all of our meetings that I've attended have had CART reporting as part of it because we have very active uh, members who uh, are deaf. So this is Karen. Um, I'm just looking at Section 204, and I have to look at this a little more closely, but, Paul, in response to your question as to whether this covers um, people with low vision, if you look at um, Section A, 204A, which amends or adds um, a new subsection AA, um, to the Act, to, to 47 U.S.C. 303, it says that if achievable, this section requires that digital apparatus designed to receive or playback video programming transmitted in digital format simultaneously with sound, um, including apparatus designed to receive or display video programming transmitted in digital format using Internet Protocol, 
be designed, developed, and fabricated so that c control of appropriate built-in apparatus functions are accessible to and usable by individuals who are blind or visually impaired. That's pretty broad, possibly. Um, again, I can't really commit to anything, but that that likely includes people with low vision. It seems that it does. It's just the next section, which is section two, that specifies that if on-screen text menus or other visual indicators built into the apparatus are used, those have to be audio output. So that that is more narrowly focused. Um, and again, it's triggered if there's on-screen text menus, menus or other visual indicators. So the sections maybe have to re be read a little carefully. I think we have to do a little bit more exploration, but there might be some wiggle room in that. Section, section 205 is different, however. That one really does focus on audible means. Uh, this is Jeff again, and I, I also feel pretty comfortable. And I, I, I think this, um, I don't want to, uh, let me say it this way. Uh, our intent is to cover all of those use cases across the spectrum. So I, I, I think this is a, an important issue, but, but also a semantic issue that we right. will deal with during the revision uh, period here. Um, absolutely, we, we want to ensure that the report covers the spectrum, um, and, and that's our intent. Uh, but, you know, the original language may not have been what we want, but I, I think actually we might have some comments in the uh, in the comment sheet that, that it worked to address this. Thank you. Yeah. John? Hello? Is John Card with, is John Card with Echo Star? Am I, am I on? Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, actually, what might be very helpful to Working Group 4 is for the section where we are collecting examples, for you to describe specifically an example of a solution or a group of solutions that you have that, that meet your needs. Uh, I, I think even at this fairly, you know, 10 hours left of, of, of report editing, bringing in that example and, and labeling it as here's, here's a solution will help those of us as, as engineers as we read this to understand those things that we need to take into consideration. Whether or not there are FCC rules targeted specifically to a particular manufacturer and device, I, I don't expect that. But certainly if I have that to take back to, to folks at Equistar and Dish to say, here, here, remember this. That, that will be you know, very helpful to, to my company. It may also be similarly helpful to others who, who read the report. So I, I, I encourage you to even just write that up and send in, even if you can't participate in a call. Brian here. I wanted to be sure that we caught any questions over the telephone from those who are checking in through that means. Since we don't see your hands raised, would anybody like to voice a question from the phone? Is there anybody still on the phone? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, we're here. Good. Uh, yes, still here. This is Jeff. So I, I know we're running low on time. Um, it looks, we do have a question. Uh, However, because the FCC is multi, is doing all kinds of things other than just <laughs> moving the mic around. Thank you, Lisa. Um, <clears throat> I'm perplexed, um, particularly when I hear that there's 10 hours left of editing to do because I've been hearing from some of the user organizations that there was quite a bit of content that was produced earlier, maybe over the summer, that never made it into the report. And, I'm, and I've also heard that there, you know, it might have been because there was conflicting views or something, but um, I, I think each of the, and I'm sorry, I should have identified myself, Judy Brewer, W3C, Web Accessibility Initiative. And so I think, my understanding is that each working group t took its own decision of what kind of material to bring to this meeting. And so, for instance, in working group three, we were debating, hmm, how baked, you know, how, how much, how strong a consensus is there on different sections. And, and we ended up uh, agreeing roughly that all of it was in draft form still, but we wanted to expose the work that had come in and identify it as draft. And my understanding is for working group four, you've taken the position of 
showing things on which there was strong consensus, but that there was other work that had been contributed, which the rest of us aren't seeing. I apologize if I'm not presenting that correctly, but that's why I'm asking this question. Could you clarify the status of other material that the working group might have developed, but that isn't shown yet in the draft, and that perhaps might still be coming along, depending on work that happens in the next two weeks or so? Because there, there are certain sections that I think some of the rest of us were looking for and, and aren't, aren't there. So. Sure, this is, this is Jeff again. Uh, and actually, that's, that's a uh, point we touched on just a bit ago. The, um, the, uh, the, the actual working draft of all texts that we have uh, in the report today and that we're continuing to work it is available. It's on the, the public wiki. So you, you can access it. Um, what we submitted to the report uh, or, or to the VPAC for today was the areas that, that we had reached general consensus on. But all, all that text is available. Can you, just to follow on a bit, please, yeah. can you just say a little bit more and, and what do, are you expecting to happen with those remaining pieces? Will the, was there not enough consensus and so it won't make it into the report or are you still hoping it will? And I apologize if I've missed the explanation already, but I'm just confused with, with what I'm seeing. Hmm? Brian here. I'll, I'll try to answer that. We used an instrument uh, spreadsheet actually for everybody well, let's back up. First, understand that our committee had some difficulties during its first six months, and at one point it was determined that there were so many uh, individual drafts out there that we needed to kind of come to a consensus that we needed to take a mashup of what existed, put it all out there, organ reorganize it a little bit to give it some structure, and then to put it out with a tool for individuals to make comments, on what should stay, what should be changed, what should be rearranged. Then we filtered that to those things that were substantive and went through those substantive items in kind of a top to bottom kind of an approach. And now we're moving on to all of the other texts that while they didn't fit in the part we have written yet, we have not disposed of them. Um, my experience at this point has been there's been more withdrawn than there has been things eliminated out of hand. Uh, we did recover submissions by the deaf community and the blind community both, and they have, they're uh, toward the bottom of the current mashup. I hate to call it a report from this point forward because it really is a sticking together heel to toe of some of the input that you're describing. But it is still on the table under discussion or we've yet to get to that particular point at this point. Any other questions, comments? I, I think we're just about uh, to the end of the hour. I see one at the end of the table there. Hi, um, Paul Schrader, AFB. So is there, and I apologize, I, I, I don't know the answer to this question, is there a distinction in the report thus far between the work, the expectations for equipment under, I'll statutorily geek out here for a second, 303 AA and 303 B. that is to say uh, apparatus and uh, under A and navigation devices under B, double B, double B, um, and is that so? Is there have we have has have we slash you uh, looked at that distinction? And is that is that something that will be looked that will be uh, dealt with? Uh, and then the the second thing is I, I note that there is you know there is of course a phase in period for some of the provisions uh, in the statute. Karen alluded to this earlier. Um, in, in terms of information back on what might be helpful, um, I can I can say up front that my guess is that that would cause some difficulties with consensus. But uh, take a shot at it. Um, it. It's worth you know looking at whether there are some somewhere areas where there could be agreement on uh, phase-ins or other kinds of uh, discussions with, with respect to um, various uh, functions. Uh, 
Who has a question? Yep. Okay, my. Uh, uh, this is Louis from a uh, AI baby. Um, two things. Um, as far as the inclusion of persons with visual impairments, when I looked and read through a lot of these documents, the term blind or visually impaired um, are two, basically brings up two different segments of the visually impaired population. And um, for point of clarification, Karen, is there, um, let me see if I can ask this right. What was meant when the term blind or vision, I mean, could, do you have any uh, ideas to what, when this document was drafted, how did they expect us to view that? Because um, in our discussions, um, some of, some of the um, arguments we've had is that uh, there's been comments made that there's not enough information or no um, mention of magnification or text, uh, visual com uh, accommodations for persons with various degrees of visual impairments. Yet, our largest visual impaired population is the people with functional uh, visual uh, acuity that uh, is greater than totally blind people, yet we're focusing on telling them, stop using your eyes, use your hearing. And for some people, especially the baby boomers who understand technology, they're going to fight that all the way. And say what Congress intended. Um, it's probably best to ask them. Um, <laughs> okay. But I, you know, I'm. I guess I'm heartened by the fact that Jeff has said that you're going to be covering all ranges of vision loss, and so um, well, this is something that we're going to have to discuss amongst ourselves. Um, and I'm sure that we'll get differing. We may get differing views from consumers and industry, but I don't think that we've really analyzed this issue yet here. So for now, I don't think that we can answer. Um, definitively what Congress had in mind and but are open to discussion about it and um, the opinions of the people around this table as well as others who might not be present that want to be part of the proceeding that we're, we will eventually initiate. Okay, if there's no other comments, questions, should we? Just, uh, I'm sorry, J Jeff, uh, sure. I, I'm not sure that I got an answer, if there is an answer, to the difference between the for the apparatus uh, item under 303AA and the uh, navigation device under 303BB. Is, is, is that something the work group's looking at? Is there a distinction? Has that distinction been drawn yet? And what would that be if there is? This is John Card this is John Card from Echostar. Thank you. Um, Paul, some of us on the on the group have been focused more on one or the, the other, say, use cases. We've actually been thinking of it as Section 204 versus Section 205. I, I think it's roughly parallel. Um, and this is actually where, when, when Jeff mentioned item number 13, uh, which is the, the interconnectivity or, or the, the uh, additional devices, that comes out more from looking at the the MVPD, the, the you know cable satellite or, or IPTV provider, uh, appears to have some more flexibility in, in how they meet their specific requirements versus in Section 204, the, the requirements are similar but not identical for broadcast television apparatus. So, yes, we are acutely aware of it. We spent uh, even uh, six months ago in, in separate groups looking at them as two separate uh, areas and, and, and have been working to kind of more come back together again. I, I hope that what survives in the final report is clear in the distinction between the two. I'm certain the FCC will be very clear as they write their rules on yeah. who, get, who gets to do what. We're or, always or very clear allowed. when we write our rules. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm just looking at this a little bit more and it's just, again, this is 
not the commission's definitive position on this, but I'm just thinking that there are these two paragraphs here. And when you have to then question why Congress would have included the first paragraph. Um, the second paragraph is very clear that audio output must be provided, whether it's integrated or peripheral, peripheral to the apparatus where on-screen text menus or other visual indicators are built in. But the first paragraph is clearly a directive to us to require where it's achievable that the um, digital apparatus provide this access to people who are blind and visually impaired that that make that that is just is more general it's in other I, I, words the second one says you must do audio the first one could be interpreted to mean make it accessible and generally I, I think we're talking across purposes I'm actually talking about another section I, I think I, which which talks about MVPD provided equipment Okay, and, and I'm, I'm I sorry, thought that, that Paul that was may, asking about this section. Yeah, but maybe I, I misunderstood wrong. Paul's question, in which case, never mind. I, I, okay. What I said goes, but doesn't address your okay. question, Paul. Paul, were you referring to this section? Um, uh, surely you didn't say something like Congress must have had something in mind. Um, <laughs> when, <laughs> no, I don't think uh, I said that. Lord, Lord knows uh, why this got amended the way it did. Um, but uh, certainly uh, none of us uh, on the advocacy side wanted it. Um, the no, I was asking in this case. I, I think it's clear that there is this distinction between uh, the where the audible output appears clearly and then where it's ambiguous. That is under uh, in section 204. Right. Um, what I was getting at was the distinction between apparatus under 204 and navigation guides under 205, and how those would be treated. Um, and there is, of co as John was indicating, uh, the, the, the language is not precisely uh, parallel. It is close, uh, although there is a couple of there are a couple of important distinctions, uh, regulatory time frames as well as or phase in time frames as well as the fact that it's by request and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it it would seem that section 205, as I think John was indicating, certainly does point to very strongly this issue of, uh, or at least likely is going to point to very strongly this issue of, of an add-on uh, peripheral device, uh, though it doesn't specifically say that that's the only solution that would be countenanced. And just to muddy the waters further, 303 AA or Section 204 also allows for an alternate, an alternate structure. So in fact, an external device could be, could be countenanced there. So um, I, I, I all of this is just, it's maddeningly confusing, um, and it's going to be maddeningly confusing for consumers, let alone the commission to try to write this, these regulations. Um, but I, 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 my, the only point of my question was to see how, how the work group had been exploring these differences and, and what we could, be do, could be done within the next couple of weeks to try to help um, clear up that as much as possible. Okay, thank you. And I just want to also mention that the deadlines that you refer to um, are not actually specific deadlines. They can be, um, but the way the the way the Congress couched it is that they said that we shall require shall require certain things not less than a certain number of years out. So, in other words, they didn't say to us, "You must do it that number of years out." Just to be clear. clear. Right. Um, so if, if I could, Paul, I, I think we have taken a, to John's point, we, we had a lot of discussion early on in our, um, in our working group, uh, differences between, you know, I'll just say devices covered under 205 versus 204. And um, when we brought all the inputs back together, uh, at least in my view, um, what I, where I landed with it uh, <clears throat> was the, the intent of the different paragraphs is, is relatively the same. Um, but it talks about two different environments and different device types, which is more specifically uh, implementations uh, that different implementations that, that need to meet the same uh, essential function. So we, we, sh we shifted focus, I would say, to defining regardless of device type, regardless of how the video gets to that device, um, et cetera, what, what is the real need at the user level 
working with that device. And, and so providing requirements at that level, I think will apply to both, um, but may apply differently. <coughs> and, and it's going to apply differently across devices in 205 for that matter. <clears throat> but, but at that point, you're getting into more uh, detailed implementations, which is really where we're striving to stay away from getting too deeply because because at some point you start um, putting bounds on on what those accessibility solutions can be and and we just there's no there's no foreseeing you know where user interfaces to use that term very broadly um, are going to move in the future um, so we're trying to keep ourselves at the level of defining you know what those functions are that must be accessible regardless of how the video gets there and regardless of the device type and defining it in that way, and, and hopefully that that that's those sort of recommendations help the FCC figure out how to navigate the different environments. Um, Excellent. I'm not sure if I totally answered the question. I, I think that's an excellent answer, Jeff, and it's probably the only way. It's the best way to handle it. I think that's terrific. Okay. Good. Any other questions, comments, or? Uh, should we move to lunch? <laughs> Dwayne? Yeah, is there anyone not in favor of moving to lunch? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I would just remind the working group co-chairs for our 2.15 session this afternoon that open issues, overlapping issues, anything else that needs to be done, you folks need to bring those as the, um, let me call it the agenda items uh, for that last session. And I'm speaking to all of the working groups. So um, are there any other announcements before we break for lunch? Yes. I guess, uh, um, Allison, yeah. If oh, I, if go I ahead, Jeff. I could just um, add on to Wayne's comment. Well, it might help if, uh, if anybody in working group four has comments uh, you know related to overlapping and things of that nature with the other working groups you could feel free to bring them to myself or Brian um, co-chairs can kind of serve to you know coalesce those comments and uh, you know we'll bring them to the table in the afternoon session uh, I'll offer to serve that role sorry go ahead Allison uh, Louis, first. oh uh, okay this is Louis Herrera one more time um, I have here um, one of the issues um, when Karen was uh, talking about the two paragraphs that discussed um, the audible issue, and I don't, I'm bad at paraphrasing, but anyway, um, and we were discussing low vision requirements as well. I have here, and I'll pass out some of these things, I brought some of these, um, these are basically cards that um, identify various degrees of visual impairment and the reason why um, I was reminded of this is because some of the people that I work with including some of the returning injured vets who have sustained visual injuries to their eyes they have um, when their vision gets tired they like the idea of being able to fall back on the audio so but I'm gonna pass out this car these things and I hope that it can give you guys an idea as to how Various degrees of visual impairment can be can make it difficult for some of these people to function. But having the being able to have the ability to use both audio and uh, visuals when their eyes are functional could make a big difference. So um, if I can get somebody to pass this out to those of you who are uh, interested in looking at this, I am there right here. Karen, okay, here you go. Oh. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and with that, it is now time for lunch, which, uh, once again, CBS has so graciously provided. Um, we have lunch for all of the VPAC members and alternates, uh, the interpreters, the FCC staff dedicated to uh, to the VPAC. Um, we don't have lunches for the uh, outside guests in the room who uh, are not members of the VPAC. Uh, it's, it's possible there may be some leftover, but uh, we did not plan for that. Um, but uh, but for those of you who are members, alternates, staff, etc., um, the lunch is in the corner over here. Back at an hour. Right? Yeah, and we're back at one o'clock. Yep. Um, I can move down. I can move down a little. And. Uh, 
<sighs> Welcome everybody to working group three. Is that where we are? Yes. Uh, good. I lost count. Um, we are uh, emergency information. Um, I guess I guess I get some advantage of going last. Uh, learned a couple of things. So interestingly, um, our working group took the opposite approach to as a Judy pointed out earlier, to we're in group four, which was we threw kind of everything in the kitchen sink in um, with a overall caveat that it's all in play. <laughs> um, I, I think for a lot of things we have we have consensus on, yeah, it is all in play um, because um, it, 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 the whole thing is a work in progress. Um, we don't have, I think, any major issues that we don't have consensus on. I think it's more whether or not the report gets to the heart of what our mission is. Um, my opinion is it still requires a little bit more focus. Um, I think there is work that is duplicative um, or text that is duplicative, subject matter that is duplicative of working group two. Specifically, some stuff about architecture with respect to cable um, and um, uh, well, the MVPTs in general. Um, and so I, I think we'll probably refine that as we go further. Um, we are really sort of looking at a focused issue, and we want to make sure that in each of these sections that we do two things. One is to answer the questions that the CVAA asks us to answer and um, make sure we're focused on the emergency accessibility – excuse me, lunch fighting back – emergency accessibility issues. Um, I think we've done a pretty good job. There are a couple of play things that we have not completed yet. Um, we have not addressed or discussed the deadlines and schedules for implementation. So hopefully maybe we can discuss that a little bit this afternoon in our our big plenary because I think um, that covers um, what I think whatever – I'll speak for working group three, but I think it's true. Uh, all, all of the working groups need to talk about realistic deadlines because you can't have something happen in the programming um, uh, production space or distribution space that doesn't impact the uh, the consumer product space. Um, and I think Paul mentioned that a little bit this morning. So um, maybe we can have some discussions about about what we think are reasonable times um, to uh, do some other um, do some other things. Um, uh, so that's the only major part I think we haven't done. And then. We are going to continue to talk about, I think, refine the document, focus the document. Um, I, I think in reading it, uh, after reading the other reports and, and reading ours, I think that we can, and uh, this is my opinion, someone else please, Melanie, please speak up. I think we can focus our findings a little bit more concisely um, into one space. Some, some of it sort of spread around in the document. Um, and then I think lastly the issue – is that um, we have one question that co that popped up in a rulemaking that said that we were looking at that we actually weren't looking at. We just assumed it was okay, and that's the issue of text-to-speech. And I think somebody um, – the commission in a separate proceeding concluded that text-to-speech wasn't a m mature technology. Uh, most of us on our committee <laughs> disagree vehemently. Um, so – and it also is very key, we think, to – making emergency information accessible in a timely manner. Uh, because finding a human being to read a crawl is not timely. Uh, but having uh, a crawl automatically transcoded into speech uh, is practically instantaneous, and we're not entirely sure. I am not entirely sure why the Commission concluded that it was not mature technology, but I know why they said they concluded it. I just don't agree. Uh, so anyway, so we will need to address that. I think that's the only thing that that is that came up in another report in order that I that I can think of. Uh, Melly, do you have any uh, comments? Hey Wayne, could you uh, hand the mic? Swing the mic, mic around. I think um, is it over here? It's right here. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I think um, that with regard to that latter point, I think one of I, um, one of the issues with regard to text-to-speech is that the, the technology is still very much evolving. Um, 
but for those of us um, who have used it over the years, it certainly is much more mature as a technology than it was even five years ago. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we we probably all ought to do to the extent that we want to go there is to think about um, perhaps quality issues um, similar to quality issues that come up with regard to implementation of other technologies because those the quality and the type of implementation will have a, a huge effect on the usability in a given circumstance. So um, I think that's, that is an issue that we need to discuss and um, if to the extent that other groups are looking at it for other purposes, we'll be um, looking at um, any feedback that others have surrounding that issue. Um, I think that um, there are some other issues that we we are all probably we have consensus around the notion that we think they're good ideas, but there's some there's a little bit of concern about whether they're good enough that we ought to recommend them, um, and some of those are have to do with where we where we provide the alerts. Um, and and how that information is is communicated. So um, there and and yes, I agree that one of the things I'd like to see is for us to not sprinkle findings and and um, and recommendations throughout the document, which we kind of have done now, but to kind of try to bring bring those into a into a more focused section. Yeah, th thank you, Melanie, and you, you reminded me of something. So, yeah, there are things that uh, we've had some discussions about, uh, particularly around um, ease of accessibility and how signaling could enable the ease of accessibility for emergency information. So I, I was very much informed by reading Working Group 2's report, which I think has a lot of information in it, but... Um, and maybe this is a discussion for later um, after we're done, but I think maybe there meets, needs to be a more focused piece. It is probably my opinion that it's um, maybe it's in Working Group 2's report about the issues around signaling because even, even within Working Group 2's report, you know, I read it and I thought it covered the issue, but I know what the issues are. So just listening to some discussion this morning, for someone who doesn't know what the issues are, it's it's spread in different sections of that document, and so it, maybe it's not really clear why how things interrelate. Um, so it didn't bother me, or I thought it did a good job. But like I said, I know how all those issues interrelate. And so when we talk about, you know, we also, you know, we I'll, I'll use one group two's words: the evolutionary approach, as opposed to the the, the basic now, not now, but more a, 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 a more educated sounding word like evolutionary approach seems reasonable. But we, I think we need to be on the same page. You know, we are very much, um, I think we are very much dependent upon how descriptions pass through and, and how consumers access information in general and, and emergency information is part of that. Um, we also think, and maybe because we're just a little biased because we're working on emergency information, but I think it's true. The emergency information is probably more vital than descriptions yeah. themselves. I, well, and that uh, came up in our discussions. I mean, the truth of the matter is when there's an emergency, you need to access that information quickly, perhaps, as opposed to, well, if I can watch my fair lady, I can watch my fair lady, but I'll only, you know, be thoroughly disappointed and you may have ruined my evening, but oh well. You know, I live to another day. <laughs> you know, I mean, th well, there is, there is though a, I think, um, a mindset, a perhaps even, um, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Um, I'm, I'm trying to um, relate the discussion that was had about. Um, trying to access information in the throes of a perhaps anx anxious, worrisome, 
um, situation as opposed to, um, you know, during a, a leisurely um, Saturday afternoon when you have a few minutes and want to watch TV. And when you are when you are in that former situation, um, ease of use becomes a more vital issue than it is in in the latter. So that's pretty much our presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to open it up to questions. You know, everyone has read all of our reports thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I guess the last issue, I'm sorry, let me just finish one thing because we just this morning, um, in terms of uh, timelines to, for finishing our work, um, we have actually uh, already scheduled meetings um, between now, I think we're scheduled through the first week of April, um, or second week of April, um, so we have times in the schedule. I prefer to be, uh, I, I was profoundly alarmed by Paul's assessment that they have 10 hours to finish their document. <laughs> uh, I, I prefer to think of it more that we have three or four more weeks and uh, <laughs> to work on it. Psychological. Yeah, it's like psychological <laughs> warfare. But yeah, we we have time set aside. We assumed that we would get comments back, um, not knowing exactly what the timeline was. But we 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 have a lot of time to meet with that. Um, I am personally not real happy about meeting more than once a week. Um, there are bandwidth issues with that. Um, so, uh, but I think um, we can work the reflector. Uh, we've also put a comment process in place, which we borrowed from Working Group 4. And I thank Andy for, um, Andy Scott, for doing the, uh, providing us with the template to do that, to keep track of things going forward. Um, so we're going to have a bit more formal process for um, dealing with comments that come along, keeping track of those comments and, and the resolution of those comments. Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would just try to compromise between the dates that you're talking about. You have 11 working days, okay, assuming you don't work on Saturday and All Sunday, right. or at just, least some just, people. Just a killjoy, aren't you? Yeah. I was That's <laughs> right. So, That's uh, better than 10 hours. I'll take 11 working days. Okay, right. so just understand that things that come in after the 24th of February, we're not going to be able to deal with, most right. likely. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, someone was down here. John, please. So, to, this is John Carter from Echo Star. Maybe to expose to the to the VPAC members a little bit, maybe one too many details. If so, I apologize. Um, Melanie mentioned the the concern on the the, the user standpoint in, in the middle of a emergency concerning event, not not wanting to uh, have to relearn your television interface is absolutely a, a primary concern. There is a parallel concern on the broadcast and on the on the system carriage side that in the middle of an event is exactly the wrong time to be changing your your broadcast system. So there there is a, an evolution of technologies that we are kind of all going to need to work with, monitor, and, and uh, maintain as we go forwards. And it's going to be from broadcast center through distribution path uh, to and consumer device and consumer education. So we, we don't think I don't think this is a solved problem. We, we I think have done a good job of pointing out where there are issues, and uh, I think we've got some solid recommendations for the now and the not now to use Kelly's terminology. But we don't claim to have designed the best possible solution yet. Uh, right, just one that well, is better. And and I I agree. And I think um, and maybe we can talk about this later <laughs> in the overlap. There is an issue of. I, I couch it under signaling. So the idea that 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 a person who, who who sends a program, originates that program, can signal certain things about that program, and how that signaling passes through <laughs> distribution systems, various distribution systems, and then what the consumer device does with that information once they get it. Um, we all talk around it a little bit, and we talk about specific pieces, but it is a holistic kind. And this is my opinion now a holistic issue about how you go forward with accessibility um, uh, or maybe we, maybe I'm just completely wrong which I <laughs> but there's a I think a holistic approach that covers all three of us all three of our working yes. groups um, that needs to be that they needs to have some discussion and it needs to include the points John that you just brought up is that there are challenges at every step along the way of implementing these things with 
without, for example, disenfranchising existence, existing, uh, is Mary Frances on the phone? Because I know, <laughs> but without disenfranchising existing consumers, because the new technology runs the risk, and this was brought up in the video description docket, implementing what's out there, <coughs> the new ways of doing things, would call, wouldn't work with existing consumer product. So we need to be, I think, at some level, that needs to be highlighted and talk about maybe not the, the technical details of how you get to using these new things. But from a broadcaster's point of view, John's actually right. In the middle of a commercial, or the middle of a, um, um, I'm sorry, an emergency, getting a person, if there is a person, and again, this is the wave of the future, the new economy, there aren't necessarily people in these plants to do these things. To adjust the signaling for a particular emergency and then adjust it back is a difficult thing. Um, at the same time, we don't exactly use the same signaling that MVPDs do. Maybe there's some evolution there. And again, of course, with consumer devices, the devices out there now don't recognize the new ways of signaling things. Um, uh, so what do we do and how do we bridge and things like that? And maybe that's too much going, but in any event, that, that's sort of something that's been on my mind since almost we started this is sort of how we, we get to where we're going. And I'll shut up. I think I heard someone on the phone. Oh, no, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, that ugly T word. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. There you go. Andy Scott with NCTA. Uh, I, I agree with John's comments. And uh, Kelly, I think uh, what, uh, what you've just said uh, has uh, a lot of merit as well. I think, you know, the system has to be looked at holistically, and it, it's a systemic issue. Uh, from broadcaster through MVPD to <coughs> set-tops uh, and to uh, consumer receivers. But the point I was going to make is that um, it strikes me that not every emergency necessitates being carried in the second channel. Um, ergo, you know, having to, uh, in, a, in a state of panic, try to figure out and navigate to that second channel. Many emergencies, I suspect, can be carried, you know, right in the main audio channel and, and announced there um, and could avoid uh, some of this. So I suspect there's a subset of these emergencies that, um, either don't rise to the uh, to level of a true emergency necessitating being carried in the main channel, or what have you, that are going to have to be uh, carried in a in a second channel. And I think, uh, you know, the, the the broadcasters will have to make the policy decision about which those are. But it strikes me that those are a, not every emergency is going to be carried that way. Um, some that are important, I suspect, to most maybe, are going to be simply carried in the main channel, and no one need, uh, needs to. Uh, uh, to navigate, uh, uh, you know, to a to a second channel, perhaps a third channel down the down the road. Doesn't mean we shouldn't have recommendations, shouldn't have findings on the best way to to go about this. But I'm just pointing out that in the here and now, I suspect that there's uh, ways to, uh, you know, to comfortably make this at least short transition to being able to carry emergency information in a way that's uh, convenient for everyone. Thank you. <coughs> Um, yeah, if, if I can speak to that, I think that was covered in, um, in our presentation at the last meeting, and we, in our, in our um, did, did that stay in the policy section of the report? I don't um, know. Not specifically. I didn't think yeah, so. Not specifically, yeah, but the document's because, on the wiki. Yeah, because what, what I think the group, and, and this may be something we need to revisit, um, but the group kind of felt that um, most of the emergencies that would rise to the level of being included on the main audio channel would be emergencies that would give rise to an EAS alert and that those are not in covered in our in our in the scope of our report and I'm not still not um, myself convinced that that's necessarily so, but I, in the interest of not wanting to prolong getting the draft done, let it go through. But I'm, um, I'm certainly, um, it wouldn't take much at all to convince me that we need to incorporate back into the document some of the initial text that still is on the wiki. Uh, from the um, the policy document that we approved earlier in the year, which outlines 
the various categories of emergencies and um, which states for the the primary category um, of those having significant threat or imminent threat to life, property, et cetera, um, being of a, of a nature that whether or not EAS applies should um, be aired on the you um, know in, in an audible format um, on the main audio channel. Um, so, so I think you know this is this is another area where we may need to either um, say they do or they don't, and if they do, put it back in, um, fall within the scope of the of the our our charge as a as a working group. Um, so I'll. I'll, I'll I'll provide the opposing point of view. <laughs> uh, and it's not really an opposing point of view, actually. Um, so sort of my thought process um, was, and we had some discussions, was our charge was really about, and we agree, about stuff that is that comes as a crawl. Right. Um, so we. And that how or why, on any particular instance, something is a crawl versus whether we programming is interrupted is outside the scope of our discussion. Well, and while we did look at that and talk about that and got a document which characterized, uh, categorized different types of emergencies, we really needed to focus on making the crawls accessible. Um, it is certainly my organization's opinion that the decision of whether to interrupt programming or not is a news editorial decision. Um, there, there aren't any hard and fast rules as you go from community to community of how or why someone chooses to interrupt or not interrupt. Um, and, and while we're okay, you know, we're certainly supportive of the categories the policy group came up with, um, and, and I'm not sure how I feel about putting that in a document, but I think it leads us off into a discussion that isn't relevant. You know, it, it's not that it's irrelevant, but I really sort of focus on once something becomes a crawl, then um, that needs to be made accessible and not sort of focus on why or how something gets to be a crawl. I don't, I'm looking at you, Melanie. I know you don't. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, so that, that no, sort of, yeah. that was sort of my take. And, and we, so went, we went around and around, around, and, around and around and around. During one of the most recent calls, and, and the end result is has led to the question that was just asked. So um, I don't, you know, We'll have to, I think, look at the interaction, I guess, between audio alerts presently and crawls and the use of crawls currently in order to figure out whether or not um, an, a change needs to be made there. All right. Now, this, this has a different effect on MVPDs because of how they uh, tend to handle EAS alerts. And I, and I think that the, the, the takeaway message here is that how an entity handles an EAS with respect to accessibility is already prescribed in the rules, so we don't really need to address that. Um, we need to address things that are really not, that are outside of, of, of how particularly an MVPD might process an EAS alert that they receive in their plans. Um, how, uh, so that leads to sort of the focus. There's a, there's a lot right now in our draft about how uh, the MVPDs process an EAS alert, which I don't feel needs to be there, or maybe it becomes an appendix. That, that's sort of that's sort of my feeling. Oh, go ahead, John. I'm sorry, John Card with Echo Star. I think I'm on. Yes. Uh, it, it, it just I just realized I think we did reach one conclusion that I don't think we have captured in our current draft, and that was. The current classification of what an emergency is is rather inflexible and, and went from the life and limb emergency down to school bus closings. And I don't think the current draft includes any kind of a recommendation that there either be, that there needs to be a more nuanced look at levels of emergency or, or at the uh, the carriage. I, I think that was something that well, isn't in our current. Is, am, am I wrong? Or? Uh, you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And for my part, I'll say yet. <laughs> okay. Did you say yet? Or no, 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 yet, yeah, no, yet. Uh, yeah, I had it, intended to bring this up because yeah, I think it I is see, a fundamental okay. yes. thing. And we talked about this at the last face-to-face. -face yeah, we did. We just hadn't gotten around to 
we have bigger fish to fry. I understand. That, but but I think that we I think Melly and I agree because we, yes. we talked about at some point that that yeah we need to talk a little bit about that. We feel that seventy nine whatever it is is probably a bit broad. And when you look at other services, and you look at CMAS, for example, uh, the SIMSAC, which was the advisory committee, if anybody doesn't know what CMAS is, Google it, uh, <laughs> really did, for example, restrict the definition of what emergency information was. Right. Because they're, they were sort of, you know, we're really not going to send school closings over cell phones. So, and, and it also comes up in some other things. So I think it's appropriate, maybe it's appropriate now. Again, my opinion, we haven't talked about it as a group. But I think it, if we agree to add some language and just simply saying that rule part's overly broad and we need to be focused as the other services on things that are imminent or maybe if you look at some of our categories, there's, there's like a there – we divide things into four categories. So, you know, maybe that needs to be changed. Anyway, but that, and again, that would just be a recommendation. Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a just member of the committee, not as a chairman, can you clarify uh, the the cases for access to this information that is somewhere in between a crawl during a regular scheduled program and an emergency uh, EAS alert? That is access to on-screen information during a news program or an interruption. So I think I'm one, sorry. Of, one of the early um, questions was. If there's an emergency, and I know you know this according to your scope, um, if there's an emergency and programs are interrupted and there's on-screen information at that point, um, not a crawl, that is a broadcaster is talking about and there's information on the screen, where does that fit into your categories? So you want to, well, I could, well, we had discussion about that and, and we haven't come to, we haven't written any text about this. But certainly I think there is a, a feeling that uh, people who are presenting the information have to be more descriptive. Yes. Now, this is not something you can regulate. All right. So in other words, a, a newscaster might say, you can see this moving over there. Or, that or doesn't help someone who can't see. Or in one of the following areas, and it just shows them on the screen. Right. So, I, I mean, I don't think that's something you can regulate. That, that's certainly my opinion, to say whether people should be more descriptive. Um, but, I, but we have talked about the idea of uh, how to address that in sort of a recommendation and saying, all right, people should just try to be more specific, <coughs> more nouns, less pronouns, if you know that. I'm not sure that we can't regulate it. Yeah, I, d I don't know that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that our goal, it depends on what it is, but um, if you look at what the goal here is, which is to provide visual information in an audio manner, format, um, if somebody is pointing to the screen and saying, stay away from this area, making that into an audio form may require defining what this is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I don't agree that you. Uh, well, if you, if not, I think whether or not you could regulate it will come up in a rulemaking. But right. Um, well, clearly, I, I mean, think I, it's difficult to say. I think that you should think about. You need to think about how you want to make the information. The goal here is to make the information that's provided in a visual format useful for yes. this population. Right. So, in making your recommendations, that's really what you want to focus on. Yes, and, and I think that's part of it. Um, I, I, for my part, it's not something that I think we need to be careful about suggesting that it should be regulated because in generally there are rules that already say this. So let's just fall down this rabbit hole just a little. So what, what – we're just going to end like the third level of hell for a second. Um, so what, 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 what you might be suggesting – I'm not saying you are, but you might be – is that – during an emergency, you're regulating a human behavior of someone who's talking, trying to get the information out, and that that station or licensee could be subject to, to, to enforcement action because they said, see here, rather than saying, see Montgomery County. Now, that, I'm, that's absurd, right? I'm giving you an absurd thing. Right. But so when, you, when I say, I don't know that it should be regulated, my, as a licensee, my mind says, I can get some enforcement action over it. 
And so everything that when I think about is it's tempered from that position. However, from an accessibility with respect to the overall scope of what we're trying to achieve right. here, it's a reasonable practice to say, please try when you have someone on screen talking, not to say that thing there, but to say the tornado in Montgomery County. And you know? actually, I and, think and I'm that's talking a reasonable about it. Thing I'm, to, to I think that I'm thinking of a third a third feature, accessibility feature, or a third component of this that doesn't involve what the individual says, but involves supplemental information that's provided in the same way that video description is provided. Yeah. In other words, the individual doesn't necessarily change what that person, that newscaster is saying, but supplemental information is provided in an audio format or an audio, audio um, stream that explains that what that individual is saying is that that, that that individual is pointing to Philadelphia. You know, this is an interesting issue because, and I'm going to I'm going to take the opposing view for a second because I think this oh, may too. well to Kelly um, <laughs> because I think you remember at the last meeting we had a discussion about use case scenarios. Yes. Yeah. And I'm thinking. This may be um, a good example of the sort of thing we may not be, need to call them use cases because I know that's a term of art. But certainly this is one of those situations where um, emergency information being provided in an accessible format, which is our goal, sometimes gets screwed up. Because we could say, well, there is an, um, an oral or audible announcement. But the fact of the matter is that oral announcement is incomplete because it doesn't say, um, you know, 12th Street and Constitution. It's, it just said over there. So the question becomes if our goal is to make sure that all uh, emergency information is provided in an, is in an accessible format to the extent possible. It's either possible to say 12th and Constitution instead of over there, or it's possible to do X, Y, Z in order to make that over there ex part of the information accessible. So. I suppose, um, you know, this is a scenario that although we've discussed, we haven't arrived at um, specific recommendations, but I think it's a scenario that um, that is and will continue to be problematic um, with to, to the user community that is supposed to be um, benefiting from the, the recommendations of um, and well, the implementation of the VPAC. Mr. Chairman. <coughs> so I think um, what Melanie was saying, since regulating human behavior, um, regulating or voluntarily trying to coerce it is obviously very, very difficult. Um, you want to automate this process as much as possible. So uh, this is where the scenario would make sense, but whether it's a crawl, or it's character generated information during a normal broadcast, you would use a similar technique in delivery, I would think, so I'm not sure why you would want to have to draw a line between the two. Asking the, your anchor man to read it out and be more descriptive sounds very difficult. Um, I'm thinking about it. I'm sitting with this funky look on my face as I'm thinking about this. <laughs> it looked like that. All right, so and I'm thinking exactly what your what your question was. So what what's the difference? Where's the line and all this? And what I'm about to say now is personal opinion from my experience working in designing broadcast facilities and so forth. So when I have text that I've created, no matter what I'm using for, it's easy for, for from a technology standpoint and an operational standpoint to take that text, make it into speech, and then put that speech out in some way or to deliver that text in some way. We've talked about down the road, maybe you just send the text and the, something else happens with it. All right. but, so, but when I really think about what I see or what, what a consumer sees from a weatherman, for example, what he's saying is ad hoc and, ad hoc and not scripted. 
So there isn't like there's someone furiously typing and that weatherman is reading what he's typing. He's looking at information, synthesizing in his head, and giving information that goes beyond, for example, what a civil authority gave you uh, in a thing. Now, there are some times where here are the evacuation centers. Boom, you see the slide. Okay, So that, I, you could take that text and render that text in some accessible way. But for a guy who's just sitting there going that he's talking, or she's talking and saying, the tornado just passed so-and-so. It's now moving here. It's in the so-and-so neighborhood. It's blah, blah, blah. That is not scripted. And I can't off the top of my head think of a technology. So when you say some other way, I don't know what other way to say. To fulfill our charge, we have to tell them they have to do it. Well, and that's where I sort of was, was it's a recommendation. I just, you know, I'm a trade association. We don't like regulation <laughs> as a general <laughs> premise. But... Um, but but that you know I was struggling with how how you know what else can you do other than say will you please try harder? Yeah, beyond beyond trying, it's 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 sort of beyond trying. Yeah, it's a regu- It's it's in the act. I mean, you have to figure out a way. Um, it may be having an intern or having somebody on staff or having a contractor type in the necessary information just as it's. Done for captioning. I mean, you, there has to be. Well, a the way. other thing. The goal is, is to convey the information. Now, the other thing is, and we're just sort of chewing on this, which actually somebody <laughs> suggested a long time ago, and I dismissed it as absurd, which is you take the captions and you render the captions audibly. Um, so you have someone speak, it's captioned, and then you take the captions and you turn them back yep. and the speech. Um, I, we have not talked about that because that, that seemed kind of s- silly to me at some level. But 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 then in that case, if the guy says over there, the captions are going to say right. over there, right. which doesn't actually right. help the problem. Um, so I, 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 I you know I struggle a little bit to sort of operationally, and 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 and, and frankly, I thought this was a little a little you know there there's this so, okay so there, you know there's a sort of fundamental mission that we have. To you know, we, we, we also have agreed we were working on, which is making those crawls accessible. And and we really sort of focused on that. I don't know. Maybe we can get us some thought and see what we can come up with. I, I'm certainly not opposed to, you know, dealing with it. Well, just, you know, with your own knowledge of technology, you know that anything that's on screen starts as data. And even if it's not exactly pointing at the map that says Philadelphia, you know somewhere it started out with that visual information as data. Yes, and I just don't know and enough an alternate way about of it. it. Right, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I just, you know, I, I, I was thinking about what Joel said earlier about, you know, rather have no information than bad information. So um, I, I don't know that the world agrees with that, but <laughs> but but I, I think there there is a real opportunity to screw this up. Uh, and we don't. But, you, but it's, it's there's an opportunity to do that without it too. And so the question. Yes. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which has the greater potential for having a harmful impact on somebody? I don't know. Well. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, I no. do. Okay. Mary Frances so, in Iowa. Oh, why don't we go to Mary Frances first, and then I, this is Karen. I have another comment after that. Mary Francis, go ahead. Go ahead, Mary Francis. Hi, guys. Um, sorry I can't be there with you. You all look great on the Internet. Um, we read things aloud to people with visual impairments on our little radio network every day, and the feedback we get from our listeners is that, you know, I, I, I understand the, the thought that no information is better than bad information, but I will say that it is the opposite that we found here at least just to alert people that there is information that needs to be uh, heard, that there is something cooking. Um, Because here we have great readers, we have bad readers. And I know that we get plenty of complaints about the bad readers, but I think the fact that we're at least working to think about these things and maybe make recommendations uh, in the future to our broadcasters is is, uh, a step in the right direction. So... I just had to go against the no information is better than bad information thing. I, that, that was Joel. Don't put that on me. No. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, but, there's you a know. difference, though, in description than I think there is in, in factual information. And this was actually one of the instances where one of the things that we 
said in the meeting was that perhaps the solution would be to recommend that they provide a phone number that, that broadcasters provide a phone number that people can call for further information and that um, they you know kept that kind of didn't go anywhere but um, but it was at least an, an effort at getting at the issue because it, it is you know, I think of the, the one instance that we all pointed to when we started this discussion of the boil water alert in Boston or in, in Massachusetts where the person had no idea and, um, you know, was in the, in the, wa the polluted water area. And um, it, it proved to be a, um, fortunately, not a serious problem, but it was a health problem for not only the individual but her service animal. So I think um, that, and if she had had children, it really could have been a major problem. And so I think it's, it's, it is something that we ought to address. So this is Karen. Um, I just want to caution you a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you felt that the definition of emergency information <laughs> is overbroad in our current rules 79.2 be aware that there is a portion of these rules that already require in certain circumstances that the video emergency information provided in the video portion of a program must be provided made accessible to people with visual disabilities and that is when emergency is provided in the video portion of let me just get this right um, that is the video pro portion of programming that is not a regularly scheduled newscast or in a newscast that interrupts regularly regular programming. So if it's part of the regular newscast, it's not covered yet by our rules, but if it's interrupting, it is covered and it's using this definition. And I'm just not sure, I mean, we're not gonna want two different definitions of emergency information. So just be aware that it's, you know, we have already been implementing this definition for all purposes for people. Can I stop you? Because that's not the section of the rules I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Good. But since, since you brought it up, uh, mindful of my time clock, um, that actually is a section of the rule I was talking about. The, the rules already require generally the interrupted stuff to be accessible. That's, that's what I was talking about, that rule. I'm no, sorry, this rule is the one that defines the word emergency information. I don't remember what rule section it is. Somebody that's what this, that's what, that's this. This is 79.22. And it lists, it says such as. Yes, information, emergency information, information about a current emergency that's intended to further the protection of life, health, safety, and property, i.e. critical details regarding the emergency, et cetera, and then it has examples of. Right, it's the tornadoes, examples. Tornadoes, hurricanes, my floods, tidal waves, earthquakes, icing conditions, goes on and on, and it right. does it's say school closings and changes yes. in school. Yes, so in my mind, school closings don't, we had a long discussion about the fact that if you look at that list, you prioritize that list, there, there are the things at the bottom of that list, mm -hmm. and I think one of the issues is that, that while the word example is there, typically things written in regulations don't get excluded because the word example is there. So uh, w one thought is that, 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 that just that list, we're talking solely that list, is probably overbroad and that other services have really, in the implementation of those services, excluded the stuff at the bottom of those examples. So what I'm suggesting is that we have been implementing this definition for all purposes for with respect to making audio information visually accessible for people who are deaf and hard of hearing mm -hmm. and have been implementing this for the purpose of interrupted programming, emergency interrupting programming for people who are blind and visually impaired. And we are unlikely to adopt two separate definitions so that if you're asking us to narrow the definition for the purposes of your section, you have to think about the ramifications as a working group for the entire universe of our regulations dealing with emergency access on television. And we did. Okay. And the conclusion was that there are people, for example, who do not have children who are blind and visually impaired and who would not like to have, for example, that, that extra audio service eaten up by repeating school closings. Okay. So just, wait a minute. No, no, I agree. So yeah. what I just want to say is, yeah. and that may be fine, then distinguish your particular 
right. needs. But uh, I would also do, say... You do think it should be applied in a different fashion because there are these competing considerations with respect to the audio stream, mm -hmm. then just make clear why you think your proposals or your the rules that we develop as a result of your recommendations should be different than they are with respect to the definition of emergency or the examples used on emergency information than they are for other purposes. Okay. Okay. I would we'll like go. to get in line for a question. Uh, we can't hear you too well. Speak up, please. Um, well, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Who is this? Uh, this is Marlena. Hi, Marlene. Um, th thanks, Kelly. Um, I, I, again, want to raise a point of clarification for, for myself here, um, and perhaps, Karen, you can, you can help me out. Um, do I understand that the FCC is suggesting that in all instances, synthesized speech is not a mature enough process, or would the FCC look favorably to having synthesized speech to make a crawl accessible versus, at this point, video description of a television show? Um, can I answer that? Or are you well, I, she, since she asked about the FCC, Marlena, we have not looked at this issue yet. This Actually, you have. <laughs> well, uh, not with respect to, not with respect to this guys. particular proceeding. No. In, in another proceeding, um, based on the comment from one person, the FCC in an EAS proceeding precluded the use of text-to-speech for emergency messages sent essentially by EAS participants. All of us were simply appalled by this. First off, it's a common practice that's used. Um, it's used by states. It's used by the National Weather Service. Now understand that, that the FCC has no authority in that particular rule in those particular cases. But they did say for the use of emergency notifications, text-to-speech, as of the effective date of those rules, is prohibited. Um, and in a footnote then said, but we note the VPAC is looking at this. So again, most of industry was appalled at this as a decision uh, because again, it's something that's very common uh, and it was based solely on the comment of one person. So we as the VPAC will, uh, working group two, three, whatever damn burning group we are, <laughs> three, will, um, I think, address that and feel that we think it's, it's, it's necessary. Uh, yes, somebody oh. behind you. Um, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, well, straight Schrader with the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, so I have this bad habit of asking two questions, but since I have the mic, I'll ask two questions. Um, one is, the issue of signal um, tagging of description channels seems like one that, that is in this report, uh, but that does definitely crosses work group two and three. Um, and so I wonder how, whether there are things in this report that are particularly pertinent that we'll bring up in the um, plenary session on signal tagging, flagging, whichever term you want to use for the description channel. The the other thing I wanted to ask about is the finding that says at some time in the future stations may deliver a video description audio service to deliver certain emergency related information in audible form. Then it goes on to say the technical challenges that must be addressed by the broadcast uh, are are not insignificant. Can you? Exp I'm not clear what that means, uh, given that that channel is quite clearly marked and delineated and able to be provided. So, is that having to do with the nature of the language that's provided in the case of emergency, or is that a technical? Because it does say technical here as the issue. Let me answer your first question first, and the answer to that is yes. We should probably talk about that in the other plenary session. <laughs> but the second question is: there are a number of issues surrounded with it. Um, that really have more to do, I think, more of time of implementation. Um, and then there are issues with respect to signaling. So there are two parts of it. One is from a broadcaster perspective, um, I, I can create some audio and I can send it over a second channel. That, that, that's not a difficult thing to do. It's just simply an implementation um, thing to do. Um, with respect to how I signal that, um, there's essentially 
Um, uh, the two ways to think of it, I, I guess. What is it currently in the, the in the current version of the ATSC standard? Um, there's a way of doing that, uh, and there is a a older way, which is the common practice now. A and um, so that we could change to the new way tomorrow. It's software changes, um, but. Um, and, you know, it has impacts on MVT, MVPDs, perhaps, um, and, and there really are sort of two quantities. It's actually explained, I think, pretty well in Working Group 2's report. It's just that all of the considerations are not all in one place. Um, and, of course, this has impacts on what receivers do. So if broadcasters, let's just take the, the, the over-the-air situation, if we were to change how we signal today um, to the existing way in the, the ATSC standard, it is likely that we would stop doing it the way that it's currently done now. And so there was some concern that if we stop doing what we're doing now abruptly, there are people who can find, for those apparently only about two or three people who can find video descriptions, they won't be able to find it because we will have changed how we do it and the new sets won't react to the new signaling. Uh, I mean, the existing sets won't react to the new signaling uh, because it doesn't know how to interpret it or it doesn't know how to display the availability of that service to the consumer. Um, so at some time in the future, sets will be in the market that can respond to that, and that enables better accessibility. I'll just but but I, to, to clarify, it, it doesn't sound like the technical challenges are the significant problem. It, it is quite doable to deliver information on a second audio channel in any of the current transmission standards yes. where where there are the challenges is uh, is at the uh, is the signaling of it which we most assuredly you know will be talking about later in a, just a short time now and then the second <laughs> challenge is on the consumer electronics equipment side receiver yes. side which most assuredly needs to be addressed as part of the work group force challenge of course and it is the emergency situation that really brings to the fore the need for this committee, it seems to me, to be quite um, strident in saying that this absolutely is an essential element today, immediately, uh, that that we that we move to to uh, a system, re regardless of CEA consumer electronics equipment involved, that allow for rapid and immediate deployment of that second audio channel, uh, be because in emergency situations, as your report eloquently states, there isn't time for confusion. Um, I will say okay. Acknowledge what you said. The, the larger <laughs> discussion. I can't speak for CEA, um, but again, we're reminded that with moving forward comes disenfranchising consumers that use current systems. That has come up again. It's important. It's equally important. Um, I don't think we're bound by that, um, but we have to be careful. I think when we say um, we're going to force a particular segment of the the community to buy something new. Um, so uh, there is this, that ugly T word that, that my colleague Alan knows called transition. So we talk about these things. Um, and, and with that, since I have exceeded my time, uh, co-chairs, um, I yield the remaining amount of uh, whatever time I have for, <laughs> for, 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 for a larger discussion, I think, for things. Unless someone has something that's just specific to our report. But I, well, let me just finish one thing. I, I said at the outset, <laughs> okay, I lied. Um, <laughs> I don't yield my remaining minute. Um, I think we all agree that the report needs some focus, and that's certainly one of the issues on those findings and making sure that we're clear on, on what, what we're saying in each one of those findings, and, and, um, and that's it. <laughs> I, I'm done, really, for real. <laughs> We can continue uh, for a few more minutes, and anyone who feels their break was cut short, you just blame Kelly for that. <laughs> um, Kelly, earlier in the um, discussion, you made a comment about that we have a lot bigger or more bigger fish to fry or something. The connotation there was that there's some issues that you haven't covered or haven't voiced here <coughs> during this period. Am I reading that incorrectly, or are there some other things that you wanted to put on the table here in a succinct, brief manner? 
No, I, I was just in the specific thing we were talking about that we, we were at least sort of, we have been focused on the core part of making the calls talk, if I may use that, and how we do that. And um, while some of these other things are, are very important, um, I think we all feel like we don't get to them, the world isn't necessarily going to end. But the core part of our mission uh, for CVA, I think, is fairly critical, and so we've been working on that and trying to focus that. Okay. Um, in a minute or so, um, can, can you indicate... Uh, okay. Can you indicate in the next 11 working days what <laughs> t task sorts of things, if any, and how you're going to need to be attacked and how you're going to go about doing that and how you indeed are going to meet the 24th of February deadline. Do you want me to answer that now? Well, either uh, that or... Do you want me to wait? Because on no, the 24th, no. I can tell you. No, 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 no. I just kind of want to make sure um, what the plan is, is going forward there, and maybe a, Melanie wants to weigh in, but... <laughs> Well, let, let me weigh in first, and I'll give you my answer. Yeah. I don't mean to be flipped by this. There is a section at the end of our document and everyone else's document about issues for which there are not consensus or issues for which we are not making recommendations. So that's that we discuss, but we have no specific recommendations. So that's probably going to be our primary focus is seeing if we can get consensus or figure out how to um, make that section shorter. Uh, okay. Do you have meetings scheduled? Yes, we do. In the, okay, in the at least one in the next we two weeks. I have problem. We have good. Yes. Okay. Was there another question? Uh, behind you, Brian. Behind you. Testing. There we go. It's amazing. The switch doesn't do it. The gesture does. It's a gesture-based <laughs> system. Um, yeah. <laughs> My, my question is this, uh, again, going back to the issue of low vision, no vision, usable vision, but please make it bigger and bolder, et cetera, et cetera. Anything from your group on that subject? No, um, because we have been focused on making an audible representation of text that's already on the screen. Do, do you see any reason why you couldn't make a recommendation? Uh, Oh, in settings? Yeah, there isn't. Yeah, th hmm. that's right. Um, but I think the the issue probably was that audible access would reach a larger number of people with one um, fell swoop, if you will, because my brain is getting fried, um, as opposed to trying to implement large print, et cetera. However, in the course of the discussion about the next generation technologies that we talked about as having greater capacity, one of the things that we have discussed is the ability for the end user or consumer to be able to um, create, customize the way that information is presented to them by their their set, their receiver, their set, whatever, um, television, set-top box, etc. So the issue there would be, you know, that's the place where you could um, resize the text, change the font, um, as well as decide which descriptions you wanted to hear and which you didn't, and those kinds of things. So, so just, yeah. just to finish up then. Mary Francis. Again, the, the straightforward question, is there anything that would restrict your, from your committee from going forward recommending that crawls be available in larger type for low vision users? Uh, um, let, let me jump in in front of you. Turns out we did address it. <laughs> um, I guess I just forgot. Um, and the, yeah, we did. There's actually a paragraph in there on it. Um, and the conclusion in the paragraph is that there isn't the technology in the receiver end to do it. Um, 
so I just say we did we did please attempt to address it. Okay, and, and we uh, had also been adding in some references to HTML5, which should provide some support for that capability as well as persistence in those settings once they're set. I believe it's something yes, we can look into true. and add to our report right. because it may be that the, the answer depends on which technology you're talking about, and, and right. I think you have a wider range of choices with HTML5. Mary Francis also. She's in the queue. We use a queue system in our thing. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. I will uh, not say anything because you and Judy already did it so eloquently. Yes. So yeah, one right. of the things that we talk, we've talked about, again, it's not, this is down in that section about things we haven't quite, I think, decided what we want to do with. But as you look way down the road, there is the ability to not send just the audio, but to send some data to a consumer device, and I don't want to leave it to a TV set because it could be something else, that will allow the consumer to do something with that data, display it in a certain way, have it read to them if that's what they, they care to do. Um, but but that, that's sort of way down down the road um, in, in terms of, you know, what 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 would that consumer product be? Um, is that in every set-top box? Um, it, it, there, there's part of it in, I, I think it's in the, uh, it's not the DBS section, it's in the, uh, I think in the IPTV section, talking about the, 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 the idea that, that, that the information as data could be sent to a consumer's device and then you have much more flexibility. Um, but again, these are not, we aren't examining how to implement that technology, just simply saying it's something that could be done down the road. Okay, uh, Kelly and, and Melanie, thank you. In the interest of keeping the ball rolling here, uh, let's have uh, maybe about a 15, 13 minute break and reconvene at 20 minutes after the hour. And when we reconvene at the front of the uh, U here, we'd like to ask uh, to have the six uh, working group co-chairs uh, uh, sit at that table at that time and Maybe if there's seats left over, anybody else can fight for them. But in any event, uh, let's do that. And if there is any um, carryover from this working group discussion, perhaps we can pick it up after the break at the beginning of the uh, next and last uh, plenary session. So 20 after the hour, please. I agree. That was 20 years old. So anyway, this afternoon's session is about unresolved overlap and orphaned issues. Um, we know there's a lot of unresolved issues um, that are appearing in all the reports and over the next couple of weeks we hope some of those will be resolved or clearly indicated as to what their future is. Um, but today we heard a lot about overlap and um, at one point uh, Jeff and working group four said there are a lot of dependencies with the other working groups so I think we have a chance now for most of the rest of the afternoon, aside from questions being asked, is to have the different working groups uh, highlight those issues that they raised this morning. We put towards an open questions docket. Um, I actually have some notes on that. Others, I hope, do as well. Um, and then address some of the open questions. I'm not sure how you folks would like to proceed um, and whether, for instance, uh, you know, Kelly, you've got issues that you think uh, the set-top box user interface group you should talk about. Um, I also have my own notes about the open questions uh, from working groups two, four, and three in that order. Um, Maybe we should just go through your notes. And All right. Um, well, the first one was an overlap question, and that was uh, in working group two, uh, Item 8.1, it was about control. Um, and you were wondering in working group two whether you should pass that on to working group four. Um, but if so, you don't want it to fall through the cracks or get lost. Um, and make sure it does wind up where it needs to be. Um, do I characterize that well? Uh, I guess that's Charlie. Um, in terms of that question about 8.1. And Paul? I'm not sure which of us uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I'm doing the I'm doing the gesture, Brian. Um, I'm assuming no fingers need to be involved in this uh, particular gesture. Uh, I, I, I meant tapping the screen. Uh, you know, I, was, I don't know what you all were thinking. So, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. We we want to make sure the control issue 
with respect to consumer control over description is fully handled, and it, and it sounds like Work Group Four's got it uh, well in hand, so to speak. Um, but th- but we, but obviously that will will be something, especially as we get to the final editing of the report. We'll 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 be giving that careful attention. But I I, I don't think that there's a further need for discussion. It sounds like that that issue is is certainly well vetted and well understood by Work Group 4. Okay, Brian is making a gesture. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Is that my cane or yours? Uh, Here you go. Uh, It's yours. Got it. Okay. So uh, when you take a look at our 13 functions, there was a breakout between turning on and off description and controlling description. I'd be curious, because we've had a debate in the group, whether or not you think there is a, is there something other than on-off that is a control of video description? We felt, I'm talking about the consumers, when I say we, i got to be careful. The consumers were of the opinion that there might, in fact, be features within the concept of video description that might be selective. Maybe today we only have audio description, pardon me, video description in English. But what if the day comes, and we've been told by industry it's possible, that there could be two audio description choices? Then you would be dealing with an option that's selectable, and so we should break out options. Right. What would your committee suggest? If I could, um, um, the the uh, other issue. There's two issues. One is uh, one is what you were talking about, and that is the, the presence of description in other language potentially. Um, also, the uh, possibility for independent user control of description, uh, such as volume, um, separate from main audio. My 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 sense is that those issues are are. Are, are in fact kind of future oriented good good to look at issues there is one additional piece that might be worth noting for the present though and this did this has come up in a couple places and that is the um, um, persistence of description one, once invoked uh, once you've selected the second audio channel that has the description that that it persists as your setting uh, which which I, I gather is doable but not consistently doable across consumer electronics although I'm not sure that that's I'm not sure that either point is true but that is a uh, that is another important element of control that I think we we uh, that has been uh, raised in, in conversation well these are these are various issues about how it should operate but let's see if we have a consensus on the fact that the handoff is complete uh, Jeff and Brian command and control of not just description, but captioning as well. They're, they're a bundled issue. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. Hmm. Yeah, sounds like it. There we go. Um, so this is Jeff. Um, and yeah, I, I, I would say absolutely. We have broken out separate sections for um, configuration of closed captions, both, both control and options. Um, we have configuration of uh, uh, description as well, um, and, and to Brian's point, we've had some discussions around options. Um, I think that discussion is still ongoing, really, at this point. But um, I think the fact that we are discussing it uh, implicitly means we've taken that on. So, that, yeah, I, I think great. that falls within our scope, definitely. Good. Um, and there, those comments that Paul was beginning with, um, selecting which language of descriptions, which is certainly a capability. Um, I think Paul's asked for a little bit of a tutorial on ISO 639 during this session, so we'll explain how that might very well be possible. Uh, I think, you know, Dolby has proposed this idea of uh, mixing in the set. That could be a command and control for description and obviously lots of options for captioning. So good. Um, We'll look for that, and everyone will keep their eye on the drafts when you second draft uh, for uh, working group fours. Uh, Issues, Susan, are you about to... Sorry, I'm behind you. (laughs) I just wanted to make a comment that I think there's also a related 
um, issue in terms of the control of emergency information. And I noticed when I was reading through the draft of the report from Working Group 3, there is a section in their report, I believe it's section 2.3, which deals with user interface issues. And I would also like to recommend that that section be handed off to Working Group 4 as well. Discussion? Uh, yes. Well, um, that is one of the sections, actually, that when I was talking about we need some stuff that required some focus. Um, that's one of the big ones. So there are some issues in there that um, are general interface issues, which I think we're happy to hand, uh, 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 to uh, hand over to Working Group 4. Um, there are some things in there, too, that are specific about the need to be able to get to emergency information quickly. Uh, that, that, there's some other stuff in that section that just needs to come out of there as well that maybe might be a finding as well that is more general. But yes, we're, we're happy to, 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 to relinquish some of the general discussion about interface issues. Uh, in Brian group. Jeff? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, Jeff again, and I, I think I'd agree there as well. Um, and I think this is one of those areas where we're probably going to need to stay pretty tight as far as, because uh, like I said during my, my presentation, it's going to be very much dependent on what signaling is available and what you can really get done in the user interface. Right. So that, that's one area where I think the dependency is there, but I think the user interface aspect certainly belongs with working group four. Um, there's a section um, in 2.4 that talks about the challenges that visually impaired and blind people have mm -hmm. in accessing the set. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm pretty sure that's what you're referring to. It, it's part of a generic discussion um, in, that, in that section. Um, but then there's other stuff that's specific to emergency information that I think we'll probably keep. But, but we, we, can, we can share that text with you and you can see where it fits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the signaling thing, I think, is a different discussion. I would ask that, uh, yes, share that text with uh, the two co-chairs there. The mm -hmm. same for uh, the other issue from uh, Working Group 2. Can I, can I confirm? We're, we're talking about the text mm -hmm. that's in the draft mm -hmm. that was distributed. Yes. Okay, so, so we have that. So you have it. Yeah. So okay. just to make sure it's called Great. out. Just want to make sure we're yes. talking about the same yes. area. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anyone else lurking behind me? Um, okay, so we're talking about both conscription, just... Captioning description and emergency information, command and control, going to working group four. Um, any questions on that? So the next item I have in my notes from working group two as an open question is the um, if no description issue. Um, and what was interestingly added to that today was the quality of the replicated main audio, if that's what's going to happen. Um, and I believe that sat as an open issue so far for you, uh, Charlie and Paul. Um, agreed it's open, and what kind of action do you think should be taken on that? Uh, <clears throat> I think it is still open. I, I think the only conclusion that we fully reached is that the channel shouldn't ever be empty. Uh, I, think, I think we're in consensus there. But um, I, I got a little bit of a sense this morning that we, we seem to be getting very close to the point that it would be program audio uh, duplicated there if it were not description or in the case of a shared channel Spanish or something else. Is that what others heard? Is that, uh, or do we actually have a conclusion to that point? I think I got that sense, but I'm not sure. It certainly sounded that way to me. Uh, anyone have an, al an alternate point of view in terms of this? A uh, default condition when there's no description, Kelly. Well, can we talk about options for a second so that everybody knows what maybe the options are? So, so <laughs> silence is one main program audio, and it could be a complete. It could be a, a duplicate mix. So think about on television the bulk of what you get over at least broadcast TV is stereo. There's some 5.1 content or surround sound content, um, and then. It was a very common practice in the analog days that there would be what was called a barker on that channel when there was no descriptions or Spanish or something. And it was simply a, a loop that said, this is not the main program audio channel. Please change to another audience. That, that would, might be another option that would be there. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I can't think of anything else that might be there. Mark. Yeah. Mark Iyer. I... Um, Mark Iyer with Sony, is it on? Yes. yes. Um, I think we should uh, 
keep in mind that long term we want to consider that the signaling should be correct and that um, if the signaling says there's a video description, you have video description. If the signaling says it's the second channel is, let's say, Spanish, that it's Spanish and that there's not any confusion as to what that, what that second audio is. And the only way that the TV is going to be able to give you the best um, experience is if the signaling is actually correct. So there's some, of course, now where we are is signaling is not exactly correct. <coughs> and we have a transition to get to the point where it actually is correct. But we should keep in mind that we're trying to get it, uh, we keep in mind that it should be accurately depicting what's, what's actually there. I, I would suggest there's going to be times when there's indications that there's video description, but they're not there but the uh, the metadata tags it as such and there's nothing that the set or the set top box can do about that at that point. Right. And so I think there's cases when the, there was a scheduled um, description, but the description isn't available for some reason. That's the case where you would have a fallback, which is, I would, I would agree, it would be the program audio. Yeah, and I think that's what we're talking about here. Is it, it, It's not even a matter of whether it's scheduled to be there and it's not. The program has neither descriptions, it has neither a second language, but we, we, we have discussed, in fact, in our group, and hopefully it's come up in our group too, we don't want to turn that service on and off. We don't want to, because that gets into provisioning from a data perspective. It's there, it's not there, it's there. So, so it seems reasonable that, that the provisioning, uh, that is the data structure for that service is there, and then what do we put on it? Um, it shouldn't just be silence. Um, and I, I actually thought that was the case that we were talking about, where there's neither one or the other, so there should be something there. Um, and I, I, I think it would probably require just some industry agreement on how we would signal that case. You know, we don't want to, you know, do we want to have a second uh, CM, for those of you who knows what this means, <laughs> a second CM that's English? Is that, you know, you know, we'd have to talk about because now you have two, right, CMs th that are English. Um, you really want to get into that now? No, I don't. <laughs> I, I'm asking the question. So I, I'm simply putting out there that that's the kind of discussion we have to have in an industry. It, it's not a technology issue. It's just we all just need to agree it's going to be sing signaled one way so that everybody who makes a product and consumers know what to expect uh, when they go to their TV set that they'll see English and English. Or do we call it VI? You know, they're, 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 that's a that's a best practice kind of thing. That's not a technology thing. Paul, I think this gets to uh, Paul Schrader with AFB. I think this gets to our, our you know our discussion of signaling for for for, for a topic somewhere down on this agenda. But for the moment, I, keeping this as simple as possible, because um, Kelly's going to challenge us to Google CM, I guess, in a minute. Um, <laughs> the um, We'll the um, the reason for the for the main program audio, in a sense, loops back to this question of of persistence or the challenge of finding the second audio channel, um, and, and so in in some ways this is a short and intermediate term severe problem. Over the longer term, it's probably not as big a problem, and it, and it may even go away as an issue. But for the short and intermediate term, while we have this in inordinately challenging environment for a consumer to find the second audio program channel and select it. Once having done that, the last thing we want to do is to put that blind consumer in the position of having to go searching back through the menu choices to get back to main audio because the program they wanted either doesn't have the description track that it was supposed to or doesn't have description at all. Uh, and, and so they're stuck with, with nothing, or they're stuck with some loop that says this is the second audio channel. For the time, until we have a better control environment, the, the best solution is to have main program audio where there's not Spanish or some other use of that channel, and obviously to have description in program audio where, where that's available on that second channel. Um, so, so quite apart from the signaling issue, the, the, the question is what to do with that channel, that second audio channel, and, and the strong recommendation from the consumer community is, I think, um, to have the, the main program audio be there if there isn't some other use specified for the channel at the moment uh, for that program. Now, I, I will tell you that there probably are people who would take a different point of view 
but and they would do it for for pragmatic reasons. That is to say, if we do that, doesn't that just slow down the push for having more description? Yeah, maybe. But that that really isn't the point. The point is what what works best for the consumer, and I think what works best for the consumer is to minimize the challenge and struggle of being able to enjoy television programming. I think that's pretty well agreed at this point. Now, uh, working group two should just build that into the report uh, that you're working on. Um, I did raise the issue, or someone actually in, in the uh, audience might have been Brian earlier today, about the quality of that replicated main audio, which is a very interesting question. It does bring up what Kelly was referring to with how the industry technically either points to or replicates that. Um, the guess is you're not going to carry two versions of main audio. You're going to somehow point to the main audio, but that's an implementation issue. Um, and I would let you guys talk that out in your groups or else you're going to be using up extra bandwidth. But that is a implementation question. I think John Card and your DTV audio metadata normalization group has been talking about this for quite a while now. Go ahead, John. Larry is talking about a CEA working group that I chair under CEA standards uh, environment. So, Brian, I don't know if you want to address that. Sure. Oh, there it is. Is it on? There. Hello? There we go. Um, yeah, so we've been, I, I'm Brian with CEA. So we have been working this issue for quite a while. Actually, John, uh, as you guys probably know, chair the working group. And that working group has published a, a bulletin, and a recommended practice that discusses how TV should should find, be able to find, read the signaling that goes with uh, different audio streams that are available in digital television. What we've been working on, I, the CA has been um, developing some test material to uh, attack this problem that Mark Iyer described that um, I won't take you through the whole CM, VI, all that kind of stuff, but Right now, we, we describe all programs as, as if they are just either the regular audio in English or, or Spanish. The standard actually accommodates really signaling that things are video description, and that's what Mark is saying. We want to get to that point, so we're looking at a way to basically mark some of the, the video description two ways so that current receivers can find it and future receivers can do it right so that we can transition as we displace receivers in the market to a way where you can really do the, all these good things we talked about, which is where you can have persistent settings and everything. So um, we've been debugging that test material. I've put it out to a couple of companies, but it's not, it is not completely bug-free yet. And as soon as it is, I'm pushing it out to my standards group and you know, whoever wants to review it. So. That's, that's where we are. We hope to be able to, you know, keep updating. I know it's been a, a long time. We've been talking about this a while, but um, it's only a good future solution if it doesn't break anything today, and that's what we've got to figure out first. Brian, since you have the microphone, um, a few people have asked about this issue of separating how you mark language from a service, and that's where this ISO 639 came up. Could you give us a few words in English about that? I'm probably not the best guy. So I'm not sure exactly what the question is. There, there is a difference, and you, you can separately signal the fact that it's what's called complete main, the CM that uh, Kelly was referring to, which is really what we ought to think about as sort of like the primary audio. And then there are other forms, one being the standard calls VI for visually impaired. There's HI and some other uh, other markings separately there there's a language descriptor so these are you know independent variables here which is why you can you, you can potentially have Spanish video description and you know somebody argue about that need and right now receivers aren't really capable of of kind of handling all those combinations and that's what the standard made clear uh, in the last couple of years and where we're trying to take our recommended practice so everybody starts handling all this stuff the right way rather than just kind of by default. And, and the default has been what's documented, I think, uh, right now in, say, working group two, which is this notion of there's a primary and there's a secondary, which is really a legacy of analog systems. Did I get all that right, Mark? 
That sound good, uh, Charlie? Yeah. Um, I I wonder if we should go ahead a little bit deeper, without getting too deep, and into this. I, I think Brian was mostly talking about uh, the uh, ATSC recommendations for audio descriptors, and then the CEA recommended practice around that. Uh, which is not uh, the ISO stuff that uh, has been referenced a couple of times, but rather ISO descriptors are another set of descriptors that are commonly used by cable and satellite broadcasters today. And so I wondered if we could take just a minute here, and my friend Andy Scott would talk to us for a second about that. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. Hello? Okay. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded disingenuous in some way. I, <laughs> I, I don't know that I can add much more than what Mark and, and Brian have already said. It's um, uh, Brian's right. There are a number of ways that we can uh, signal um, audio uh, or the availability of an audio stream in systems today. Uh, cable happened to be kind of a first adopter of digital technology in, in an effort to sort of duplicate what was at the time an, an audio channel, the secondary audio channel, that chose to signal this second audio channel using something called the ISO 639 language descriptor. And um, typically the way that's done is that uh, the, uh, the, the broadcast signal that comes into the cable plant is sent back out. We, we asked the broadcaster to tag that second uh, second audio stream with uh, with the language that's being uh, used in it, uh, typically Spanish or, or French, for example. And then the set-top box at the other end says, uh, okay, I see an ISO 639 descriptor labeled Spanish. That must be the second audio channel, and that's how users navigate to uh, to that second audio. That's uh, That method has some is along the way been uh, uh, updated, if you will, or, or usurped with a, with a slightly different way of carrying uh, not only language but signaling what the content of that second audio channel is, and that's typically done what we call the uh, some more, uh, some more alphabet soup here called the AC3 descriptor. And now what we do, or now what's being done today is that that AC3 descriptor not only signals what, what the content is, whether it's uh, um, uh, uh, visual information, VI, complete main uh, or both, but it also has the 639 language bytes inside the descriptor, so they do what they're supposed, what they should have done all along, which is describe language. They just happen to do it inside the AC3 descriptor itself. Unfortunately, we've got millions and millions of set-top boxes out there that don't know AC3 descriptors from, from 3CA descriptors, if you will. They just don't understand them. They don't parse that kind of descriptor because they're tip still using that legacy ISO 639 descriptor that we depend depend on for the from the content providers upstream from cable. So that's that's the position we find ourselves in. Doesn't mean that ultimately we, we, we won't make a transition perhaps to parsing those AC3 descriptors, but we've got millions and millions of reasons out there today why we can't do that. So we're limited to a second audio channel for that reason and others. Uh, frankly, we don't have, uh, we do have some bandwidth issues, but uh, speaking again for cable only here, uh, we've got, uh, you know, we've got head-end issues uh, 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 that's uh, sort of analogous to a central office. Uh, we've got issues there where, you know, uh, putting up a second audio channel takes additional hardware, software, and, uh, and some implementation to do, and we're just not there right now. So we're limited to, 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 uh, to two. The bottom line here is we're limited to two audio channels, and we're limited to a certain type of signaling right now, and that's the way it's going to be for a while. Uh, we can carry audio description in that channel today. In fact, we carry anything that's carried by the broadcaster in that audio, second audio channel will be carried by cable. It just happens to be signaled uh, using a second uh, language uh, descriptor, typically Spanish or English. So hope that was helpful. If, if there's any other questions, I can take them right now or take them offline. And by the way, this is all written up in the Working Group 2 report, and it's uh, – and it's sort of mimicked uh, in the Working Group 3 report because we would carry emergency information the same way. If emergency information is provided by the broadcaster in the second audio stream, it'll show up at the set-top box in that second audio stream. The customer would have to navigate to that second language to be able to receive it, though. Thank you. Uh, John Carter, I think you want to illuminate, and then Paul. Sure. This is John Carter with EchoStar. Actually, I don't have anything necessarily to add uh, for Andy's description. It's generally uh, accurate also for, for satellite carriage. 
but as a segue from that point, I did want to bring up uh, a point Steve Dulac and I noticed about duplicative information. Uh, we have provided information to Working Group 3 that's reasonably accurate about how DBS carriage works, including the secondary audio. And we note in Working Group 2's report, there's kind of a placeholder with a, a simple older diagram for literally identical information. What we're hoping to propose, and it may in turn, turn out to be more editorial in nature, is that Working Group 2's report or the whole report refer to there would there'd be a pointer somewhere. Either put the information in the Working Group 2 section and point back from Work Group 3 or, or vice versa. And we think that's probably wise to do also mm -hmm. for, for cable and, and for the IPTV and for, for broadcast so that we aren't simultaneously trying to keep two nearly identical things uh, in sync versus submit it once and everybody refers to that place. So uh, again, this maybe is a post uh, March 9th issue. I, I guess Stephen, I wanted to mention it now because it's also kind of a, if Working Group 2 can just rely on Working Group 3's description of the system, we're done. You're probably right, it is an editor's issue. Um, Paul, why don't you go ahead and then we can get uh, Kelly and um, Charlie. Yeah, uh, Paul Schrader with uh, AFB, uh, I was going to raise that, that point eventually as well, uh, so that we would have the uh, same, are we getting this mic? Um, Great, thank you. <laughs> Paul Schrader, AFB. Um, the just a, a quick editorial question, then I want to ask further question. I, I gather that the ATSC, the Advanced Television Standards work, has driven most of the work around this issue of channels or the uh, the digital spectrum. And it, how long has that uh, s standard for delivery been? Uh, included language about video description. I, I take it that's been a while. And 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 is that is that correct? Was it 2010? I think it was earlier than that, wasn't it? Mark, I was, uh, the the um, am I on yet? Mark, Mark I was Sony. Hello. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, the ATSC standards have uh, had have standardized the way that the VI and HI tracks are signaled in the AC3 descriptor from the very beginning. We did transition away from the use of the ISO 639 descriptor to indicate language. And uh, for, I don't know, I think f about five years, the AC3 descriptors carried language in it. And uh, so essentially what it amounts to is stressful broadcasting is a bit ahead of the, uh, the rest of the distribution chain as far as what I would call the correct signaling. Paul, again, and I, it, the reason I'm trying to get an understanding of this is to try to figure out why we find ourselves at, at this point where we, we have this system in place, though we've known about the need for video description as a discrete channel for quite some time. Granted, there wasn't a requirement uh, for it. But so, so sit, since we have the situation where there is this ambiguity about the use of the second channel, uh, and the signaling for the second channel. How do we, now speaking as a VPAC, um, help move the commission and the industry forward in a deliberate but, uh, you know, uh, sufficiently robust and quick fashion to get this dealt with? Because one hopes, as a consumer, that there will be a time when, when uh, there will be uh, both plenty of Spanish language and plenty of video description being provided, and we certainly don't want to keep having a situation where consumers for those groups are put at loggerheads about the use of that uh, of the second channels. Um, so how do we how do we help move that forward? I already signaled earlier that this this language about evolution seems to me not quite sufficient in in work group two's report. Um, it doesn't sound to me like that's um, you know, uh, all deliberate speed kind of language. Um, so how do we how do we get this move forward, g given that it hadn't moved forward now, uh, pre previous to now, sufficiently well? John Carr, you've done that? Sure. I, I, I Paul, this is John Carr from EchoStar. I have a part of the answer to your question. And entirely seriously, one way we move it forwards is to start a standards effort three years ago. The good news is we did that. Uh, and, and this touches on exactly that uh, recommended practice Brian Mark Walter brought out, uh, the, the recommended practice for receivers. 
however, as we published that, as we know, as we looked at that, the next question that came up was, great, how do we get from practice today to what this recommended practice envisions, full use of the, the full signaling capabilities of the standard? And that's what we are literally working on. You know, when I, when I get back to Denver, I, I will have some guys ready to look at the, the example streams and figure out is, the, is what's being proposed a viable mechanism that doesn't dif disenfranchise the millions upon millions of already fielded television receivers for the sake of the yet-to-be-built and yet-to-be-sold receivers. So if the FCC tells us, never mind about all those fielded receivers, tells industries that, I, I'd be surprised, but that would be a way to move forwards. It'd be rather drastic. I don't expect that to happen. <coughs> Similarly, I also don't expect uh, to, to not be able to see broadcasters in the next few years roll out these advanced signaling capabilities. So apart from the VPAC, there are folks trying to, to coordinate this. I'm glad Brian spoke up and, and mentioned the, the activity. I would very much like to see a contribution from that uh, working group or from the CEA standards group, which is distinct from CEA as a trade association into either the VPAC report or comments on the VPAC report because I think some of the work is, is actually active and it's, it's ongoing today. Um, <coughs> so so I, I don't want to tell you don't worry about it. We've got it handled because we are worried about it and, and we will take the input as we can find them. Uh, if you'd like to join our working group, frankly, uh, I mean, we've been open to... to uh, to everybody who, who has some technical input to it, and, and your input would be welcome. There, there are uh, lots of folks looking at this. We know it's a disaster. Sorry, wrong, little d disaster. It, it's a problem. <laughs> and, and so we're, we're doing what we can. If, if there are better ways to move forwards, we'll, we'll, we'll try and apply them. And just, just to follow up then on the receiver side of this, um, uh, there's some reference, sorry, in the... Uh, I can't remember which work group report it was now to a, to a standard that I, I gather is the one you were just referring to, John, the Consumer Electronics Group is working on that has to do with the receiver side. But but I guess that is something we're going to need to deal with in work group two. Um, and golly, I'm not sure what group, work group you were suggesting I join. I think I've probably joined <laughs> enough. But um, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, it sounds like we needed to, to address the receiver side of this in terms of signal decoding, handling and decoding. Uh, yeah, actually, that standard has been published for about a year now, something something in the order of a year. So the receiver standard, I think, is or the recommended practice is, is done, and now we're trying to figure out how can we get from today's practice to a system that, that enables the use of that recommended practice. However, these, these uh, bulletins get revised. If... if if this uh, mechanism for being able to label things two different ways works out, we probably will go back to the, the bulletin and add language to help receiver manufacturers understand this this slightly odd uh, broadcast stream, for example. And and, and those kinds of activities, you, uh, it, that, that's the working group. I'll, I'll talk to you offline about what, what activity this is and, and see if you're, you're interested in joining that standards effort. Uh, Kelly, did you want to... Yes, I'm sorry. Um, Please do. I forgot, okay. I forgot what the first thing was. Um, whatever it was, I agreed with John Card, so he said, well, I'll do it. So, but, uh, I forget what that was. So, I'm sorry, I distracted you. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so there are a couple of things, um, and I've been thinking about um, the questions around what this evolutionary m move, uh, you know, what it means to be evolutionary. And the process is actually kind of complex. And I mean, so I've been thinking about this all morning. And I think the way to look at it is look from the consumer backwards. So there are two environments. There is a consumer that receives their, their uh, entertainment or their information, let's say, strictly over the air. And then there are consumers that receive their information uh, through an MVPD via some sort of set-top box. Um, so what kind of needs to happen in the evolution is to look at those, these, these two paths and say what needs to happen with respect to, to with signaling 
And essentially, with these, the signaling, what it does, it, al- it enables features within a consumer device to make them more accessible. Now, what those features are, how they're implemented, you know, that could be market-driven. It could be uh, any, any number, number of things. And so John is correct that the standards activity that puts that into place started three years ago and, and is, for the most part, completed. But then what needs to happen is to say, within simply in the TV sets, what are you going to do? Well, there's sort of a recommended practice that, that, that tells you, tells maybe a set manufacturer what to do. Uh, and, and then it's just a matter of how that, those features are implemented in, in the set uh, or what feature the set manufacturer might want to offer. Um, and then what does the broadcaster do to, you know, if we want to send 16 audio services, how would we label those? So one, one a distinction that we've sort of talked around, but I want to make sure it's really clear. When we talk about these descriptors or this, the, the tagging or the signaling is the term that I've been using, we sort of signal two things. We send a signal to let the receiving device know that, that something is present. So in this case, it's an audio service, an audio, audio track, if you will. I like to use the word channel. And then we send information to tell the receiving device about that service. It would, at least with respect, let's, well, let me finish with the, the over-the-air part. So we could, and Mark is right, the structure to send separately to indicate the presence of the service and then the characteristics of the service. So what are the characteristics of the service? What is the purpose of it? This is that CM, complete main, or the VI, visually impaired. Why are, you know, what is the purpose of it? And then... We use ISO 16, uh, uh, 639 to describe the language. Now, the interesting thing you have to realize about ISO 639 is not specific to our industry. It's just a standard that gives you two or three-letter abbreviations for languages. That's pretty much all it does. Um, it's kind of I call it think of it like postal codes for languages, if you will. Um, so you know, use an existing standard. We do that. Um, and so we, that's one of the things we send is language. When you move to the, the MVPD world, and, 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 and a lot of things are legacy, our operations are legacy from analog, because we're only a few years away from that, how we operate in analog. Um, there was not this difference between, and this isn't true for all MVPDs, but, but certainly some of them, there wasn't a difference between signaling the presence of an audio service, in this particular case, and its characteristics, it is the characteristic that signals for the set-top box, it signals the presence of, of that. So there, there, there are a couple of things we have to look at when we talk about what the evolution is. And they're different in, in different consumer experiences. And if we say we want to add multiple, more than two, audio services, that is somewhat of a different discussion, at least in my mind, I guess the MVPTVs could talk to themselves, than how we signal. So to some extent, how we signal, uh, and I said this just a few minutes ago, is a function of not necessarily standardization, but just simply coming to an agreement so that everyone along a distribution chain knows that whoever originated that program is signaling things about that program in the same way. And, And when you bury down to it, it's really simple for us to say we're going to put replicate the program audio uh, on this additional audio service when there's nothing else there. But then we need to talk about how are we signaling that and how are we telling the set that and how does that, what we tell a TV set, I'm sorry, I tend to think of a set because I'm over the air guy, what does it do with that and then what does it do in the absence of that information? Um, and, and so I'm not trying to make this sound complicated um, and it's not hard, but it is a little complicated because what we want to do is we want to give the consumer an effective experience, um, you know, not just from an entertainment, but from, the, you know, accessing emergency information. That effective experience is saying that the consumer knows what to do and they have a reasonably similar experience if they're using a TV set or whether they're using a cable box or whether they're using a satellite box or an IPTV box, that they know how to do that and that they can rely on the fact that they go to that box and it works the same way every time they go there. And a lot of that is enabled by the fact that we can send information through a distribution chain. Or if, for example, a broadcaster signals it one way, when it gets to the end, a head end, what does a head end do 
to make that signaling work in their environment, and then it goes to the set-top box, and then from the set-top box to the, set, to, to, to the TV set. Same thing, in, in, whether it's an IPTV uh, or satellite, you know, what do you do with this information? How do you interpret what you get from a local broadcaster? How does that interpret it through the distribution chain to the set-top box? What does a set-top box do? What does a set-top box allow a consumer to do? How does a consumer easily access those things to get what they need out of their TV set or their box, or if we go down to item, was it 15, the auxiliary device? So to me, when I read Working Group 2's report, the elements of that are all in that report. They're all in there, but I understand the issues surrounding them. Paul, I guess, I don't think you, you do. So when you said, oh, gee, I don't know that we've addressed it, I went, oh, gee, yeah, sure you did. <laughs> but um, So maybe there's some disconnect there. But it is complicated. And so you know, when I, ran, when I got to that finding that says, well, this is evolutionary, I said, oh, great. I, yeah, it is evolutionary. I get it. So I'm not sure how to address this concern. I don't even know if it really needs to be addressed. But... I, 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 I recognize the fact that this probably isn't really clear to everyone. Yeah, Paul, right. I'm going to give you the last shot here. We, um, I think, do have a good understanding of this and marching orders for your working group. But go ahead and um, make your comment there. Yeah, Paul Schrader with uh, AFB. So just, just to be clear, the, the language in the report is quite clear uh, and certainly understandable. What I think you're missing, maybe I was being too gentle, um, what I what I understand is w when I hear the term evolution, it sounds to me like we'll get around to it. Maybe we've been hearing that a long time as consumers. That doesn't sound to me like it's actually going to happen. That's my worry, uh, w and and the ex and the complexity that you just explained is exactly the sort of thing I would expect to hear someone say in a prelude to, and oh by golly, um, it's going to be a long time before we can actually resolve all these issues, and and some of that may be true at the receiver end because there are issues, I would point out in the navigation device area, or the, which I gather is the set-top box area, uh, there is an expectation that uh, companies will be providing a, a box with accessible uh, controls on request, and certainly that may be one way to tackle uh, the issue of how it deals with uh, descriptors and signaling that's coming down from in the MVPD case. Um, so I, clear enough, but I think, I think the concern has more to do with um, speeding us along a path that actually gets this resolved in a, in a feasible way, and I don't see that I don't see that clear in the report. So what I suggest is, because this was in the list of uh, this discussion this afternoon, is that your working group do not only look at this evolution, but try to put some parameters around it, or talk about um, a time frame as a recommendation, or contingencies like if the CEA dual tagging scheme works, that's a much faster uh, solution, um, and try to put some definitions around what this evolution means, um, not try to resolve it here. Um, I think, in fact, this issue is much closer to being fixed than many others that are on the list. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone forward on it. Some of the others have never even been touched. Um, so that's probably good news. Yeah, Jeff? Um, just, a, just a quick one. <clears throat> Kelly, I think I'm um, uh, more or less agree agreeing with you. I, uh, whether we call it evolutionary or, or something else, I think it's a matter of identifying the steps to get to the end game. And many of those steps might be able to happen in parallel once there is uniformity of agreement on what the final solution looks like. But, but you can't even lay out those steps until you really identify the pieces of the puzzle, which is, I think, what you're referring to, right? It's the end-to-end... -end we can call it a system evolution or, you know, there, there has to be uniformity of what we all want to get done to get to the end game. And then we can start discussing, well, there's, there might be a period, a different period of time over which those changes need to happen for various components. And I think that's what... Yes, that's exactly. Okay. We, we yeah, will have I, the transcript I, of Kelly's description of those steps from the captioning. Right, right. <laughs> and so those brilliant words can be reused. Yeah, because I can't repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> So I, again, ask the working group, too, to, to look at that um, and see about those contingencies and steps that will need to get us to eventually doing it all the right way. I should mention that WGBH as a broadcaster tried to do it the right way and tag it the way it's supposed to be in the future, and we got nothing but complaints from consumers. So we went back because of this legacy issue. So we're very sensitive to it. The next item 
on the open question list for WG2 is uh, program information. We had a, a pretty good discussion this morning and uh, appreciated the comments from Rovi um, about the existence of that field in their database and that they do scour the market to find that information. Um, and I think it was Charlie who suggested that uh, maybe Tribune is probably in the same place. So it may not be as open an issue as was suggested, um, but your report will have to somehow address this question of um, helping the consumers find the information. Um, so let's spend a couple of minutes on where you might want to go with that. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Sure. Uh, we're on here. Um, I think part of this uh, feeds into working group four um, in that providing the information we, we have to get the information into whatever user interface and other things that working for working group four is going to be working on um, <clears throat> we've talked about uh, getting it from programmers and broadcasters we talked about getting it through Roby and Tribune and therefore out to cable operators and other MVPDs uh, and I mentioned this morning that we would have to develop some software to make it available in our set-top box and and that is going to be an effort. It's going to take some amount of time and we can spend some more time trying to flesh that out. Uh, we need to do that part. Working Group 4 needs to then do more with it. So I think we need to interface a little bit more there. I guess I would ask, uh, ask Jeff here, do is, is you agree that that is one of the areas of interface there? Um, absolutely. And I, I, I think you covered it exactly right. It's uh, I, I would think that your working group would be handling um, lack of a better way to say it, uh, defining the mechanism of getting the what I'll call metadata mm -hmm. down to the device, set top, or what have you. And then it's the user interface <laughs> responsibility to display that to the user. Um, so not, not an overlap here, but a dependency. Yeah, that's probably the more, better way to put it. <clears throat> then I would say in addition, yeah. in addition to that, uh, the, the, the whole question of other ways, particularly are there shorter term ways that this information that uh, exists and is very useful to the consumer can be made available shorter term um, and, and you know, once the information is available and, and accessible, perhaps there are existing websites, providers of websites that are willing to do something with that information in the, in the shorter term. Um, you know, what, not not instead of, but in addition to, and even earlier than making it fully available and accessible on various set top box platforms. Uh, and I don't know what where that might lead, but it seems to me like there may be some possibilities there to do something sooner rather than later. But I don't know. I don't know who that third party might be, so to speak. Well, I, I was having some side discussions this this morning. Uh, after Adam from Rovi talked about how his database is relatively robust, and it made me think about how uh, many cities' uh, public transit systems actually publish their database of uh, transit information, and they simply let developers develop their own apps, websites use it, it's in a common format, an XML format. Um, perhaps a bit of a radical suggestion is to see whether Rovi and Tribune would make just that piece of their database available for developers to take it and run with it, and then it can populate any number of platforms, web, and uh, sorry, I put you on the spot there, uh, mobile devices, IVR systems, telephone systems, if that data could be made available. I know it's kind of complicated, so go ahead, Adam. Hello. All right, there we go. Uh, so, so speaking to the point about whether or not that data is available, actually, I, I can't speak for Tribune, but let me speak briefly to Rovi. Rovi does actually have what we call our Rovi Cloud Services, which is an open developer program where uh, developers can access that information for free. And for nonprofits, uh, they would have uh, access to that data without any charge. Uh, people using it for commercial products that uh, they're generating revenue off of them would have to enter into some sort of commercial relationship with Rovi. But that's something where you can sign up for a developer account and in a matter of days uh, uh, have an application up and running. 
and it uh, you can you can format the data however you need to format it and filter it and uh, get whatever access to whatever fields you need for your application. So it's a very flexible developer program like what you're talking about. Um, and you mentioned if it was a nonprofit, there's no cost, but if you're looking for a commercial application, it might be. Right. So, so if someone has advertising next to it and is, uh, or has it embedded into a web page, or is using it to sell content or things like that, that's a commercial relationship, uh, and, and that's uh, traditionally what our metadata business is about. Uh, but if it's for a nonprofit, I believe the, the terms of the service are that uh, it's it's freely accessible. That's great. Yeah, Judy Brewer from a nonprofit known as the W3C. <laughs> oh, show me the microphone. Oh, it's coming. Um, yeah, one of the implications of the TV moving onto the mm -hmm. web is that it, it also is nice to have some comparability with what's happening in the rest of the world. And my understanding is the U.S. is fairly unique in not having this program guide information uh, more open. And so... Um, I would encourage uh, there to be a comparable service, so the comparable availability of that information openly, as that will support populating program content uh, through parallel types of applications uh, for uh, easier use on the on the web. I would just encourage that. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll let Adam uh, respond, and then Kelly, you had something you remembered. Yes, I remember. Let, let Adam res respond. No, sorry, to that. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Microphone back to Adam. <coughs> <clears throat> Thank you. So, so uh, to, to the point that uh, DVB and ARRIBE and other international standards allow uh, metadata to be carried with the video signals, uh, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, I don't necessarily think that they have the right information for actually signaling the availability of alternate audio tracks and things like that uh, in association with program guides. Uh, so some of that information may or may not be available based on different standards. Uh, and and uh, from our experience in operating in those markets where we also sell metadata in Europe and Japan and other places, uh, Th that metadata may not always be complete enough to actually build applications on top of, may not have descriptions, may not have uh, information to cert sort and search and do all the types of uh, application development you need on top of it. So while we support uh, uh, international standards and the uh, alternate delivery of metadata, I'd say that there's it's worth thinking through the entire application development cycle rather than just uh, thinking that that's going to solve some, some sort of problem. Uh, and I'll just mention that the, the W3C does have this TVN working group. Is that right? And maybe right. If you're, I don't know if you're involved or not, but it might be worth. Uh, We've been tracking it. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, Kelly. I remember. Back. Yes. <laughs> so it's dropping back about a half hour. Um, working group three would happily cede the architecture sections of our document to working group two. <laughs> just want to. Uh, John said he didn't know where it should be. I believe it should be working group two, since that's all the path through stuff. So we'd happily take the architecture and then point to the basic architecture stuff and keep our sections focused on moving emergency information. Mm -hmm. If if the chairs of working group two uh, accept, yeah, yeah. Right, right. yeah, I can. They just they just no, I can throw it. No, but, <laughs> I can catch it. On the other end. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think at least two of those sections are almost 100% duplicative. So, right, so you're talking about the pointer, in essence, between the two. Right. Well, no, the text is actually almost 100% duplicative in the section, so it doesn't need to reside in both. I'm simply expressing my opinion. I believe that those issues of pass-through and architecture belong in working group two. We, we need to stay focused on moving emergency information. You, I, I'm agreeing with John that we don't need a description about how IPTV works in both documents. Mm -hmm. So the editors might need to take uh, take that one on. Uh, no, I'm just cutting mine out and throwing it over the wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, back, to, yes. <laughs> back to this program information question. So we've got some very interesting new input. Um, hopefully working group two can incorporate that in uh, as they try to come up with something to say about this program information question. 
Um, I think what Adam uh, mentioned to us and uh, the developer's kit is, is very interesting. I, I think about this. Um, it's a commercial service called Caption Fish, and they just spider the web to find out where captioned movies are playing uh, and describe <coughs> movies. I'm sure they would love to have access to this data. However, they are a commercial organization, so we would look for others to also get access to this data. So that might help elucidate that information. Any other comments on the uh, program information issue? Paul. Pulse Raider AFB. I just want to uh, note that the issue of information being made available via the web, both by the covered entities as well as by those who are passing through description remains, I think, an important item for at least a, a, a substantial subgroup within working group two. And I guess I would ask, is there a reason that we can't have that as a semi-consensed item? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Posting on the website of the entities, the nine entities covered by the description requirement, as well as by those who will be who, who are be uh, required to pass through described programming where it's, when it's available to them, uh, posting on their website the programs that are described. On, on their own website. On their own website, yes. Again, it, it perhaps not a it's certainly not a perfect mechanism, but a short, uh, specifically particularly a short term mechanism until program guide access is secured, which won't be a while. Uh, John. Uh, while you, I think, count the nine when you count covered entities, uh, DDS system operator counts 210 DMAs times a number of broadcasters within each DMA. So we quickly count up to the thousands of data I, uh, I, I'm not sure. I let, let's continue the discussion work group two. Certainly for the five cable channels, we'll say, that are carrying, you know, there's kind of one version of that signal. But for a, uh, a broadcaster from DMA to DMA, the, the availability of video description ver may vary on their technical capability or on an MVPD's technical capability to pass that video description. So it's, it's not a trivial solution. I agree it's a problem that needs to be solved. At the very least, we need to, to lay it out clearly in our report. And I don't have a better answer for you yet, but I have faith that we will find one as yeah, we, fair, as we fair, move forward. Fair enough, but I mean, I think that the, the issue of who is subject to the pass-through requirement is separate fr from, I mean, that, that is an issue that, that obviously needs to be resolved, and, and, we'll, and there's a method in the report in order to deal with that. All I'm saying is that once that's established, whatever entity that is on their website indicate the programs that are that are available with description so that at least a consumer has a reasonable shot of finding that, that information or having someone find it for them. Sure. Uh, what's available in their local delivery area. But what I guess what I'm trying to explain is that consumer by consumer, market by market, that availability may differ yeah. so that it, as a CBS viewer in market one, I may see descriptions, but CBS viewer in market 150, I may not because that local broadcaster doesn't carry it. So the question is, let's postulate Dish is going to carry and say uh, CBS's top-rated show has descriptions. Everyone in market 150 will never hear descriptions on their CBS station. That is either wrong information, it's bad information, or it's going to cause calls, or all of the above. That, uh, again, this is something I think we need to pick up. We need to figure out what we can say in the report, but I, I guess I'm suggesting it is not as simple as, a, a, as it may appear on, on the face. I, I don't disagree with you. There's a need to provide accurate information. I'm just trying to understand how to handle these many, many exceptions that are going to be popping up. And are, are, is the case you're bringing up, in essence, really just for those MVPDs that are uh, national supporting local broadcasts, in essence, satellite providers? Well, I, th I suspect, I, I haven't asked Charlie from Comcast or, or Steve from Cox, but I, I would guess Comcast, if you go to the main Comcast website, 
they will have markets that will differ from each other. I, I don't know this. Maybe they, they are going to be able to somehow invent descriptions when the local CBS broadcaster can't carry them. Well, most of the time when you go to a cable company's website, you localize it and say where you're coming and, and, from. And as I said, I don't know what the, what the right answer is mm -hmm. for that. Maybe that is the solution. The same is true for, for DISH. They are able to localize it as well. Mm. Simply carrying a list of programs, though, to say NCIS is, is always going to have video description is not accurate, if it is truly not accurate. That's the problem, is just carrying a list of programs that, that have video description is a list of programs that may have video description depending on where you live. Charlie, you about to? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I would, uh, I would react. <clears throat> if, if we get that information, in our case, from, from Rovi as a part of the normal data we receive, uh, then <clears throat> that does become localized on our website or on our set top box guide, as you say. So, um, so as, as long as the data that we get from the service provider is localized, as it typically is, for things like closed captioning, then uh, that, that part probably works for us, I, I think. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about um, all cable operators, all satellite operators, you know, having a guide even on their website today. Uh, if, if we have a guide on our website, and we do, uh, Comcast provides that, I'm inclined to think we could probably add that once we begin to get the information from the providers. Well, you have a guide you take that on your website? Uh, Kelly, I'm going to ask you the same question on the local broadcaster level then, uh, saying that each local broadcaster, Paul is suggesting, should put on their own website which programs they're carrying that have description available. Um, I don't really have a comment about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, it's certainly something we'd be willing to consider. Um, I think that it continues as an open question, but really needs discussion, further discussion. Yeah. Uh, I, I think John's point is, if I get uh, just supposing between what, what Paul said, um, a network doing it is one thing. Yeah. Whether you actually get it is something else. So could you have a network that says, yes, we provide... NCIS with descriptions, but in Sheboygan, they don't, the affiliate there doesn't have a second audio service, so it's not there, it's not present in the MVPB. Yeah. You know, it, it seems innocuous enough, but I think it's something we need to, uh, to, dis to discuss and kind of that. Brian? I find it really interesting, in as much as I have on my iPhone here something called ITV. And when I got this app on my iPhone, I'm able to choose my carrier, choose my zip code, and know what's on TV tonight. Thank you, Comcast. I can't imagine why some other entity cannot provide the same thing at a reasonable... It, it, um, I, I, I understand there may be some technical reasons, but I, I have to say that as a consumer, I kind of think the data's there. It's being passed through. It's up to you to figure out how you're going to share it with us as a matter of this regulation, not why it's going to be difficult, but when can you get it done? John Card? Brian, offline, I, I will ask you to tell me what's on channel 276 on dish. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, offline, I'll, we'll have a conversation yeah, sure. because I would like to understand for that application. I've seen some of them. Oftentimes, they are missing significant chunks of data. Uh, so I, I very much would like to, to, to talk to you after we're done with the, the plenary here. Couldn't you use a disclaimer that says data provided by X? We apologize if it doesn't apply to if, your situation. If you want to go talk to the ITV guys about that, great. But EchoStar and Dish definitely don't sounds do that. like an offline discussion. Yeah, it is an offline discussion. So, so <laughs> thank you for mentioning that. I would like Charlie. to understand. And I, and I would say, and I think John said this before. This, hello, Charlie here. Hello. Okay. Uh, I think John alluded to the fact that we need to take this up. It's important that we take this up in the working group, and I think that's exactly what we should do. Okay. The last item I have for your working group is the point of contact issue as an open question. Um, presently, the FCC requires that every provider have a closed caption complaint, a point of contact. I believe uh, the charge to the group is considered what you'd like to do about the similar issue for description issues. Go ahead, Charlie. 
again, here we go. Is that that is in our section eight somewhere of issues yet to be uh, addressed? Okay. And we haven't we have we have touched upon it in a meeting, but we haven't really spent a lot of time on that one yet. So that's <laughs> clearly something the working group still needs to wrestle with. Good. Paul, did you? Yes. In those ten or eleven hours you have, you're going to be meeting. <laughs> yes. Well, that's all I have on my list for working group two. Uh, anyone else know or want to mention open issues for working group two? Tremendous. Let's move on to working group four. Um, I don't have an awful lot for that group as open issues, except there's a lot more that needs to be filled in yet. Um, one of the issues that did come up that I think was fairly well resolved was that when examples are given, they should be very clearly marked as uh, suggestions, um, if they are intended as a safe harbor or a, recommend, a requirement, those things should be very clearly labeled as such. If they're not, and they're for examples only, then that should be very clearly labeled. And that, that was an open issue. I think it was fairly well discussed this morning. Any discussion on that one? Good. Um, one of your sections or one of the issues that came up was uh, the issue of phase-in of these different requirements. Um, and they may not be all simultaneous. They might be parallel. They might take a short time. They might take a very long time. And I think uh, what we heard was there's a lot of unknowns, but if you could put in any kind of general parameters or contingencies in your report, It'll help the FCC f figure out when they eventually do an NPRM and a rulemaking, um, is it going to be all or none, all at once? Is it 10 years? Is it one year? So I think that that's, that phase-in schedule is probably something you uh, want to talk about in general or specific terms. Uh, I think Brian's leaning in. Yes? No? Okay. Uh, any discussion about that? Because uh, they're really looking for help on timetables. Go ahead, uh, Jeff. Um, no, I agree. I, 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 I appreciated the comment this morning because, um, quite honestly, I think our focus right now is, is fleshing out those essential functions. I really think that's, that's the critical piece of the report that we really want to make sure is, uh, is what we want it to be. <laughs> to, I'll put it that way. Um, and I think once those are laid out, um, I think on the industry side, you know, we, we have a lot of expertise and understanding on you know, what the related technologies uh, are that are out there today to what changes would be needed. Um, and I think at that point, we can start really drilling into kind of the phase-in language. Um, but I think right now, the main focus has got to be, you know, the, the meat of the report, the essential functions and, and fleshing out those functional requirements. But yeah, I, I certainly uh, think we ought to cover, you know, timelines mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, Melanie over here next to me. Thank you. I think, um, I, well, I suspect this is going to be, this is Melanie Brunson, and I, I suspect this is going to be an issue for working group three as well. And I um, missed work group two's report this morning. But the thought that has occurred to me is that I wonder, um, since to some extent at least, I think a lot of our timeline issues um, between all three groups might overlap a bit. So I'm wondering um, if there would be any value in having <coughs> at least some of the discussion around timelines be a joint discussion among um, co-chairs um, of all the groups or, or some, some subset of all the groups or even, I don't know, um, some mechanism for kind of dealing with timelines in a in a holistic sort of manner because um, I think some of us don't know what other some of the discussions I think in our group we've all kind of felt well we don't know when it could happen because this and this and the other groups are going to have to happen either prior to or simultaneously with the the same timeline issues that we're dealing with. Jeff? 
Um, I, I will say, and I know this isn't going to be a, a popular answer, that the timeline question I, I suspect is going to be a very complicated one. Um, and and I, I would say that it's not, it's not one that I think the co-chairs should try to address individually because it's going to take a level of expertise. And I, I mean, I, I have a level of uh, knowledge, you know, in my particular corner of the industry, um, and uh, uh, and it, it covers, you know, uh, somewhat of a, a broad area just in my <laughs> my slice of the pie. But there's a much bigger slice um, that surrounds us here that that I can't speak to, and, and that's just an example, right? But um, when we're talking about changes that are going to affect an end-to-end -end system, I think we really got to. Uh, focus on each of those aspects. And back to the, the conversation with Kelly earlier about system evolution, where, you know, what are the steps, what are the components involved, uh, who are the players that are going to need to be involved, and then it's, so it's, it's a complicated question. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking to start with, it probably makes sense for each working group to look at their piece of that, and then when all the co-chairs sit down together and start going through, you know, all three reports, Hopefully we can identify overlaps and whatnot, and things can happen in parallel. Maybe, you know, some things can, and likely some things can't. Um, but I, I don't know how to how to work through that without all the pieces in front mm -hmm. of us. That's fair. I think one, uh, if you couldn't put months and dates on it, you may be able to say in what order certain things could be done. And from the same side, from users, what priorities are there? Like, it would be great if this was done first, like locating my channel, having my channel speak to me. So those might line up well in terms of, even if you don't know what date you can have it by, uh, what the order of implementation could be, and the same thing for user needs, uh, what is the most important thing? And I think you're getting at that in your user requirements as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other um, comments? On uh, working group four, obviously you guys are going to um, fill out the rest of your document, but I don't have other notes about specific open issues at this point. Then we'll move on to working group three. Um, I have a few interesting notes here. Um, TTS is not a mature technology. Uh, that was an excellent note. Um, we did find that citation in the EAS rule. Um, you're going to overrule it? <laughs> uh, we're going to make recommendations. Yes, good. We're going to voice our opinion. Okay. If we cannot overrule, we can only make recommendations. Right. I, I think that's non-controversial, and, you know, it's not even an open question, really. You'll, you'll have something to say about that. Yeah. Um, our stuff doesn't really work without it. I mean, yeah. that's, the, I mean that's really sort of what it comes down to. So. Yeah. Um, you... Um, I don't know if you explicitly raised in your conversation, but it's in your report, is where to provide this information. That is, how are you delivering it to the consumer, um, which there are various ways that you're talking about and considering. Is it the VI channel? Is it some other way? Um, I didn't hear any discussion of that this morning, Sorry. so maybe you want so to... So let me... Yeah, okay, sure. Um, uh, uh, this is controversial because of access issues, um, but the, the, the short-term, immediate short-term is through the VI channel. So, and so all the issues surrounding that. We, we also talked about future things, for example, you could send it as data, send an emergency information as a data that a device could do something else with. I don't think we're recommending that, but that is something else that could be done. Um, we also toyed with, I guess, let's say at the point that we evolve to what the next step in signaling is, would you, what might uh, a program supplier do in the case of an emergency. Um, and, I, and I think we talked about a little bit, for example, changing signaling mid-program. So, for example, in a two-audio service world, on the second service there is Spanish. An emergency comes up. Um, functionally, what would happen is a broadcaster would stop, would interrupt that Spanish audio and replace it with English um, representation of the emergency information. No, I ain't got, only got one audio track. I only got one additional audio service. 
Right? That, that's in this world. Um, uh, and then you would go back when and submergence Spanish was Spanish language over. station. Well, Spanish language stations now have the flexibility to put uh, you know, a, a station has the flexibility to deliver its emergency information in the language of its audience. So, so th there could be a Spanish. Well, yes, on a yes on a Spanish station, the crawl would be in Spanish. Right. Yeah, that that that's not no. But the, the issue is that at some point, I we change from saying this is complete main information to this is VI information to go back to be in some short period of 10 minute ta time span. Well, while it's not written in stones anywhere, changing signaling in the middle of a program was never actually contemplated in our digital entertainment world. Not that you can't do it, but no one's ever really done it. So we t we've talked a little bit of like that. It, it also is, is fairly impractical in a world of uh, whoever's originating the program has to get up in the emergency, go right now to a front panel, change some switches, then remember to go back, and, and then it gets a little complicated. But um, so yes, to answer your question directly, right now we follow the VI service, and that is on the additional audio track, eventually tagged as such. And you're going to include some of these other future-oriented ideas just as They're informational? They're in there, actually, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Other comments on that uh, on emergency issues, working group three? John Card? So, I'm just John Card from Echostar, and I'm going to put back on my working group 12 hat, which is this uh, digital audio metadata group. We did have some discussion within that audio metadata group, and we had participation from an NEB member, not Kelly, one of his colleagues and uh, a gentleman from NCTA, and Larry, I don't remember if you were in that call or not. We actually spanned a number of calls. The, the, the issue of signaling emergency information and relying on that signal is, we think, bigger than just a VPAC issue because, it, I'm, I'm sorry, we, at the time the VPAC didn't exist. It was bigger than a receiver issue because we have and I'm going to uh, mischaracterize what Karen said earlier when she talked about you know, somebody describing what the weatherman's pointing. Can you get an intern to do it? I thought I heard her talk about getting an intern to, to provide some descriptions. I, I, I think the idea that, hey, there's a tornado warning, let's release the interns, is not a good idea. In the middle of an emergency where life and limb is at risk, the last, I will suggest strongly, that the very last thing you want to do is touch your already working broadcast system. You can imagine, all I have to do is flip that one little switch that switches me from VI to emergency or complete main emergency. If there were software updates, th th there are too many possible errors that could happen when I make that simple little switch to an emergency. Or when I forget to make the simple little switch back from an emergency, when I'm in the middle of there's a flood coming, I've got to leave my broadcast center. We, we talked about this actually in a, in a prior uh, advisory group for the FCC back in 2005, 2006, in, a, in just general emergency preparedness for broadcasters. The idea that the affected user community needs accurate information, 100% agreement, we all, we all get it. No one disagrees with that. But to rely on a broadcast system a change to a broadcast system as the sole reason why your receiver switched over to an alternate audio does not appear to be a, a, a sole mechanism. <clears throat> let's put warning beeps in. Let's switch the audio. Let's have web alerts, those areas with civil defense sirens. Let's keep those going. There should be many, many ways. So as I said, this seems to be bigger than just a VPAC issue. So it's not a baby with the bathwater. It's let's not solve a micro issue here and make the whole emergency preparedness uh, universe worse. I don't have a good answer for you yet because I don't have all of the picture, and, and I don't think any one person knows all of the picture. That's it. Uh, the, the difficulty that we have is that, you know, nobody does. Um, you know, I think we we are aware in our discussion um, educated the the fact that th this isn't a perfect solution it isn't even a near perfect solution but the fact of the matter is um, short of 
interrupting the main audio programming with a verbal emergency alert every time there's anything um, crawled across the screen. Um, there isn't there isn't another another option that we could think of, and the fact of the matter is we have to think of an option. It's 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 past the time where we can say there isn't a good answer, and so we can't do that one. Um, because, you know, emergencies aren't going to wait for good answers. Um, and so I think that's what, that's what we, we are up against. It's, it's either interrupt everything or find a way to minimize the ability or the, the need, the necessity to interrupt everything and still get the information um, when, when it's there with at least some, some um, reasonable expectation of some expectation, I won't even say reasonable, of, of you know, making it happen. Well, let uh, John respond, and then Paul, you're up after John. <coughs> so, Melanie, I, I agree 100% with you. Uh, again, speaking from the engineering side, a change to metadata is exactly an interruption of everything. Even if the audio stream isn't interrupted, a change to metadata is the same level of magnitude of change to a broadcast system as changing the audio stream, changing the language, something else. So I, I, I concur 100% we need to find a better than bad solution. And I will happily and, and eagerly work to find what those are. I don't expect us to, say, to stay silent on this in the, in the work group three report either. And I do think a long-term solution is to provide that metadata. I still don't know how we get there. Uh, that, 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 that was my point is long-term, great, we'll, we, will, we will figure out a way to build those systems. If you tell me tomorrow I need to start signaling emergencies or accepting those signals, that's not good. If it's next year, it's a little bit better. If it's 20 years from now, it's too late. So, but if you're in the emergency, next year is going to be too late. Agreed. I I I I, I got it. We, we we agree violently, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you also want to agree violently? <coughs> How about urgently? <laughs> I don't know. Probably. I, I, uh, Paul Schrader, AFB. I, I just wanted to understand. We when we're talking about this need for. To use your phrase, I think, Kelly, or close to your phrase, somebody at the panel throwing switches. Are you talking about putting consumer equipment into, forcing essentially the consumer equipment into the secondary audio program? I'm, I'm missing the point here, I guess. Um, no. Um, so no, you're I'm saying every time the second audio program channel is, pro information is provided on that channel, somebody's got to throw a switch to make that happen, and it isn't always available in the spectrum? Uh, yes, yeah, sort of. Um, I was really talking about the narrow case where we would switch, you know, in a short period, like a five-minute time period, switch the signaling from one thing to another, then switch it back. At the station, not at, at the, the consumer. Station. Yeah. Not right. the right. So, right. so where the so broadcast main audio would switch over to the no. second audio. No, not necessarily. It has nothing to do with what would happen in the consumer's device. You're just – you remember in all of this – we're just providing information to a consumer device, and then the consumer, based on what their product can do, will, will have choices. Um, so what a consumer might be, and I'm hypothesizing, if they were, for some reason, had a menu up, they might see a, a description option appear on a menu and then disappear. That doesn't mean you'd go to it. Or... In some world, let's say you had a TV set which you could program, and again, this is very hypothetical, that says, show me descriptions when they are available. So then the broadcaster sends information and says, oops, all of a sudden there's descriptions available. And your set would go, hey, this consumer wants to hear descriptions. And the set might, in that case, automatically shift, and then once it's not available, the, the set would have to know what to do. Presumably it would go back to whatever you were doing before. So really it's just providing options. I brought that up only to say that from a, a, a program originator standpoint, that it's kind of an impractical solution for us. And there are a couple of reasons, it's because we don't – making changes in short order like that was never really contemplated. You know, we just – you know, we have one program, you go into the commercial, you go to the next program, you go to the next commercial, and the metadata follows it, describes that program. That's kind of the way the system sort of works and, and goes on. 
Um, I think with respect to, to what John is suggesting, um, what, what John was talking about a minute ago and, and how that relates to, to your question, Paul, there was some discussion about whether there should be a descriptor or some piece of metadata that says there is an emergency. This has nothing to do with accessibility or anything else. It's just some piece of data that says, gee, something's happened. There's an emergency. It's just another piece of, uh, of information that a consumer device c could make use of to provide some sort of user experience for the consumer. But it, I mean, presumably the audio tones that had been the standard do that and would trigger a consumer decision about whether yeah, they want to switch it, to description or not. It doesn't tell the set anything in particular. Uh, that's why I was saying it would trigger the consumer to make the decision about whether they want to switch to the description uh, channel or not. It could. A set manufacturer could, for example, decide we will offer a feature that when it sees this information, this piece of metadata that says, oh, there's an emergency, it will do something. It'll beep, it'll flash. You know, if you're hearing impaired, maybe it flashes the screen or, you know, something like that. I mean, all, all these metadata things simply enable features to happen. What they actually are um, is there. I, I think from an industry perspective, when we talk about, you know, can, can we sit down in a standards body and go, let's add another piece of metadata? Sure, we can do that. But then we have to figure out how is that going to be used? Um, will it really be helpful to the consumer? Is it something that we as program originators can can effectively use and send? There are all these sort of things. So, you know, it was kind of an exoteric. We, we have talked about this a little bit. Um, it's something that could happen down the road, but I think, at least for my part, I was unsure about how it would be used. Would it really be of benefit, whether for accessibility or any other reason, or is it just another piece of data that would just con confuse consumers and it'll be a feature that, you know, you, you have to, you know, the digital world, we can do a lot of things. They're not always necessarily helpful. So uh, I think I didn't want to paraphrase John, but 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 that in my record that was sort of the scope of that conversation. There's just all kinds of things we could do, um, but we need to talk about what really is re reasonable to do and, and and what yields the best uh, accessibility experience. I think. So if I could summarize, what you're basically saying is that blind and visually impaired people should leave their TV set set to the VI, and they will get description. When it's there, they'll get main audio. When nothing else is there, and emergency information will interrupt that and take over that channel. In essence, is that uh, the scenario? Except for that first part, I'll leave it set there. But yes, I, I, I think yes. Yeah. I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. That's how emergency information will get there. Is if right. you, your TV set's tuned to yeah. right uh, set to that right. uh, and yeah. recognizing and have been beaten into submission on the what you can do with the remote control issue yeah. <laughs> if you're watching something else and you hear those three you're watching the main channel audio listening to main channel excuse me I use the term watching huh? you're listening to the main channel and you hear those three beeps mm -hmm. there was a presumption on my part which I was beaten violently about <laughs> at least verbally <laughs> that one could go to a remote control and then find that Audio description channel. An hour later. An hour later, you would, <laughs> right? And, and I, 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 I recognize the fallacy of that. But I think when Melanie said we recognize this is not a perfect solution, it is really pretty much the only solution if you want something implemented anywhere in the near term. But why wouldn't a person who is blind or visually impaired just always leave their? I don't know. That's a question I asked, and I, I'm telling you, I got beat because up on most this. Most of the time, all you get is silence. Ah, this. but if we implement. But if you the if no description oh, rule. If you implement the um, the, the um, practice of yeah. providing the main audio content on the um, the audio channel, the audio description channel, then um, there would be um, no particular reason why you would need to switch back and forth. Assuming, of course, that the quality of that audio is sufficiently um, non-obnoxious to make mm -hmm. <laughs> to make it the listening experience effective. Well, that looks to be a recommendation that Working Group Two will put forward. So those will match nicely. Um, John. 
I have in my notes for working group three whether uh, dates or timelines could be assigned to the not now issues in the working group three report, um, or will they just be laid out in a row? <coughs> okay. Hi there. Um, <laughs> sorry. Actually, I, Melanie kind of addressed that already. A lot of the things that, that we would do are tied in with really working group two and working group four. So I think we need to have a conversation. But yes, I think hopefully we can coordinate with them and come up with something. And, and, and it, at least we can't say when, we can say sort of what. Priorities. Yeah, priorities or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's John Herzog here. I wanted to respond briefly to the um, idea that a blind person is likely to leave their set on the uh, secondary audio channel. Um, even if the quality is, and I'm not representing the FCC's opinion on this, I'm just speaking from somebody who's used the technology. Even if the quality is okay, um, you still have the issue of wanting to hear an English program when, when Spanish is being put there. Um, it's also the issue that you're saying if we implement the practice of putting the audio on the secondary channel, the primary audio on the secondary channel, that practice would have to be implemented wider than I think the CVAA gives scope to, at least initially, because it says the top nine, you know, the top terrestrial networks and the top five cable networks have to implement audio description. The rest of the time, uh, the rest of the networks at this point are not covered. Well, that solution of putting the primary audio on secondary would have to be implemented across all those other networks for it to be a practical, viable solution, because otherwise when we get off the top five networks on cable and the top four terrestrials, we still have the same problem. And many blind people do like cable and, and, and the other channels that are available. So that's that's my two cents about that whole thing. Well, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we said that in the in the work group, and I, I appreciate your adding to my, my statement. Thank you, John. It's important to remember that. My, yes, no. Are you about to say something? Coming? No. So my last note here for working group three. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Assume someone, Paul. Uh, Paul Schrader, AFB. Yeah. So it just returns us to the importance of having that rapid access for the consumer to be able to make the decision in whatever um, device and apparatus they happen to be deployed in their in their home. And I. You know, I'm still not sure we're there yet, so uh, that, that, that puts it back on where Group 4 is a really incumbent and important thing to put through and maybe to put more pressure on it because of the absolute uh, essential character for that in an emergency situation. Good point. Kelly? I do have. Uh, <laughs> I may apologize for bringing this up, but I think it it's an issue that it, it's in our report to some extent, but... Um, it's a bit of a working group four issue. I brought it up on our, our co-chair's call. Really what we sort of came to was a feature set in a consumer device that goes beyond what work group four talks about, persistence, the idea that you that the set remembers a particular setting. And, and it really goes beyond sort of, well, you, you could set a particular setting, but then what happens when something changes? And the idea that the set it in some level is smart and 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 you it allows you to set preferences so when this is there do that when this is there do that and this is there do that and and i forget um i can't remember somebody brought up on our call and said yeah but then you also have to talk about what do you do when those things aren't there right you have to exclusion so it's a bit more compli complex and certainly working group four hasn't talked about it. it it might be considered to be beyond the scope of the cvaa but when you really sort of get down to it there are a lot of cases about well, well, what if this, you know, what if this language is there, but then that, and then descriptions, and what if there's descriptions in Spanish? I really want to find descriptions in Spanish, and other, uh, rather than, you know, maybe, you know, an accessible menu or setup guide or something allows you to to get to that a little bit. But um, th th this is an issue that's a little different than persistence, and. Um, it's not in the report now, but I, I haven't looked at what's on the wiki, so I don't know if you guys have talked about that at all. Um, that is dependent upon, Mark Iyer wrote a really nice sort of couple of paragraphs for us, saying that the set has to have metadata in order to make those decisions or to evaluate the consumer's preferences. And in some scope, that's really where we want to get to. It's as a consumer saying, I like this, I need this, I am that, 
You know, at some point in the early days of ATSC, you could say, my name is Kelly, and I like the color blue, so please sell me all my menus in blue. He'll just recognize uh, it. He'll just know it's me because of my digital implant. <laughs> all right, so we're not there yet. Uh, um, but, um, and I hesitate to say things like this because sometimes we think technology solves all problems. But really, in the case of where, gee, I, I set it to that second secondary ser audio service right now, but I don't want to hear the Spanish. So I'm, I'm forced as a consumer now to go back to the main one. But now, oops, there's emergencies. I've got to go back over there. And that's the world we have to live in, and that's the imperfect solution in the near term. Now, where we go in the, in the, in the, in the long term, I, I don't know what all the details are to get to kind of a preference thing, uh, a preference sort of ecosystem, um, nor do I know what that path is, nor have we been able to determine it within Working Group 3. Like I said, it may be out of the scope of the CVAA, First but we have to get accessible. yeah, well, baby steps is that I think is all right. I'm, uh, I'm Judy, finished philosophizing. Judy Brewer's got a comment. Here comes the mic. I'm getting to work on it. <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate uh, Kelly's point there. I, it sounds as though what you're talking about is flexible persistence in a way, and and it. Uh, sure addresses a concern I've been having as I've listened to this discussion, which has seemed to assume that a given device or a given household or whatever, um, in terms of uh, internet delivered TV, only has one individual. And I don't think that you know, humans are set up in, in solo units all the time, nor with matching disabilities and, and so forth. And so yeah. the... Um, the ability to have persistence is extremely important for the consumer side, and uh, I, I certainly hope that some of the technology that's evolving will, will support that and that the older technology will come along and support that as well. But the ability to um, set up personalized profiles that can then be uh, swapped according to who's using the device right then or who's driving it uh, seems important also. So I appreciate your raising the point. Well, and that... If that's one of the issues with regard to saying um, that people may want to leave their their set on the um, the channel that provides the description because you know some households have people. My household, for instance, has one person who needs description and one person who who doesn't in it, and um, you know. Um, I don't know. There's a there's a guy thing about changing the remote and you know <laughs> changing the channel, and so you know I don't, I know for a fact that my set would not stay on the description channel, regardless of what I threatened to do. So you know again I think this is one of those issues where it's not a perfect solution. It isn't even a near perfect solution. But at least if we make the provision that you can um, and have a reasonable experience if you do, then you at least um, can, can reduce the risk um, of somebody being left out. Thank you. And I think the technology isn't <coughs> that futuristic uh, where you can personalize your experience. Yeah. CES this year had a lot of voice control devices. Um, attach your connect to your TV and then say that the husband always gets priority when <laughs> it sees you. So that's yeah. who gets control. So it is down the road, but it's not that futuristic. Just walk in front of the football game and yeah. change all the settings. That would right. be kind of cool. Um, I did have one more note from uh, the w, uh, Working Group 3, and that was something I brought up, which is looking at whether we're talking about crawls only during existing programming or what happens when we switch over to emergencies. But I think that was fairly well addressed from existing um, regulations. Uh, so that was all of my notes. Anyone else uh, with comments about Working Group 3's work on access to emergency information? Then we have reached the uh, 4.30 point in our agenda early. Um, and... At this point, Wayne and I announce the end of the plenary session and look for questions from the audience, which we've been pretty open to today anyway. Wayne. Hello. Uh, 
Actually, um, I think that that item refers to non-VPAC members. Uh, Larry, isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Pam, that it is. So, uh, um, in principle, everyone who's been speaking is a VPAC member or an alternate, but maybe not. So, anyone who is a non-VPAC member, that's the opportunity now, uh, which there may or may not be anyone. Okay, Pam, what, we're not hearing or seeing any hands or any phones kinds of things, so. One back there. Check. Any luck? Okay. Make sure everybody can see me. Okay. My name's Samuel Jones, and um, I'd like to say to uh, Kelly that uh, I visited uh, Las Vegas for the National uh, Broadcasters Association discussion there. Um, <clears throat> and the purpose of that was to talk about CNN. So I was having problems um, with CNN and the 6 a.m. to 2 o'clock requirement for live captioning. We really need to look into a constant requirement for live captioning. Um, and then I tried to contact someone about doing a replay of that content, but it was not available. Uh, with the replay, there was no captioning. So let me show you a demo here with my hand. I'm just going to show you a little demo so it's visual here. Um, now when you switch to audio, they have a cart person typing in the caption, and the caption would go on the screen, and then it would, and that's the normal way of the protocol. But the problem is, when you save the show, the program, whatever it could be, when you put it into an archive format, there's no captioning there on the screen. It's actually saved without the captioning on the screen. So when we do replay, they're not able to show the captioning. So I've contacted CNN a couple of times. And I visited with a lady in Atlanta, Georgia, where their headquarters is located. And I'm also going to the conference for TDI in California. And there's also a, ch a problem with Channel 8, which is under the cable system here. And they are using the analog system. Now, with Channel 7 or 8, I contacted the engineer there. And, they, and I told them that it happened for the 6.30 and ABC News. And then also... Uh, and I like to watch this the 6 a.m. news, but my wife likes to watch the 9 a.m. news, and she's hearing, but the captioning is not there. I was supposed to go to the TDI conference, but my plans changed, and I was not able to go. And they actually came and fixed that that pro that problem with me. And I was able to ask the engineer to talk to CNN's engineer because Channel 8 was able to help me, but CNN was not able to, to help the situation. Um, so I wanted to connect the two engineers together. So I was really excited about that, hopefully that they would be able to resolve the problem. Um, but then I went to, I called CNN and found out that they were not able to fix the problem, nor were they able to share anything with me because everything is confidential. So I'm not sure what's happening um, behind the scenes with CNN. And for example, you know, we have different time zones. Um, and so we, some folks don't want to watch something so early in the morning while they're in California, so they want to be able to watch the replay. Uh, and this is my second topic. Um, excuse me. Hi, this is Pam. 
Um, the questions uh, today are related to the VPAC deliberations. So if you have a specific complaint, you should go ahead and file that with the FCC. I encourage you to do that. But um, Oh, yeah, I'm not able to do a complaint. I'm not able to do that. Uh, because of confidentiality reasons, I'm not able to do so. Okay. Well, then I, I really don't understand why you could bring it to a public forum then. Um, I'm just saying that, that uh, I think that we're just di digressing a little bit. Okay. Well, I just wanted to take the opportunity to speak today. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Related. Uh, any public, other public questions, comments, non VPAC or alternates? And then we'll move on to our next uh, agenda item review of recommendations. I think we've just done that. Next steps, though, are important. Uh, we want to reiterate the timeline and schedule that Wayne talked about first thing. We'll finish up with that again. Um, and again, here's our timeline. Sure. This, uh, of course, everybody has this uh, via uh, email now, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, there is an extended opportunity for each working group to provide a second draft of their comments. And again, the closing date for that is February 24th, close of business, West Coast time. Um, if there are any, I don't think we have any co-chairs on the West Coast, do we? Uh, we have a member of Hawaii. Yeah, but the <laughs> but the uh, but the comments come. The the second draft needs to come from the co-chairs. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, that is the timetable relative to any kind of second draft comments. I'm guessing there will be three second draft um, uh, comments that will come in. And um, uh, after those comments come in, then the mech we will share those comments the following Monday with the entire VPAC uh, via the reflector. And then there is a window that closes on March 9th for comments on any of the three second draft reports. Uh, and uh, those comments need to be in to Larry and myself uh, by close of business on March 9th. And uh, we will take it from there. So I guess then the other thing on the timeline is um, that effectively will complete the work of the VPAC when we file those reports in uh, early April. Um, and I think it's just appropriate to reiterate again the comments that were made this morning that there's obviously been a lot of great work that has been thus far accomplished by members of the VPAC and the co-chairs and, of course, recognizing the help of the FCC staff in all these activities. Uh, it's uh, been an interesting, wonderful undertaking. Uh, I'm making it sound like it's over, but it's not quite over, at least not for us, Larry. Uh, so, uh, but we do appreciate everything that all of you have done uh, to make what I think has been a very successful advisory committee effort. Are there any questions on the timetable? <coughs> okay. You want to pick it up in there? Uh, Hi, this is Pam. Um, I, I wanted to make an announcement uh, that many of you may not know about, but at the FCC we have, um, it's, it's sort of like a listserv, it's really an information service. It's called accessinfo at fcc.gov. And it's a great way to keep informed on anything related to disability issues at the FCC. So when a public notice or a report and order or when something is published in the Federal Register or if we're having a special disability-related event, such as the VPAC meeting, we send this out on this um, 
accessinfo at FCC.gov. And to subscribe, just send an email to accessinfo at FCC.gov and say subscribe. And if you want to unsubscribe, just say that unsubscribe. But I encourage you all to do that. Well, with that, we are adjourned. We'll be letting you know how to send your comments in once we see the second drafts. Um, there are various mechanisms we've considered. Um, it'll be simple for everyone to do so. And then we'll have our editors, which we're looking for, names within the week. Uh, most of you have that in hand already. Then thank you all. We're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, I know.